Chapter 18 of Eleven Years in the Rocky Mountains and a Life on the Frontier by Francis A. Victor. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 18, 1837. The decline of the business of hunting furs began to be quite obvious about this time, besides the American and St. Louis companies and the Hudson's Bay Company. There were numerous lone traders with whom the ground was divided. The autumn of this year was spent by the American company, as formerly, in trapping beaver on the streams issuing from the eastern side of the Rocky Mountains. When the cold weather finally drove the fur company to the plains, they went into winter quarters once more in the neighborhood of the Crows on Powder River. Here were reenacted the wild scenes of the previous winter, both trappers and Indians being given up to excesses. On the return of spring, Bridger again led his brigade all through the Yellowstone country to the streams on the north side of the Missouri, to the headwaters of that river, and finally rendezvoused on the north fork of the Yellowstone, near Yellowstone Lake. Though the amount of furs taken on the spring hunt was considerable, it was by no means equal to former years. The fact was becoming apparent that the beaver was being rapidly exterminated however there was beaver enough in camp to furnish the means for the usual profligacy horse racing betting gambling drinking were freely indulged in in the midst of this fun there appeared at the rendezvous mr gray now accompanied by mrs gray and six other missionary ladies and gentlemen here also were two gentlemen from the methodist mission on the willamette who were returning to the states captain stewart was still traveling with the fur company and was also present with his party besides which a hudson's bay trader named emma tinger was in camp near by as if actuated to extraordinary displays by the unusual number of visitors especially the four ladies both trappers and indians conducted themselves like the mad caps they were the shawnees and delawares danced their great war dance before the tents of the missionaries and joe meek not to be outdone arrayed himself in a suit of armor belonging to captain stewart and strutted about the encampment then mounting his horse played the part of an ancient knight with a good deal of eclat meek had not abstained from the alcohol kettle but had offered it and partaken of it rather more freely than usual so that when rendezvous was broken up the st louis company gone to the popoagi and the american company going to wind river he found that his wife a nez purse who had succeeded umantuckin in his affections had taken offence or a fit of homesickness which was synonymous and departed with the party of emmettinger and the missionaries intending to visit her people at walla walla this desertion wounded meek's feelings for he prided himself on his courtesy to the sex and did not like to think that he had not behaved handsomely all the more was he vexed with himself because his spouse had carried off with her a pretty and sprightly baby daughter of whom the father was fond and proud and who had been christened helen marr after one of the heroines of miss porter's scottish chiefs a book much admired in the mountains as it has been elsewhere therefore at the first camp of the american company meek resolved to turn his back on the company and go after the mother and daughter obtaining a fresh kettle of alcohol to keep up his spirits he left camp returning toward the scene of the late rendezvous but in the effort to keep up his spirits he had drank too much alcohol and the result was that on the next morning he found himself alone on the wind river mountain with his horses and pack mules and very sick indeed taking a little more alcohol to brace up his nerves he started on again passing around the mountain on to the sweet water thence to the sandy and thence across a country without water for seventy-five miles to green river where the camp of emmettinger was overtaken the heat was excessive and the absence of water made the journey across the arid plain between sandy and green rivers one of great suffering to the traveller and his animals and the more so as the frequent references to the alcohol kettle only increased the thirst fever instead of allaying it but meek was not alone in suffering 
about halfway across the scorching plain he discovered a solitary woman's figure standing in the trail and two riding horses near her whose drooping heads expressed their dejection on coming up with this strange group meek found the woman to be one of the missionary ladies a mrs smith and that her husband was lying on the ground dying as the poor sufferer believed himself for water mrs smith made a weeping appeal to meek for water for her dying husband and truly the poor woman's situation was a pitiable one behind camp with no protection from the perils of the desert and wilderness only a terrible care instead the necessity of trying to save her husband's life as no water was to be had alcohol was offered to the famishing man who however could not be aroused from his stupor of wretchedness seeing that death really awaited the unlucky missionary unless something could be done to cause him to exert himself meek commenced at once and with unction to abuse the man for his unmanliness his style though not very refined was certainly very vigorous you're a dashed pretty fellow to be lying on the ground here lolling your tongue out of your mouth and trying to die die if you want to you're of no account and will never be missed here's your wife who you are keeping standing here in the hot sun why don't she die she's got more pluck than a white-livered chap like you but i'm not going to leave her waiting here for you to die there's a band of indians behind on the trail and i've been riding like dash to keep out of their way if you want to stay here and be scalped you can stay mrs smith is going with me come madam continued meek leading up her horse let me help you to mount for we must get out of this cursed country as fast as possible poor mrs smith did not wish to leave her husband nor did she relish the notion of staying to be scalped despair tugged at her heart-springs she would have sunk to the ground in a passion of tears but meek was too much in earnest to permit precious time to be thus wasted get on your horse said he rather roughly you can't save your husband by staying here crying it is better that one should die than two and he seems to be a worthless dog anyway let the indians have him almost lifting her upon the horse meek tore the distracted woman away from her husband who had yet strength enough to gasp out an entreaty not to be left you can follow us if you choose said the apparently merciless trapper or you can stay where you are mrs smith can find plenty of better men than you come madam and he gave the horse a stroke with his riding-whip which started him into a rapid pace the unhappy wife whose conscience reproached her for leaving her husband to die alone looked back and saw him raising his head to gaze after them her grief broke out afresh and she would have gone back even then to remain with him but meek was firm and again started up her horse before they were quite out of sight meek turned in his saddle and beheld the dying man sitting up hurrah said he he's all right he will overtake us in a little while and as he predicted in little over an hour smith came riding up not more than half dead by this time the party got into camp on green river about eleven o'clock that night and mrs smith having told the story of her adventures with the unknown trapper who had so nearly kidnapped her the laugh and the cheer went round among the company that's meek said emma tinger you may rely on that he's just the one to kidnap a woman in that way when mrs smith fully realized the service rendered she was abundantly grateful and profuse were the thanks which our trapper received even from the much abused husband who was now thoroughly alive again meek failed to persuade his wife to return with him she was homesick for her people and would go to them but instead of turning back he kept on with emma tinger's camp as far as fort hall which post was then in charge of courtney walker while the camp was at soda springs meek observed the missionary ladies baking bread in a tin reflector before a fire bread was a luxury unknown to the mountain man and as a sudden recollection of his boyhood and the days of bread and butter came over him his mouth began to water almost against his will he continued to hang around the missionary camp thinking about the bread 
at length one of the nez Perses, named james whom the missionary had taught to sing at their request struck up a hymn which he sang in a very creditable manner as a reward of his pious proficiency one of the ladies gave james a biscuit a bright thought struck our longing hero's brain go back said he to james and sing another hymn and when the ladies give you another biscuit bring it to me and in this manner he obtained a taste of the coveted luxury bread of which during nine years in the mountains he had not eaten at fort hall meek parted company with the missionaries and with his wife and child as the little black-eyed daughter took her departure in company with this new element in savage life the missionary society her father could have had no premonition of the fate to which the admixture of the savage and the religious elements was step by step consigning her after remaining a few days at the fort meek who found some of his old comrades at this place went trapping with them up the port neuf and soon made up a pack of one hundred and fifty beaver skins these on returning to the fort he delivered to joe walker one of the american company's traders at that time and took walker's receipt for them he then with mansfield and wilkins set out about the first of september for the flathead country where wilkins had a wife in their company was an old flathead woman who wished to return to her people and took this opportunity the weather was still extremely warm it had been a season of great drought and the streams were nearly all entirely dried up the first night out the horses eight in number strayed off in search of water and were lost now commenced a day of fearful sufferings no water had been found since leaving the fort the loss of the horses made it necessary for the company to separate to look for them mansfield and wilkins going in one direction meek and the old flathead woman in another the little coolness and moisture which night had imparted to the atmosphere was quickly dissipated by the unchecked rays of the pitiless sun shining on a dry and barren plain with not a vestige of verdure anywhere in sight on and on went the old flathead woman keeping always in the advance and on and on followed meek anxiously scanning the horizon for a chance sight of the horses higher and higher mounted the sun the temperature increasing in intensity until the great plain palpitated with radiated heat and the horizon flickered almost like a flame where the burning heavens met the burning earth meek had been drinking a good deal of rum at the fort which circumstance did not lessen the terrible consuming thirst that was torturing him noon came and passed and still the heat and the suffering increased the fever and craving of hunger being now added to that of thirst on and on through the whole of that long scorching afternoon trotted the old flathead woman in the peculiar travelling gait of the indian and the mountaineer meek following at a little distance and going mad as he thought for a little water and mad he probably was as famine sometimes makes its victims when night at last closed in he laid down to die as the missionary smith had done before but he did not remember smith he only thought of water and heard it running and fancied the old woman was lapping it like a wolf then he rose to follow her and find it it was always just ahead and the woman was howling to him to show him the trail thus the night passed and in the cool of the early morning he experienced a little relief he was really following his guide who as on the day before was trotting on ahead then the thought possessed him to overtake and kill her hoping from her shriveled body to obtain a morsel of food and drop of moisture but his strength was failing and his guide so far ahead that he gave up the thought as involving too great exertion continuing to follow her in a helpless and hopeless kind of way at last there was no mistake this time he heard running water and the old woman was lapping it like a wolf with a shriek of joy he ran and fell on his face in the water which was not more than one foot in depth 
nor the stream more than fifteen feet wide but it had a white pebbly bottom and the water was clear if not very cool it was something to thank god for which the none too religious trapper acknowledged by a fervent thank god for a long time he lay in the water swallowing it and by thrusting his finger down his throat vomiting it up again to prevent surfeit his whole body taking in the welcome moisture at all its million pores the fever abated a feeling of health returned and the late perishing man was restored to life and comparative happiness the stream proved to be godin's fork and here meek and his faithful old guide rested until evening in the shade of some willows where their good fortune was completed by the appearance of mansfield and wilkins with the horses the following morning the men found and killed a fat buffalo cow whereby all their wants were supplied and good feeling restored in the little camp from godin's fork they crossed over to salmon river and presently struck the nez perce trail which leads from that river over into the beaverhead country on the beaverhead or jefferson fork of the missouri where there was a flathead and nez perce village on or about the present site of virginia city in montana not stopping long here meek and his companions went on to the madison fork with the indian village and to the shores of missouri lake joining in the fall hunt for buffalo end of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of eleven years in the rocky mountains and a life on the frontier by francis a victor this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nineteen tell me all about a buffalo hunt said the writer to joe meek as we sat at a window overlooking the columbia river where it has a beautiful stretch of broad waters and curving wooded shores and talking about mountain life tell me how you used to hunt buffalo well there is a good deal of sport in running buffalo when the camp discovered a band then every man that wanted to run made haste to catch his buffalo horse we sometimes went out thirty or forty strong sometimes two or three and at other times a large party started on the hunt the more the merrier we always had great bantering about our horses each man according to his own account having the best one when we first start we ride slow so as not to alarm the buffalo the nearer we come to the band the greater our excitement the horses seem to feel it too and are worrying to be off when we come so near that the band starts then the word is given our horse's mettle is up and away we go there may be ten thousand in a band directly we crowd them so close that nothing can be seen but dust nor anything heard but the roar of their trampling and bellowing the hunter now keeps close on their heels to escape being blinded by the dust which does not rise as high as a man on horseback for thirty yards behind the animals as soon as we are close enough the firing begins and the band is on the run and a herd of buffalo can run about as fast as a good racehorse how they do thunder along they give us a pretty sharp race take care down goes a rider and away goes his horse with the band do you think we stopped to look after the fallen man not we we rather thought that were fun and if he got killed why he were unlucky that were all plenty more men couldn't bother about him thar's a fat cow ahead i force my way through the band to come up with her the buffalo crowd around so that i have to put my foot on them now on one side now the other to keep them off my horse it is lively work i can tell you a man has to look sharp not to be run down by the band pressing him on buffalo and horse at the top of their speed look out there's a ravine ahead as you can see by the plunge which the band makes hold up or somebody goes to the d dash l now if the band is large it fills the ravine full to the brim and the hindmost of the herd pass over on top of the foremost 
It requires horsemanship not to be carried over without our own consent. But then we mountain men are all good horsemen. Over the ravine we go, but we do it our own way. We keep up the chase for about four miles, selecting our game as we run and killing a number of fat cows to each man, some more and some less. When our horses are tired, we slacken up and turn back. We meet the camp keepers with pack horses. They soon butcher, pack up the meat, and we all return to camp. Why are we laugh at each other's mishaps and eat fat meat? And this constitutes the glory of mountain life. But you were going to tell me about the buffalo hunt at Missouri Lake? There isn't much to tell. It were pretty much like other buffalo hunts. There were a lot of us trappers happened to be at a Nez Perce and Flathead village in the fall of 38, when they were a-going to kill winter meat. And as their hunt lay in the direction we were going, we joined in. The old Nez Perce chief, Kawi Soti, had command of the village, and we trappers had to obey him, too. We started off slow. Nobody war allowed to go ahead of camp. In this manner, we caused the buffalo to move on before us, but not to be alarmed. We were eight or ten days traveling from the beaver head to Missouri Lake, and by the time we got there, the whole plain around the lake were crowded with buffalo, and it war a splendid sight. In the morning, the old chief harangued the men of his village and ordered us all to get ready for the surround. About nine o'clock, every man were mounted, and we began to move. That war a sight to make a man's blood warm. A thousand men, all trained hunters, on horseback, carrying their guns, and with their horses painted in the height of Indians' fashion. We advanced until within about half a mile of the herd. Then the chief ordered us to deploy to the right and left until the wings of the column extended a long way and advance again. By this time, the buffalo were all moving and we had come to within a hundred yards of them. Kawi Soti then gave us the word and away we went, pell-mell. Heavens, what a charge! What a rushing and roaring, men shooting, buffalo bellowing and trampling until the earth shook under them. It were the work of half an hour to slay two thousand or maybe three thousand animals. When the work was over, we took a view of the field. Here and there and everywhere laid the slain buffalo occasionally a horse with a broken leg were seen or a man with a broken arm or maybe he had fared worse and had a broken head now came out the women of the village to help us butcher and pack up the meat it war a big job but we were not long about it by night the camp were full of meat and everybody merry Bridger's camp, which were passing that way, traded with the village for fifteen hundred buffalo tongues, the tongue being reckoned a choice part of the animal, and that's the way we helped the Nez Perces hunt buffalo. But when you were hunting for your own subsistence in camp, you sometimes went out in small parties? Oh, yes, and wear the same thing, on a smaller scale. One time, Kit Carson and myself and a little Frenchman named Marteau went to run buffalo on Powder River. When we came in sight of the band, it were agreed that Kit and the Frenchman should do the running and I should stay with the pack animals. The weather were very cold, and I didn't like my part of the duty much. The Frenchman's horse couldn't run, so I lent him mine. Kit rode his own, not a good buffalo horse either. In running, my horse fell with the Frenchman and nearly killed him. Kit, who couldn't make his horse catch, jumped off and caught mine and tried it again. This time he came up with the band and killed four fat cows. When I came up with the pack animals, I asked Kit how he came by my horse. He explained and wanted to know if I had seen anything of Marteau. Said my horse had fallen with him and he thought killed him. You go over the other side of yon hill and see, said Kit. What'll I do with him if he is dead? said I. 
Can't you pack him to camp? Pack, said I. I should rather pack a load of meat. Well, said Kit, I'll butcher if you'll go over and see anyhow. So I went over and found the dead man leaning his head on his hand and groaning, for he war pretty bad hurt. I got him on his horse, though, after a while, and took him back to where Kit were at work. We soon finished the butchering job and started back to camp with our wounded Frenchman and three loads of fat meat. You were not very compassionate toward each other in the mountains. That were not our business. We had no time for such things. Besides, live men were what we wanted. Dead ones were of no account. End of chapter 19 Chapter 20 of Eleven Years in the Rocky Mountains and a Life on the Frontier by Francis A. Victor. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 20, 1838. From Missouri Lake, Meek started alone for the Gallatin Fork of the Missouri, trapping in a mountain basin called Gardener's Hole. Beaver were plenty there, but it was getting late in the season, and the weather was cold in the mountains. On his return, in another basin called the Burnt Hole, he found a buffalo skull, and, knowing that Bridger's camp would soon pass that way, wrote on it the number of beaver he had taken, and also his intention to go to Fort Hall to sell them. In a few days, the camp passing found the skull, which grinned its threat at the angry bushways, as the chuckling trapper had calculated that it would. To prevent its execution, runners were sent after him, who, however, failed to find him, and nothing was known of the supposed renegade for some time. But as Bridger passed through Pierre's Hole on his way to Green River to winter, he was surprised at Meek's appearance in camp. He was soon invited to the lodge of the Bushways and called to account for his supposed apostasy. Meek, for a time, would neither deny nor confess— but put on his free trapper airs and laughed in the face of the bushways. Bridger, who half suspected some trick, took the matter lightly, but Drips was very much annoyed and made some threats, at which Meek only laughed the more. Finally, the certificate from their own trader, Joe Walker, was produced, the new pack of furs surrendered, and Drips' wrath turned into smiles of approval. Here again Meek parted company with the main camp and went on an expedition with seven other trappers under John Larrison to the Salmon River, but found the cold very severe on this journey and the grass scarce and poor, so that the company lost most of their horses. On arriving at the Nez Perce village in the forks of the Salmon, Meek found the old chief, Kawisoti, full of the story of the missionaries and their religion, and anxious to hear preaching. Reports were continually arriving by the Indians of the wonderful things which were being taught by Mr. and Mrs. Spalding at Lapwai on the Clearwater and at Wailatpu on the Walla Walla River. It was now nearly two years since these missions had been founded, and the number of converts among the Nez Perces and Flatheads was already considerable. Here was an opening for a theological student, such as Joe Meek was. After some little assumption of modesty, Meek intimated that he thought himself capable of giving instruction on religious subjects, and being pressed by the chief, finally consented to preach to Kawisoti's people, taking care first to hold a private council with his associates and binding them not to betray him meek preached his first sermon that evening going regularly through with the ordinary services of a meeting these services were repeated whenever the indians seemed to desire it until christmas then the village being about to start upon a hunt the preacher took occasion to intimate to the chief that a wife would be an agreeable present to this however kawisoti demurred saying that spalding's religion did not permit men to have two wives 
that the nez perces had many of them given up their wives on this account and that therefore since meek already had one wife among the nez perces he could not have another without being false to the religion he professed to this perfectly clear argument meek replied that among white men if a man's wife left him without his consent as his had done he could procure a divorce and take another wife besides he could tell him how the bible related many stories of its best men having several wives but kawisoti was not easily convinced he could not see how if the bible approved of polygamy spalding should insist on the indians putting away all but one of their wives however says meek after about two weeks explanation of the doings of solomon and david i succeeded in getting the chief to give me a young girl whom i called virginia my present wife and the mother of seven children after accompanying the indians on their hunt to the beaverhead country where they found plenty of buffalo meek remained with the nez perce village until about the first of march when he again intimated to the chief that it was the custom of white men to pay their preachers accordingly the people were notified and the winter's salary began to arrive it amounted altogether to thirteen horses and many packs of beaver beside sheepskins and buffalo robes so that he considered that with his young wife he had made a pretty good winter's work of it in march he set out trapping again in company with one of his comrades named allen a man to whom he was much attached they travelled along up and down the salmon to godin's river henry's fork of the snake to pierre's fork and lewis fork and the muddy and finally set their traps on a little stream that runs out of the pass which leads to pierre's hole leaving their camp one morning to take up their traps they were discovered and attacked by a party of blackfeet just as they came near the trapping ground the only refuge at hand was a thicket of willows on the opposite side of the creek and towards this the trappers directed their flight meek who was in advance succeeded in gaining the thicket without being seen but allan stumbled and fell in crossing the stream and wet his gun he quickly recovered his footing and crossed over but the blackfeet had seen him enter the thicket and came up to within a short distance yet not approaching too near the place where they knew he was concealed unfortunately allan in his anxiety to be ready for defence commenced snapping caps on his gun to dry it the quick ears of the savages caught the sound and understood the meaning of it knowing him to be defenceless they plunged into the thicket after him shooting him almost immediately and dragging him out still breathing to a small prairie about two rods away and now commenced a scene which meek was compelled to witness and which he declares nearly made him insane through sympathy fear horror and suspense as to his own fate those devils incarnate deliberately cut up their still palpitating victim into a hundred pieces each taking a piece and accompanying the horrible and inhuman butchery with every conceivable gesture of contempt for the victim and of hellish delight in their own acts meek who was only concealed by the small patch of willows and a pit in the sand hastily scooped out with his knife until it was deep enough to lie in was in a state of the most fearful excitement all day long he had to endure the horrors of his position every moment seemed an hour every hour a day until when night came and the indians left the place he was in a high state of fever about nine o'clock that night he ventured to creep to the edge of the little prairie where he lay and listened a long time without hearing anything but the squirrels running over the dry leaves but which he constantly feared was the stealthy approach of the enemy at last however he summoned courage to crawl out on to the open ground and gradually to work his way to a wooded bluff not far distant the next day he found two of his horses 
and with these set out alone for Green River, where the American company was to rendezvous. After twenty-six days of solitary and cautious travel, he reached the appointed place of safety, having suffered fearfully from the recollection of the tragic scene he had witnessed in the death of his friend, and also from solitude and want of food. The rendezvous of this year was at Bonneville's old fort on Green River, and was the last one held in the mountains by the American Fur Company. Beaver was growing scarce, and competition was strong. On the disbanding of the company, some went to Santa Fe, some to California, others to the lower Columbia, and a few remained in the mountains trapping and selling their furs to the Hudson's Bay Company at Fort Hall. As to the leaders, some of them continued for a few years longer to trade with the Indians, and others returned to the States to lose their fortunes more easily far than they made them. Of the men who remained in the mountains trapping that year, Meek was one. Leaving his wife at Fort Hall, he set out in company with a Shawnee named Big Jim to take Beaver on Salt River, a tributary of the Snake. The two trappers had each his riding and his pack-horse, and at night generally picketed them all, but one night Big Jim allowed one of his to remain loose to graze. This horse, after eating for some hours, came back and laid down behind the other horses, and every now and then raised up his head, which slight movement at length aroused Big Jim's attention, and his suspicions also. "'My friend!' said he in a whisper to meek indian steal our horses jump up and shoot was the brief answer jim shot and ran out to see the result directly he came back saying my friend i shoot my horse break him neck and big jim became disconsolate over what his white comrade considered a very good joke the hunt was short and not very remunerative in furs. Meek soon returned to Fort Hall, and when he did so, found his new wife had left that post in company with a party under Newell to go to Fort Crockett on Green River, Newell's wife being a sister of Virginia's, on learning which he started on again alone to join that party. On Bear River he fell in with a portion of that quixotic band under farnham which was looking for paradise and perfection something on the fourier plan somewhere in this western wilderness they had already made the discovery in crossing the continent that perfect disinterestedness was lacking among themselves and that the nearer they got to their western paradise the farther off it seemed in their own minds Continuing his journey alone, soon after parting from Farnham, he lost the hammer of his gun, which accident deprived him of the means of subsisting himself, and he had no dried meat nor provisions of any kind. The weather, too, was very cold, increasing the necessity for food to support animal heat. However, the deprivation of food was one of the accidents to which mountain men were constantly liable, and one from which he had often suffered severely. Therefore he pushed on, without feeling any unusual alarm, and had arrived within fifteen miles of the fort before he yielded to the feeling of exhaustion and laid down beside the trail to rest. Whether he would ever have finished the journey alone, he could not tell, but fortunately for him he was discovered by joe walker and gordon another acquaintance who chanced to pass that way toward the fort meek answered their hail and inquired if they had anything to eat walker replied in the affirmative and getting down from his horse produced some dried buffalo meat which he gave to the famishing trapper but seeing the ravenous manner in which he began to eat walker inquired how long it had been since he had eaten anything five days since i had a bite then my man you can't have any more just now said walker seizing the meat in alarm lest meek should kill himself it was hard to see that meat packed away again says meek in relating his sufferings 
I told Walker that if my gun had a hammer, I'd shoot and eat him. But he talked very kindly and helped me on my horse, and we all went on to the fort. At Fort Crockett, where Newell and his party, the remainder of Farnham's party, a trading party under St. Clair, who owned the fort, Kit Carson, and a number of Meek's former associates, including Craig and Wilkins. Most of these men, Othello-like, had lost their occupation since the disbanding of the American Fur Company, and were much at a loss concerning the future. It was agreed between Newell and Meek to take what beaver they had to Fort Hall to trade for goods, and return to Fort Crockett, where they would commence business on their own account with the Indians. Accordingly they set out, with one other man belonging to Farnham's former adherents. They traveled to Henry's Fork, to Black Fort, where Fort Bridger now is, to Bear River, to Soda Springs, and finally to Fort Hall, suffering much from cold, and finding very little to eat by the way. At Fort Hall, which was still in charge of Courtney Walker, Meek and Newell remained a week, when, having purchased their goods and horses to pack them, they once more set out on the long, cold journey to Fort Crockett. They had fifteen horses to take care of, and only one assistant, a snake Indian called Al. The return proved an arduous and difficult undertaking. The cold was very severe. They had not been able to lay in a sufficient stock of provisions at Fort Hall, and game there was none on the route. By the time they arrived at Ham's Fork, the only atom of food they had left was a small piece of bacon, which they had been carefully saving, to eat with any poor meat they might chance to find. The next morning after camping on Ham's Fork was stormy and cold, the snow filling the air, yet Snake Al, with a promptitude by no means characteristic of him, rose early and went out to look after the horses. "'By that same token,' said Meek to Newell, "'Al has eaten the bacon.' And so it proved on investigation, Al's uneasy conscience having acted as a goad to stir him up to begin his duties in season. On finding his conjecture confirmed, Meek declared his intention, should no game be found before next day night, of killing and eating Al to get back the stolen bacon. But Providence interfered to save Al's bacon. On the following afternoon, the little party fell in with another still smaller but better supplied party of travelers, comprising a Frenchman and his wife. These had plenty of fat antelope meat, which they freely parted with to the needy ones, whom also they accompanied to Fort Crockett. It was now Christmas, and the festivities which took place at the fort were attended with a good deal of rum-drinking, in which Meek, according to his custom, joined, and as a considerable portion of their stock in trade consisted of this article, it may fairly be presumed that the home consumption of these two lone traders amounted to the larger half of what they had, with so much trouble, transported from Fort Hall. In fact, times were bad enough among the men so suddenly thrown upon their own resources among the mountains, at a time when that little creature which had made mountain life tolerable, or possible, was fast being exterminated. To make matters more serious, some of the worst of the now unemployed trappers had taken to a life of thieving and mischief which made enemies of the friendly Indians, and was likely to prevent the better disposed from enjoying security among any of the tribes. A party of these renegades, under a man named Thompson, went over to Snake River to steal horses from the Nez Perces. Not succeeding in this, they robbed the Snake Indians of about forty animals and ran them off to the Winty. The snakes following and complaining to the whites at Fort Crockett that their people had been robbed by white trappers, and demanding restitution. According to Indian law, when one of a tribe offends, the whole tribe is responsible. Therefore, if whites stole their horses, they might take vengeance on any whites they met, unless the property was restored. 
in compliance with this well-understood requisition of indian law a party was made up at fort crockett to go and retake the horses and restore them to their rightful owners this party consisted of meek craig newell carson and twenty-five others under the command of joe walker the horses were found on an island in green river the robbers having domiciled themselves in an old fort at the mouth of the winty in order to avoid having a fight with the renegades whose white blood the trappers were not anxious to spill walker made an effort to get the horses off the island undiscovered but while horses and men were crossing the river on the ice the ice sinking with them until the water was knee-deep the robbers discovered the escape of their booty and charging on the trappers tried to recover the horses in this effort they were not successful while walker made a masterly flank movement and getting in thompson's rear ran the horses into the fort where he stationed his men and succeeded in keeping the robbers on the outside thompson then commenced giving the horses away to a village of utes in the neighborhood of the fort on condition that they should assist in retaking them on his side walker threatened the utes with dire vengeance if they dared interfere the utes who had a wholesome fear not only of the trappers but of their foes the snakes declined to enter into the quarrel after a day of strategy and of threats alternated with arguments strengthened by a warlike display the trappers marched out of the fort before the faces of the discomfited thieves taking their booty with them which was duly restored to the snakes on their return to fort crockett and peace secured once more with that people still times continued bad the men not knowing what else to do went out in small parties in all directions seeking adventures which generally were not far to find on one of these excursions meek went with a party down the canyon of green river on the ice for nearly a hundred miles they traveled down this awful canyon without finding but one place where they could have come out and left it at last at the mouth of the winty this passed the time until march then the company of newell and meek was joined by antoine Rubidau, who had brought goods from santa fe to trade with the indians setting out in company they traded along up green river to the mouth of ham's fork and camped the snow was still deep in the mountains and the trappers found great sport in running antelope on one occasion a large herd numbering several hundreds were run onto the ice on green river where they were crowded into an air hole and large numbers slaughtered only for the cruel sport which they afforded but killing antelope needlessly was not by any means the worst of amusements practised in rubidoux's camp that foolish trader occupied himself so often and so long in playing hand an indian game that before he parted with his new associates he had gambled away his goods his horses and even his wife so that he returned to santa fe much poorer than nothing since he was in debt on the departure of rubidoux meek went to fort hall and remained in that neighborhood trapping and trading for the hudson's bay company until about the last of june when he started for the old rendezvous places of the american companies hoping to find some divisions of them at least on the familiar camping ground but his journey was in vain neither on green river or wind river where for ten years he had been accustomed to meet the leaders and their men his old comrades in danger did he find a wandering brigade even the glory of the american companies was departed and he found himself solitary among his long familiar haunts with many melancholy reflections the man of twenty-eight years of age recalled how a mere boy he had fallen half unawares into the kind of life he had ever since led amongst the mountains with only other men equally the victims of circumstance and the degraded savages for his companions the best that could be made of it such life had been and must be constantly deteriorating to the minds and souls of himself and his associates away from all laws and refined habits of living 
away from the society of religious, modest, and accomplished women, always surrounded by savage scenes and forced to cultivate a taste for barbarous things. What had this life made of him? What was he to do with himself in the future? Sick of trapping and hunting, with brief intervals of carousing, he felt himself to be. And then, even if he were not, the trade was no longer profitable enough to support him. What could he do? Where could he go? He remembered his talk with Mrs. Whitman, that fair, tall, courteous, and dignified lady who had stirred in him longings to return to the civilized life of his native state. But he felt unfit for the society of such as she. Would he ever, could he ever attain to it now? He had promised her he might go over into Oregon and settle down. But could he settle down? should he not starve at trying to do what other men mechanics and farmers do and as to learning he had none of it there was no hope then of living by his wits as some men did missionaries and artists and school teachers some of whom he had met at the rendezvous hey ho to be checkmated in life at twenty-eight that would never do at fort hall on his return he met two more missionaries and their wives going to oregon but these four did not affect him pleasantly he had no mind to go with them instead he set out on what proved to be his last trapping expedition with a frenchman named matelot they visited the old trapping grounds on pierre's fork lewis lake jackson's river jackson's hole lewis river and salt river but beaver were scarce, and it was with a feeling of relief that, on returning by way of Bear River, Meek heard from a Frenchman whom he met there that he was wanted at Fort Hall by his friend Newell, who had something to propose to him. End of chapter 20「Eleven Years in the Rocky Mountains and a Life on the Frontier」by Francis A. Victor. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 21. 1840. When Meek arrived at Fort Hall, where Newell was awaiting him, he found that the latter had there the two wagons which Dr. Whitman had left at the points on the journey where further transportation by their means had been pronounced impossible. The doctor's idea of finding a passable wagon road over the lava plains and the heavily timbered mountains lying between Fort Hall and the Columbia River seemed to Newell not so wild a one as it was generally pronounced to be in the mountains. At all events, he was prepared to undertake the journey. The wagons were put in traveling order, and horses and mules purchased for the expedition. Come, said Newell to Meek, we are done with this life in the mountains, done with wading in beaver dams and freezing or starving alternately, done with Indian trading and Indian fighting. The fur trade is dead in the Rocky Mountains, and it is no place for us now, if ever it was. We are young yet and have life before us. We cannot waste it here. We cannot or will not return to the States. Let us go down to the Willamette and take farms. There is already quite a settlement there, made by the Methodist Mission and the Hudson's Bay Company's retired servants. I have had some talk with the Americans who have gone down there, and the talk is that the country is going to be settled up by our people, and that the Hudson's Bay Company are not going to rule this country much longer. What do you say, Meek? Shall we turn American settlers? I'll go where you do, Newell. What suits you suits me. I thought you'd say so, and that's why I sent for you, Meek. In my way of thinking, a white man is a little better than a Canadian Frenchman. I'll be dashed if I'll hang around a post of the Hudson's Bay Company. So you'll go. I reckon I will. What have you got for me to do? I haven't got anything to begin with but a wife and baby. Well, you can drive one of the wagons and take your family and traps along. 
Nicholas will drive the other, and I'll play leader and look after the train. Craig will go also, so we shall be quite a party, with what strays we shall be sure to pick up. Thus it was settled. Thus Oregon began to receive her first real immigrants, who were neither fur traders nor missionaries, but true frontiersmen, border men. The training which the mountain men had received in the service of the fur companies admirably fitted them to be what afterwards they became, a valuable and indispensable element in the society of that country, in whose peculiar history they played an important part. But we must not anticipate their acts before we have witnessed their gradual transformation from lawless rangers of the wilderness to law-abiding and even law-making and law-executing citizens of an isolated territory. In order to understand the condition of things in the Willamette Valley or Lower Columbia country, it will be necessary to revert to the earliest history of that territory, as sketched in the first chapter of this book. A history of the fur companies is a history of Oregon up to the year 1834, so far as the occupation of the country was concerned. But its political history was begun long before, from the time, May 11th, 1792, when the captain of a New England coasting and fur trading vessel entered the great river of the West, which nations had been looking for a hundred years at the very time when the inquisitive Yankee was heading his little vessel through the white line of breakers at the mouth of the long-sought river, a British exploring expedition was scanning the shore between it and the Straits of Fuca, having wisely declared its scientific opinion that there was no such river on that coast. Vancouver, the chief of that expedition, so assured the Yankee trader, whose views did not agree with his own, and Yankee-like, the trader turned back to satisfy himself. A bold and lucky man was Captain Gray of the ship Columbia. No explorer he, only an adventurous and withal a prudent trader, with an eye to the main chance, emulous too, perhaps, of a little glory, it is impossible to conceive how he could have done this thing calmly. We think his stout heart must have shivered somewhat, both with anticipation and dread, as he ran for the opening and plunged into the frightful tumult, straight through the proper channel, thank God, and sailed out onto the bosom of that beautiful bay, twenty-five miles by six, which the great river forms at its mouth, we trust the morning was fine, for then Captain Gray must have beheld a sight which a discoverer should remember for a lifetime. This magnificent bay, surrounded by lofty hills clad thick with noble forests of fir, and fretted along its margin with spurs of the highlands, forming other smaller bays and coves, into which ran streams whose valleys were hidden among the hills." from beyond the farthest point whose dark ridge jutted across this inland sea flowed down the deep broad river whose course and origin was still a magnificent mystery but which indicated by its volume that it drained a mighty region of probable great fertility and natural wealth perhaps captain gray did not fully realize the importance of his discovery if the day was fine with a blue sky and the purple shadows lying in among the hills with smooth water before him and the foamy breakers behind, if he felt that his discovery was in point of importance to the world, he was a proud and happy man and enjoyed the reward of his daring. The only testimony on that head is the simple entry on his logbook telling us that he had named the river columbia's river with an apostrophe that tiny point intimating much this was one ground of the american claim though vancouver after gray had reported his success to him sent a lieutenant to explore the river and then claimed the discovery for england the next claim of the united states upon the oregon territory was by virtue of the florida treaty and the louisiana purchase these, and the general one of natural boundaries, England contested also. Hence the treaty of joint occupancy for a term of ten years, renewable, unless one of the parties to it gave a twelve-month's notice of intention to withdraw. 
meantime this question of territorial claims hung over the national head like the sword suspended by a hair which statesmen delight in referring to we did not dare to say oregon was ours because we were afraid england would make war on us and england did not dare say oregon was hers for the same reason therefore joint occupancy was the polite word with which statesmen glossed over the fact that great britain actually possessed a country through the monopoly of the hudson's bay company that company had a good thing so long as the government of great britain prevented any outbreak by simply renewing the treaty every ten years their manner of doing business was such as to prevent any less powerful corporation from interfering with them while individual enterprise was sure to be crushed at the start but man proposes and god disposes in eighteen thirty four the methodist episcopal board of mission sent out four missionaries to labor among the indians these were two preachers the rev messrs jason and daniel lee and two lay members cyrus shepherd and p l edwards these gentlemen were liberally furnished with all the necessaries and comforts of life by the board in addition to which they received the kindest attentions and consideration from the officers of the hudson's bay company at vancouver their vessel the may dacre captain lambert had arrived safely in the river with the mission goods the gentlemen at vancouver encouraged their enterprise and advised them to settle in the willamette valley the most fertile tract of country west of the rocky mountains being missionaries nothing was to be feared from them in the way of trade the willamette valley was a good country for the mission at the same time it was south of the columbia river this latter consideration was not an unimportant one with the hudson's bay company it being understood among those in the confidence of the british government that in case the oregon territory had to be divided with the united states the columbia river would probably be made the northern boundary of the american possessions there was nothing in the character of the christian missionaries labor which the hudson's bay company could possibly object to without a palpable violation of the convention of eighteen eighteen therefore although the methodist mission in the willamette valley received a large accession to its numbers in eighteen thirty seven they were as kindly welcomed as had been those of eighteen thirty four and also those presbyterian missionaries of eighteen thirty six who had settled in the upper country three points however the hudson's bay company insisted upon so far as under the treaty they could the americans must not trade with the indians but confine themselves to agricultural pursuits and missionary labor and keep on the south side of the columbia not an immigrant entered oregon in that day who did not proceed at once to vancouver nor was there one who did not meet with the most liberal and hospitable treatment neither was this hospitality a trifling benefit to the weary traveller just arrived from a long and most fatiguing journey it was extremely welcome and refreshing at vancouver was the only society and the only luxurious living to be enjoyed on the whole northwest coast at the head of the first was dr john mclaughlin already mentioned as the chief factor and deputy governor of the hudson's bay company in oregon and all the northwest he was of scotch origin and canadian birth a gentleman bred with a character of the highest integrity to which were united justice and humanity his position as head of the hudson's bay company's affairs was no enviable one during that period of oregon history which followed the advent of americans in the willamette valley himself a british subject and a representative of that powerful corporation which bent the british government to its will he was bound to execute its commands when they did not conflict too strongly with his consciousness of right and justice as has been stated the methodist mission settlement was reinforced in eighteen thirty seven by the arrival of about twenty persons among whom were several ladies and a few children 
these like those preceding them were first entertained at fort vancouver before proceeding to the mission which was between fifty and sixty miles up the willamette in the heart of that delightful valley these persons came by a sailing vessel around cape horn bringing with them supplies for the mission in the two following years there were about a dozen missionary arrivals overland all of whom tarried a short time at the american company's rendezvous as before related these were some of them designed for the upper country but most of them soon settled in the willamette valley during these years between eighteen thirty four and eighteen forty there had drifted into the valley various persons from california the rocky mountains and from the vessels which sometimes appeared in the columbia until at the time when newell and meek resolved to quit the mountains the american settlers numbered nearly one hundred men women and children of these about thirty belonged to the missions the remainder were mountain men sailors and adventurers the mountain men most of them had native wives besides the americans there were sixty canadian frenchmen who had been retired upon farms by the hudson's bay company and who would probably have occupied these farms so long as the h b company should have continued to do business in oregon End of chapter twenty one chapter twenty two of eleven years in the rocky mountains and a life on the frontier by francis a victor this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty two when it was settled that newell and meek were to go to the willamette they lost no time in dallying but packed the wagons with whatever they possessed in the way of worldly goods topped them with their nez perce wives and half-breed children and started for walla walla accompanied by craig another mountain man and either followed or accompanied by several others meek drove a five-in-hand team of four horses and one mule nicholas drove the other team of four horses and newell who owned the train was mounted as leader the journey was no easy one extending as it did over immense plains of lava round impassable canyons over rapid unbridged rivers and over mountains hitherto believed to be only passable for pack trains the honor which has heretofore been accorded to the presbyterian missionaries solely of opening a wagon road from the rocky mountains to the columbia river should in justice be divided with these two mountaineers who accomplished the most difficult part of this difficult journey arrived at fort boise a post of the hudson's bay company the little caravan stopped for a few days to rest and recruit their animals with the usual courtesy of that company mr payette the trader in charge offered newell quarters in the fort as leader of his party to meek and craig who were encamped outside he sent a piece of sturgeon with his compliments which our incipient oregonians sent back again with their compliments no hudson's bay distinctions of rank for them no indeed the moment that an american commenced to think of himself as a settler on the most remote corner of american soil that moment as if by instinct he began to defend and support his republicanism after a few days rest the party went on encountering as might be expected much difficulty and toil but arriving safely after a reasonable time at the columbia river at the junction of the umatilla here the wagons and stock were crossed over and the party proceeded directly to dr whitman's mission at waialatpu dr whitman gave them a friendly reception killing for them if not the fatted calf the fattest hog he had telling meek at the same time that fat pork was good for preachers referring to meek's missionary labors among the nez Perces. during the three years since the commencement of the mission at wailatpu considerable advancement had been made in the progress of civilization among the cayuses quite a number of indian children were domesticated with mrs whitman who were rapidly acquiring a knowledge of housekeeping sewing reading and writing and farm labor with mrs whitman for whom meek still entertained great admiration and respect he resolved to leave his little girl helen marr 
the fruit of his connection with the nez perce woman who persisted in abandoning him in the mountains as already related having thus made provision for the proper instruction of his daughter and conferred with the doctor on the condition of the american settlers in oregon the doctor being an ardent american meek and his associates started once more for the willamette at walla walla newell decided to leave the wagons the weather having become so rainy and disagreeable as to make it doubtful about getting them over the cascade mountains that fall accordingly the goods were transferred to pack horses for the remainder of the journey in the following year however one of the wagons was brought down by newell and taken to the plains on the tualatin river being the first vehicle of the kind in the willamette valley on arriving at the dalles of the columbia our mountain men found that a mission had been established at that place for the conversion of those inconscionable thieves the wishroom indians renowned in indian history for their acquisitiveness this mission was under the charge of daniel lee and a mr perkins and was an offshoot of the methodist mission in the willamette valley these gentlemen having found the benighted condition of the indians to exceed their powers of enlightenment in any ordinary way were having recourse to extraordinary efforts and were carrying on what is commonly termed a revival though what piety there was in the hearts of these savages to be revived it would be difficult to determine however they doubtless hoped so to wrestle with god themselves as to compel a blessing upon their labors the indians indeed were not averse to prayer they could pray willingly and sincerely enough when they could hope for a speedy and actual material answer to their prayers and it was for that and that only that they importuned the christian's god finding that their prayers were not answered according to their desire it at length became difficult to persuade them to pray at all sometimes it is true they succeeded in deluding the missionaries with the belief that they were really converted for a time one of these most hopeful converts at the dalles mission being in want of a shirt and capote volunteered to pray for a whole year if mr lee would furnish him with these truly desirable articles it is no wonder that with such hopeless material to work upon the dalles missionaries withdrew from them a portion of their zeal and bestowed it where it was quite as much needed upon any stray mountain man who chanced to be entertained within their gates newell's party among others received the well-meant but not always well received or appreciated attentions of these gentlemen the american mountaineer was not likely to be suddenly surprised into praying in earnest and he generally had too much real reverence to be found making a jest in the form of a mocking prayer not so scrupulous however was jean Drot, a lively french canadian who was travelling in company with the americans on being repeatedly importuned to pray with that tireless zeal which distinguishes the methodist preacher above all others Jandro appeared suddenly to be smitten with a consciousness of his guilt and kneeling in the midst of the meeting began with clasped hands and upturned eyes to pour forth a perfect torrent of words with wonderful dramatic power he appeared to confess to supplicate to agonize in idiomatic french his tears and ejaculations touched the hearts of the missionaries and filled them with gladness they too ejaculated and wept with frequently uttered amens and hallelujahs until the scene became highly dramatic and exciting in the midst of this grand tableau when the enthusiasm was at its height Jandro suddenly ceased and rose to his feet while an irrepressible outburst of laughter from his associates aroused the astonished missionaries to a partial comprehension of the fact that they had been made the subjects of a practical joke though they never knew to exactly how great an extent the mischievous frenchman had only recited with truly artistic power and with such variations as the situation suggested one of the most wonderful and effective tales from the arabian nights entertainment with which he was wont to delight and amuse his comrades beside the winter camp-fire but jandro was called to account when he arrived at vancouver 
Dr. McLaughlin had heard the story from some of the party and resolved to punish the man's irreverence at the same time that he gave himself a bit of amusement. Sending for the Reverend Father Blanchet, who was then resident at Vancouver, he informed him of the circumstance, and together they arranged Jandro's punishment. He was ordered to appear in their united presence and make a true statement of the affair. Jandro confessed that he had done what he was accused of doing, made a mock of prayer, and told a tale instead of offering a supplication. He was then ordered by the Reverend Father to rehearse the scene exactly as it occurred, in order that he might judge of the amount of his guilt and apportion him his punishment. Trembling and abashed, poor Jandro fell upon his knees and began the recital with much trepidation. But as he proceeded, he warmed with the subject, his dramatic instinct asserted itself, tears streamed and voice and eyes supplicated until this second representation threatened to outdo the first with outward gravity and inward mirth his two solemn judges listened to the close and when jandro rose quite exhausted from his knees father blanchet hastily dismissed him with an admonition and a light penance as the door of dr mclaughlin's office closed behind him not only the doctor but father blanchet indulged in a burst of long restrained laughter at the comical absurdities of this impious frenchman to return to our immigrants on leaving the dalles they proceeded on down the south side of the river as far as practicable or opposite to the wind mountain at this point the indians assisted to cross them over to the north side when they again made their way along the river as far as tea prairie above vancouver the weather was execrable with a pouring rain and sky of dismal gray december being already far advanced our travelers were not in the best of humors indeed a saint-like amiability is seldom found in conjunction with rain mud fatigue and an empty stomach some ill-natured suspicions were uttered to the effect that the indians who were assisting to cross the party at this point had stolen some ropes that were missing upon this dishonorable insinuation the indian heart was fired and a fight became imminent this undesirable climax to emigrant woes was however averted by an attack upon the indignant natives with firebrands when they prudently retired leaving the travellers to pursue their way in peace it was on sunday that the weary dirty hungry little procession arrived at a place on the willamette river where the present town of milwaukee is situated and found here two missionaries the reverend messrs waller and beers who were preaching to the indians meek immediately applied to mr waller for some provisions and received for answer that it was sunday mr waller however on being assured that it was no more agreeable starving on sunday than a weekday finally allowed the immigrants to have a peck of small potatoes but as a party of several persons could not long subsist on so short allowance and as there did not seem to be any encouragement to expect more from the missionaries there was no course left to be pursued but to make an appeal to fort vancouver to fort vancouver then newell went the next day and returned on the following one with some dried salmon tea sugar and sea bread it was not quite what the mountain men could have wished this dependence on the hudson's bay company for food and did not quite agree with what they had said when their hearts were big in the mountains being patriotic on a full stomach is easy compared to being the same thing on an empty one a truth which became more and more apparent as the winter progressed and the new settlers found that if they would eat they must ask food of some person or persons outside of the methodist mission and outside of that there was in all the country only the hudson's bay company and a few mountain men like themselves who had brought nothing into the country and could get nothing out of it at present there was but short time in which to consider what was to be done newell and meek went to willamette falls the day after newell's return from vancouver and there met an old comrade doughty who was looking for a place to locate 
the three made their camp together on the west side of the river on a hill overlooking the falls while in camp they were joined by two other rocky mountain men wilkins and eberts who were also looking for a place to settle in there were now six of the rocky mountain men together and they resolved to push out into the plains to the west of them and see what could be done in the matter of selecting homes as for our hero we fear we cannot say much of him here which would serve to render him heroic in criticizing yankee eyes he was a mountain man and that only he had neither book learning nor a trade nor any knowledge of the simplest affairs appertaining to the ordinary ways of getting a living he had only his strong hands and a heart naturally stout and light his friend newell had the advantage of him in several particulars he had rather more book knowledge more business experience and also more means with these advantages he became a sort of bushway among his old comrades who consented to follow his lead in the important movement about to be made and settle in the tualatin plains should he decide to do so accordingly camp was raised and the party proceeded to the plains where they arrived on christmas and went into camp again the hardships of mountain life were light compared to the hardships of this winter for in the mountains when the individual's resources were exhausted there was always the company to go to which was practically inexhaustible should it be necessary the company was always willing to become the creditor of a good mountain man and the debtor gave himself no uneasiness because he knew that if he lived he could discharge his indebtedness but everything was different now there was no way of paying debts even if there had been a company willing to give them credit which there was not at least among americans hard times they had seen in the mountains harder times they were likely to see in the valley indeed were already experiencing instead of fat buffalo meat antelope and mountain mutton which made the plenty of a camp on powder river our carnivorous hunters were reduced to eating daily a little boiled wheat in this extremity meek went on an expedition of discovery across the highlands that border the lower willamette and found on wapato now sovey's island a mr and mrs baldra living who were in the service of the hudson's bay company and drew rations from them with great kindness they divided the provisions on hand furnishing him with dried salmon and sea bread to which he added ducks and swans procured from the indians poor and scanty as was the supply thus obtained it was after boiled wheat comparative luxury while it lasted eighteen forty one the winter proved a very disagreeable one considerable snow fell early and went off with heavy rains flooding the whole country the little camp on the tualatin plains had no defence from the weather better than indian lodges and one small cabin built by doughty on a former visit to the plains for doughty had been one of the first of the mountain men to come to the willamette on the breaking up of the fur companies indian lodges or no lodges at all were what the men were used to but in the drier climate of the rocky mountains it had not seemed such a miserable life as it now did where for months together the ground was saturated with rain while the air was constantly charged with vapor as for going anywhere or doing anything either were equally impossible no roads the streams all swollen and out of banks the rains incessant there was nothing for them but to remain in camp and wait for the return of spring when at last the rainy season was over and the sun shining once more most of the mountain men in the tualatin plains camp took land claims and set to work improving them of those who began farming that spring were newell doughty wilkins and walker these obtained seed wheat from the hudson's bay company also such farming implements as they must have and even oxen to draw the plow through the strong prairie sod the wheat was to be returned to the company the cattle also and the farming implements paid for whenever the debtor became able this was certainly liberal conduct on the part of a company generally understood to be opposed to american settlement 
End of chapter 22. Chapter 23 of Eleven Years in the Rocky Mountains and a Life on the Frontier by Francis A. Victor. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 23, 1841. When spring opened, Meek assisted Newell in breaking the ground for wheat. This done, it became necessary to look out for some immediately paying employment. But paying occupations were hard to find in that new country. At last, like everybody else, Meek found himself, if not hanging about, at least frequently visiting Vancouver. Poor as he was, and unpromising as looked the future, he was the same light-hearted, reckless, and fearless Joe Meek that he had been in the mountains, as jaunty and jolly a ragged mountaineer as ever was seen at the fort. Especially he delighted in recounting his Indian fights, because the company, and Dr. McLaughlin in particular, disapproved the American company's conduct with the Indians. When the doctor chanced to overhear Meek's stories, as he sometimes did, he would say, Mr. Joe, Mr. Joe, a habit the doctor had of speaking rapidly and repeating his words. Mr. Joe, Mr. Joe, you must leave off killing Indians and go to work. I can't work, Meek would answer in his impressively slow and smooth utterance, at the same time giving his shoulders a slight shrug and looking the doctor pleasantly in the face. During the summer, however, the United States Exploring Squadron, under Commodore Wilkes, entered the Columbia River and proceeded to explore the country in several directions, and it was now that Meek found an employment suited to him, being engaged by Wilkes as pilot and servant while on his several tours through the country. On the arrival of three vessels of the squadron at Vancouver, and the first ceremonious visit of Dr. McLaughlin and his associates to Commodore Wilkes on board, there was considerable display, the men in the yards saluting, and all the honors due to the representative of a friendly foreign power. After dinner, while the guests were walking on deck engaged in conversation, the talk turned upon the loss of the peacock, one of the vessels belonging to the U.S. squadron, which was wrecked on the bar at the mouth of the Columbia. The English gentlemen were polite enough to be expressing their regrets at the loss to the United States. When Meek, who had picked up a little history in spite of his life spent in the mountains, laughingly interrupted with, No loss at all, gentlemen. Uncle Sam can get another peacock the way he got that one wilkes who probably regretted the allusion as not being consonant with the spirit of hospitality passed over the interruption in silence but when the gentleman from vancouver had taken leave he turned to meek with a meaning twinkle in his eye meek said he go down to my cabin and you'll find there something good to eat and some first-rate brandy of course meek went while Wilkes was exploring in the Cowlitz Valley, with Meek and a Hudson's Bay man named Forrest as guides, he one day laid down in his tent to sleep, leaving his chronometer watch lying on the camp table beside him. Forrest, happening to observe that it did not agree with his own, which he believed to be correct, very kindly as he supposed, regulated it to agree with his. On awakening and taking up his watch, a puzzled expression came over Wilkes' face for a moment as he discovered the change in the time, then one of anger and disappointment, as what had occurred flashed over his mind, followed by some rather strong expressions of indignation. Forrest was penitent when he perceived the mischief done by his meddling, but that would not restore the chronometer to the true time and this accident proved a serious annoyance and hindrance during the remainder of the expedition. After exploring the Cowlitz Valley, Wilkes dispatched a party under Lieutenant Emmons to proceed up the Willamette Valley, thence south along the old trail of the Hudson's Bay Company to California. Meek was employed to pilot this party, which had reached the head of the valley, when it became necessary to send for some papers in the possession of the Commodore, and he returned to Astoria upon this duty. 
on joining emmons again he found that some of his men had become disaffected towards him especially jean Drot, the same frenchman who prayed so dramatically at the dalles jean Drot confided to meek that he hated emmons and intended to kill him the next morning when lieutenant e was examining the arms of the party he fired off jean Drot's gun which being purposely overcharged flew back and inflicted some injuries upon the lieutenant what do you mean by loading a gun like that inquired emmons in a rage i meant it to kill two engines one before and one behind answered jandro as might be conjectured jandro was made to fire his own gun after that the expedition had not proceeded much farther when it again became necessary to send an express to vancouver and meek was ordered upon this duty here he found that wilkes had purchased a small vessel which he named the oregon with which he was about to leave the country as there was no further use for his services our quondam trapper was again thrown out of employment in this exigency finding it necessary to make some provision for the winter he became a gleaner of wheat in the fields of his more provident neighbors by which means a sufficient supply was secured to keep himself and his small family in food until another spring when winter set in meek paid a visit to the new mission he had been there once before in the spring to buy an axe think o oh reader of travelling fifty or more miles on horseback or in a small boat to procure so simple and necessary an article of civilized life as an axe but none of the everyday conveniencies of living grow spontaneously in the wilderness more is the pity else life in the wilderness would be thought more delightful far than life in the most luxurious of cities inasmuch as nature is more satisfying than art meek's errand to the mission on this occasion was to find whether he could get a cow and credit at the same time for the prospect of living for another winter on boiled wheat was not a cheerful one he had not succeeded and was returning when at Shampooey he met a mr whitcomb superintendent of the mission farm a conversation took place wherein meek's desire for a cow became known the missionaries never lost an opportunity of proposing prayers and mr whitcomb thought this a good one after showing much interest in the condition of meek's soul it was proposed that he should pray i can't pray that's your business not mine said meek pleasantly it is every man's business to pray for himself answered whitcomb very well some other time will do for that what i want now is a cow how can you expect to get what you want if you won't ask for it inquired whitcomb i reckon i have asked you and i don't see nary cow yet you must ask god my friend but in the first place you must pray to be forgiven for your sins i'll tell you what i'll do if you will furnish the cow i'll agree to pray for half an hour right here on the spot down on your knees then you'll furnish the cow yes said whitcomb fairly cornered down on his knees dropped the merry reprobate and prayed out his half hour with how much earnestness only himself and god knew but the result was what he had come for a cow for whitcomb was as good as his word and sent him home rejoicing and thus with what he had earned from wilkes his gleaned wheat and his cow he contrived to get through another winter perhaps the most important personal event which distinguished this year in meek's history was the celebration according to the rites of the christian church of his marriage with the nez perce woman who had already borne him two children and who still lives the mother of a family of seven End of chapter twenty three Chapter Twenty Four of Eleven Years in the Rocky Mountains and A Life on the Frontier by Francis A. Victor. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Four, eighteen forty two. 
by the opening of another spring meek had so far overcome his distaste for farm labor as to put in a field of wheat for himself with doughty and to make some arrangements about his future subsistence this done he was ready as usual for anything in the way of adventure which might turn up this was however a very quiet summer in the little colony important events were brooding but as yet results were not perceptible except to the mind of a prophet the hudson's bay company conformably to british policy were at work to turn the balance of power in oregon in favor of british occupation and unknown even to the colonists the united states government was taking what measures it could to shift the balance in its own favor very little was said about the subject of government claims among the colonists but a feeling of suspense oppressed all parties the work of putting in wheat and improving farms had just begun to slacken a little when there was an arrival in the columbia river of a vessel from boston the chenemus captain cooch the chenemus brought a cargo of goods which were placed in store at willamette falls to be sold to the settlers being the first successful attempt at trade ever made in oregon outside of the hudson's bay and methodist mission stores when the fourth of july came the chenemus was lying in the willamette below the falls near where the present city of portland stands meek who was always first to be at any spot where noise bustle or excitement might be anticipated and whose fine humor and fund of anecdote made him always welcome had borrowed a boat from captain cooch's clerk at the falls and gone down to the vessel early in the morning before the salute for the glorious fourth was fired there he remained all day enjoying a patriotic swagger and an occasional glass of something good to drink other visitors came aboard during the day which was duly celebrated to the satisfaction of all towards evening a party from the mission wishing to return to the falls took possession of meek's borrowed boat to go off with now was a good opportunity to show the value of free institutions meek like other mountain men felt the distance which the missionaries placed between him and themselves on the score of their moral and social superiority and resented the freedom with which they appropriated what he had with some trouble secured to himself intercepting the party when more than half of them were seated in the boat he informed them that they were trespassing upon a piece of property which for the present belonged to him and for which he had a very urgent need vexed by the delay and by having to relinquish the boat to a man who according to their view of the case could not read his title clear to anything either on earth or in heaven the missionaries expostulated somewhat warmly but meek insisted and so compelled them to wait for some better opportunity of leaving the ship then loading the boat with what was much more to the purpose a good supply of provisions meek proceeded to drink the captain's health in a very ostentatious manner and take his leave in the meantime dr marcus whitman of the wailatpu mission in the upper country was so fearful of the intentions of the british government that he set out for washington late in the autumn of eighteen forty two to put the secretary of state on his guard concerning the boundary question and to pray that it might be settled conformably with the wishes of the americans in oregon there was one feature however of this otherwise rather entertaining race for possession which was becoming quite alarming in all this strife about claiming the country the indian claim had not been considered it has been already intimated that the attempt to civilize or christianize the indians of western oregon was practically an entire failure but they were not naturally of a warlike disposition and had been so long under the control of the hudson's bay company that there was comparatively little to apprehend from them even though they felt some discontent at the incoming immigration but with the indians of the upper columbia it was different especially so with the tribes among whom the presbyterian missionaries were settled the walla wallas cayuses and nez Perces, three brave and powerful nations much united by intermarriages 
the impression which these people had first made on the missionaries was very favorable their evident intelligence inquisitiveness and desire for religious teachings seemed to promise a good reward of missionary labor dr whitman and his associates had been diligent in their efforts to civilize and christianize them to induce the men to leave off their migratory habits and learn agriculture and the women to learn spinning sewing cooking and all the most essential arts of domestic life at the first the novelty of these new pursuits engaged their interest as it also excited their hope of gain but the task of keeping them to their work with sufficient steadiness was very great they required like children to be bribed with promises of more or less immediate reward of their exertions nor would they relinquish the fulfillment of a promise even though they had failed to perform the conditions on which the promise became binding by and by they made the discovery that neither the missionaries could nor the white man's god did confer upon them what they desired the enjoyment of all the blessings of the white men and that if they wish to enjoy these blessings they must labor to obtain them this discovery was very discouraging inasmuch as the indian nature is decidedly averse to steady labor and they could perceive that very little was to be expected from any progress which could be achieved in one generation as for the christian faith they understood about as much of its true spirit as savages with the law of blood written in their hearts could be expected to understand they looked for nothing more nor less than the literal fulfillment of the bible promises nothing less would content them and as to the forms of their new religion they liked them well enough liked singing and praying and certain orderly observances the chiefs leading in these as in other matters so much interest did they discover at first that their teachers were deceived as to the actual extent of the good they were doing as time went on however there began to be cause for mutual dissatisfaction the indians became aware that no matter how many concessions their teachers made to them they were still the inferiors of the whites and that they must ever remain so but the thought which produced the deepest chagrin was that they had got these white people settled amongst them by their own invitation and aid and that now it was evident they were not to be benefited as had been hoped as the whites were turning their attention to benefiting themselves as early as eighteen thirty nine mr smith an associate of mr spaulding in the country of the nez Perces, was forbidden by the high chief of the nez Perces to cultivate the ground he had been permitted to build but was assured that if he broke the soil for the purpose of farming it the ground so broken should serve to bury him in still smith went on in the spring to prepare for ploughing and the chief seeing him ready to begin inquired if he recollected that he had been forbidden yet persisting in his undertaking several of the indians came to him and taking him by the shoulder asked him again if he did not know that the hole he should make in the earth would be made to serve for his grave upon which third warning smith left off and quitted the country other missionaries also left for the willamette valley in eighteen forty two there were three mission stations in the upper country that of dr whitman at wailatpu on the walla walla river that of mr spaulding on the clearwater river called lapwai and another on the spokane river called simicane these missions were from one hundred and twenty to three hundred miles distant from each other and numbered altogether only about one dozen whites of both sexes at each of these stations there was a small body of land under cultivation a few cattle and hogs a flouring and sawmill and blacksmith shop and such improvements as the needs of the mission demanded the indians also cultivated under the direction of their teachers some little patches of ground generally but a small garden spot and the fact that they did even so much was very creditable to those who labored to instruct them there was no want of ardor or industry in the presbyterian mission on the contrary they applied themselves conscientiously to the work they had undertaken 
but this conscientious discharge of duty did not give them immunity from outrage both mr spalding and dr whitman had been rudely handled by the indians had been struck and spat upon and had nose and ears pulled even the delicate and devoted mrs spalding had been grossly insulted later the cayuses had assailed dr whitman in his house with war clubs and broken down doors of communication between the private apartments and the public sitting-room explanations and promises generally followed these acts of outrage yet it would seem that the missionaries should have been warned taking advantage of dr whitman's absence the cayuses had frightened mrs whitman from her home to the methodist mission at the dalles by breaking into her bedchamber at night with an infamous design from which she barely escaped and by subsequently burning down the mill and destroying a considerable quantity of grain about the same time the nez purses at the lapway mission were very insolent and had threatened mr spalding's life all of which one would say was but a poor return for the care and instruction bestowed upon them during six years of patient effort on the part of their teachers poor as it was the indians did not see it in that light but only thought of the danger which threatened them in the possible loss of their country End of chapter twenty four Chapter twenty five of Eleven Years in the Rocky Mountains and a Life on the Frontier by Francis A. Victor. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty five, eighteen forty two to three. The plot thickened that winter in the little drama being enacted west of the Rocky Mountains. The forests which clad the mountains and foothills in perpetual verdure, and the thickets which skirted the numerous streams flowing into the Willamette all abounded in wild animals whose depredations upon the domestic cattle lately introduced into the country were a serious drawback to their natural increase not a settler owning cattle or hogs but had been robbed more or less frequently by the wolves bears and panthers which prowled unhindered in the vicinity of their herds this was a ground of common interest to all settlers of whatever allegiance accordingly a notice was issued that a meeting would be held at a certain time and place to consider the best means of preventing the destruction of stock in the country and all persons interested were invited to attend this meeting was held on the second of february eighteen forty three and was well attended by both classes of colonists it served however only as a preliminary step to the regular wolf association meeting which took place a month later at the meeting on the fourth of march there was a full attendance and the utmost harmony prevailed notwithstanding there was a well-defined suspicion in the minds of the canadians that they were going to be called upon to furnish protection to something more than the cattle and hogs of the settlers after the proper parliamentary forms and the choosing of the necessary officers of the association the meeting proceeded to fix the rate of bounty for each animal killed by any one out of the association viz three dollars for a large wolf a dollar fifty for a lynx two dollars for a bear and five dollars for a panther the money to pay these bounties was to be raised by subscription and handed over to the treasurer for disbursement the currency being drafts on fort vancouver the mission and the milling company besides wheat and other commodities this business being arranged the real object of the meeting was announced in this wise resolved that a committee be appointed to take into consideration the propriety of taking measures for the civil and military protection of this colony a committee of twelve were then selected and the meeting adjourned but in that committee there was a most subtle mingling of all the elements missionaries mountain men and canadians an attempt by an offer of the honors to fuse into one all the several divisions of political sentiment in oregon on the second day of may eighteen forty three the committee appointed march fourth to take into consideration the propriety of taking measures for the civil and military protection of the colony 
met at Champouy, the Canadian settlement, and presented to the people their ultimatum in favor of organizing a provisional government. On a motion being made that the report of the committee should be accepted, it was put to vote and lost. All was now confusion, various expressions of disappointment or gratification being mingled in one tempest of sound. When the confusion had somewhat subsided, Mr. G. W. Le Breton made a motion that the meeting should divide, those who were in favor of an organization taking their positions on the right hand, and those opposed to it on the left, marching into file. The proposition carried, and Joe Meek, who in all this historical reminiscence we have almost lost sight of, though he had not lost sight of events, stepped to the front with a characteristic air of the free-born american in his gait and gestures who's for a divide all in favor of the report and an organization follow me then marched at the head of his column which speedily fell into line as did also the opposite party on counting fifty-two were found to be on the right-hand side and fifty on the left so evenly were the two parties balanced at that time when the result was made known once more meek's voice rang out three cheers for our side it did not need a second invitation but loud and long the shout went up for freedom and loudest and longest were heard the voices of the american mountain men thus the die was cast which made oregon ultimately a member of the federal union the business of the meeting was concluded by the election of a supreme judge with probate powers a clerk of the court a sheriff four magistrates four constables a treasurer a mayor and a captain the two latter officers being instructed to form companies of mounted riflemen in addition to these officers a legislative committee was chosen consisting of nine members who were to report to the people at a public meeting to be held at Champouy on the fifth of july following of the legislative committee two were mountain men with whose names the reader is familiar newell and doughty among the other appointments was meek to the office of sheriff a position for which his personal qualities of courage and good humor admirably fitted him in the then existing state of society end of chapter twenty six chapter twenty six of eleven years in the rocky mountains and a life on the frontier by francis a victor this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty six the immigration into oregon of the year eighteen forty three was the first since newell and meek who had brought wagons through to the columbia river and in all numbered nearly nine hundred men women and children these immigrants were mostly from missouri and other border states they had been assisted on their long and perilous journey by dr whitman whose knowledge of the route and the requirements of the undertaking made him an invaluable counsellor as he was an untiring friend of the immigrants at the dalles of the columbia the wagons were abandoned it being too late in the season and the wants of the immigrants too pressing to admit of an effort being made to cut out a wagon road through the heavy timber of the cascade mountains already a trail had been made over them and around the base of mount hood by which cattle could be driven from the dalles to the settlements on the willamette and by this route the cattle belonging to the train amounting to thirteen hundred were passed over into the valley but for the people especially the women and children active and efficient help was demanded there was something truly touching and pitiable in the appearance of these hundreds of worn-out, ragged, sunburnt, dusty, emaciated, yet indomitable pioneers, who, after a journey of nearly two thousand miles and of several months' duration over fertile plains, barren deserts, and rugged mountains, stood at last beside the grand and beautiful river of their hopes exhausted by the toils of their pilgrimage dejected and yet rejoicing much they would have liked to rest even here but their poverty admitted of no delay 
the friends to whom they were going and from whom they must exact and receive a temporary hospitality were still separated from them by a weary and dangerous way they delayed as little as possible yet the fall rains came upon them and snow fell in the mountains so as seriously to impede the labor of driving the cattle and hunger and sickness began to affright them in this unhappy situation they might have remained a long time had there been no better dependence than the american settlers already in the valley with the methodist mission at their head for from them it does not appear that aid came nor that any provision had been made by them to assist the expected emigrants as usual in these crises it was the hudson's bay company who came to the rescue and by the offer of boats made it possible for those families to reach the willamette not only were the hudson's bay company's boats all required but canoes and rafts were called into requisition to transport passengers and goods no one never having made the voyage of the columbia from above the dalles to vancouver could have an adequate idea of the perils of the passage as it was performed in those days by small boats and the flat-bottomed mackinaw boats of the hudson's bay company the canadian voyageurs who handled a boat as a good rider governs a horse were not always able to make the passage without accident how then could the clumsy landsmen who were more used to the feel of a plough handle than an oar be expected to do so numerous have been the victims suddenly clutched from life by the grasp of the whirlpools or dashed to death among the fearful rapids of the beautiful but wild and pitiless columbia the immigration of eighteen forty three did not escape without loss and bereavement three brothers from missouri by the name of applegate with their families were descending the river together when by the striking of a boat on a rock in the rapids a number of passengers mostly children of these gentlemen were precipitated into the frightful current the brothers each had a son in this boat one of whom was lost another injured for life and the third escaped as by a miracle this last boy was only ten years of age yet such was the presence of mind and courage displayed in saving his own and a companion's life that the miracle of his escape might be said to be his own being a good swimmer he kept himself valiantly above the surface while being tossed about for nearly two miles succeeding at last in grasping a feather bed which was floating near him he might have passed the remaining rapids without serious danger had he not been seized as it were by the feet and drawn down down into a seething turning roaring abyss of water where he was held whirling about and dancing up and down striking now and then upon the rocks until death seemed not only imminent but certain after enduring this violent whirling and dashing for what seemed a hopelessly long period of time he was suddenly vomited forth by a whirlpool once more upon the surface of the rapids and notwithstanding the bruises he had received was able by great exertion to throw himself near and seize upon a ledge of rocks to this he clung with desperation until by dint of much effort he finally drew himself out of the water and stretched himself on the narrow shelf where for a moment he swooned away but on opening his eyes he beheld struggling in the foaming flood a young man who had been a passenger in the wrecked boat with himself and who though older was not so good a swimmer calling to him with all his might to make his voice heard above the roar of the rapids he at last gained his attention and encouraged him to try to reach the ledge of rocks where he would assist him to climb up and the almost impossible feat was really accomplished by their united efforts this done young applegate sank again into momentary unconsciousness while poor exhausted nature recruited her forces but although they were saved from immediate destruction death still stared them in the face that side of the river on which they had found lodgment was bounded by precipitous mountains coming directly down to the water they could neither ascend nor skirt along them for foothold there was none 
on the other side was level ground but to reach it they must pass through the rapids an alternative that looked like an assurance of destruction in this extremity it was the boy who resolved to risk his life to save it seeing that a broken ledge of rock extended nearly across the river from a point within his reach but only coming to the surface here and there and of course very slippery he nevertheless determined to attempt to cross on foot amidst the roaring rapids starting alone to make the experiment he actually made the crossing in safety amid the thundering roar and dizzying rush of waters not only made it once but returned to assure his companion of its practicability the young man however had not the courage to undertake it until he had repeatedly been urged to do so and at last only by being persuaded to go before while his younger comrade followed after not to lose sight of him for it was impossible to turn around and directed him where to place his steps in this manner that which appears incredible was accomplished and the two arrived in safety on the opposite side where they were ultimately discovered by their distressed relatives who had believed them to be lost such was the battle which young applegate had with the rocks that the flesh was torn from the palms of his hands and his whole body bruised and lacerated so it was with sorrow after all that the immigrants arrived in the valley nor were their trials over when they had arrived the worst feature about this long and exhausting journey was though it could not be accomplished so as to allow time for recruiting the strength of the travellers and providing them with shelter before the rainy season set in either the new arrivals must camp out in the weather until a log house was thrown up or they must if they were invited crowd into the small cabins of the settlers until there was scarce standing room and thus live for months in an atmosphere which would have bred pestilence in any other less healthful climate not only was the question of domiciles a trying one but that of food still more so some who had families of boys to help in the rough labor of building soon became settled in houses of their own more or less comfortable nor was anything very commodious required for the frontiersmen from missouri but in the matter of something to eat the more boys there were in the family the more hopeless the situation they had scarcely managed to bring with them provisions for their summer's journey it was not possible to bring more in the colony was food but they had no money few of them had much at least they had not goods to exchange labor was not in demand in short the first winter in oregon was to nearly all the new colonists a time of trial if not of actual suffering many families now occupying positions of eminence on the pacific coast know what it was in those early days to feel the pangs of hunger and to want for a sufficient covering for their nakedness two anecdotes of this kind come to the writer's memory as related by the parties themselves the indians who are everywhere a begging race were in the habit of visiting the houses of the settlers and demanding food on one occasion one of them came to the house of a now prominent citizen of oregon as usual petitioning for something to eat the lady of the house and mother of several young children replied that she had nothing to give not liking to believe her the indian persisted in his demand when the lady pointed to her little children and said go away i have nothing not even for those the savage turned on his heel and strode quickly away as the lady thought offended in a short time he reappeared with a sack of dried venison which he laid at her feet take that he said and give the tenus tilicum little children something to eat from that day as long as he lived that humane savage was a friend of the family the other anecdote concerns a gentleman who was chief justice of oregon under the provisional government afterwards governor of california and at present a banker in san francisco he lived at the time spoken of on the tualatin plains and was a neighbor of joe meek not having a house to go into at first he was permitted to settle his family in the district schoolhouse with the understanding that on certain days of the month he was to allow religious services to be held in the building in this he assented 
meeting day came and the family put on their best apparel to make themselves tidy in the eyes of their neighbors only one difficulty was hard to get over mr blank had only one shoe the other foot was bare but he considered the matter for some time and then resolved that he might take a sheltered position behind the teacher's desk where his deficiency would be hidden and when the house filled up as it would do very rapidly he could not be expected to stir for want of space however that happened to the ambitious young lawyer which often does happen to the best laid schemes of mice and men his went all aglay in the midst of the services the speaker needed a cup of water and requested mr blank to furnish it there was no refusing so reasonable a request out before all the congregation walked the abashed and blushing pioneer with his ill-matched feet exposed to view this mortifying exposure was not without an agreeable result for next day he received a present of a pair of moccasins and was enabled thereafter to appear with feet that bore a brotherly resemblance to each other about this time the same gentleman who was as has been said a neighbor of meek's was going to willamette falls with a wagon and meek was going along take something to eat said he to meek for i have nothing and meek promised that he would accordingly when it came time to camp for the night meek was requested to produce his lunch basket going to the wagon meek unfolded an immense pumpkin and brought it to the fire what exclaimed mr blank is that all we have for supper roast pumpkin is not so bad said meek laughing back at him i've had worse fare in the mountains it's buffalo tongue compared to ants or moccasin soles and so with much merriment they proceeded to cut up their pumpkin and roast it finding it as meek had said not so bad when there was no better these anecdotes illustrate what a volume could only describe the perils and privations endured by the colonists in oregon if we add that there were only two flouring mills in the willamette valley and these two not convenient for most of the settlers both belonging to the mission and that to get a few bushels of wheat ground involved the taking of a journey of from four to six days for many and that too over half-broken roads destitute of bridges it will be seen how difficult it was to obtain the commonest comforts of life as for such luxuries as groceries and clothing they had to wait for better times lucky was the man who by hook or by crook got hold of an order on the hudson's bay company the methodist mission or the milling company at the falls were he thus fortunate he had much ado to decide how to make it go farthest and obtain the most not far would it go at the best for fifty per cent profit on all sales was what was demanded and obtained perhaps the holder of a ten dollar draft made out his list of necessaries and presented himself at the store expecting to get them he wanted some unbleached cotton to be dyed to make dresses for the children he would buy a pair of calfskin shoes if he could afford them and yes he would indulge in the luxury of a little a very little sugar just for that once arrived at the store after a long jolting journey in the farm wagon which had crossed the continent the year before he makes his inquiries cotton goods no just out shoes got one pair rather small wouldn't fit you what have you got in the way of goods got a lot of silk handkerchiefs and twelve dozen straw hats any pins nope a few knitting needles any yarn yes there's a pretty good lot of yarn but don't you want some sugar the last ship that was in left a quantity of sugar so the holder of the draft exchanges it for some yarn and a few nails and takes the balance in sugar fairly compelled to be luxurious in one article for the reason that others were not to be had till some other ship came in no mails reached the colony and no letters left it except such as were carried by private hand or were sent once a year in the hudson's bay company's express to canada and thence to the states newspapers arrived in the same manner or by vessel from the sandwich islands 
notwithstanding all these drawbacks education was encouraged even from the very beginning a library was started and literary societies formed and this all the more perhaps that the colony was so isolated and dependent on itself for intellectual pleasures the spring of eighteen forty four saw the colony in a state of some excitement on account of an attempt to introduce the manufacture of ardent spirits this dangerous article had always been carefully excluded from the country first by the hudson's bay company and secondly by the methodist mission and since the time when a mr young had been induced to relinquish its manufacture no serious effort had been made to introduce it it does not appear from the oregon archives that any law against its manufacture existed at that time it had probably been overlooked in the proceedings of the legislative committee of the previous summer neither was there yet any executive head to the provisional government the election not having taken place in this dilemma the people found themselves in the month of february when one james connor had been discovered to be erecting a distillery at the falls of the willamette it happened however that an occasion for the exercise of executive power had occurred before the election of the executive committee and now what was to be done it was a case too which required absolute power for there was no law on the subject of distilleries after some deliberation it was decided to allow the indian agent temporary power and several letters were addressed to him informing him of the calamity which threatened the community at the falls now we believe that if there is anything which calls your attention in your official capacity or anything in which you would be most cordially supported by the good sense and prompt action of the better part of the community it is the present case we do not wish to dictate but we hope for the best begging pardon for intrusions so read the closing paragraph of one of the letters perhaps this humble petition touched the doctor's heart perhaps he saw in the circumstance a possible means of acquiring influence at all events he hastened to the falls a distance of fifty miles and entered at once upon the discharge of the executive duties thus thrust upon him in the hour of danger calling upon meek who had entered upon his duties as sheriff the previous summer he gave him his orders writ in hand meek proceeded to the distillery frightened the poor sinner into quiet submission with a display of his mountain manners made a bugle of the worm and blew it to announce to the doctor his complete success after which he tumbled the distillery apparatus into the river and retired connor was put under three hundred dollars bonds and so the case ended but there were other occasions on which the doctor's authority was put in requisition it happened that a vessel from australia had been in the river and left one madame cooper who was said to have brought with her a barrel of whisky her cabin stood on the east bank of the willamette opposite the present city of portland not thinking it necessary to send the sheriff to deal with a woman the doctor went in person accompanied by a couple of men entering the cabin the doctor remarked blandly you have a barrel of whisky i believe not knowing but her visitor's intention was to purchase and not having previously resided in a strictly temperance community madame cooper replied frankly that she had and pointed to the barrel in question the doctor then stepped forward and placing his foot on it said in the name of the united states i levy execution on it at this unexpected declaration the english woman stared wildly one moment then recovering herself quickly seized the poker from the chimney corner and raising it over the doctor's head exclaimed in the name of great britain ireland and scotland i levy execution on you but when the stick descended the doctor was not there he had backed out at the cabin door nor did he afterwards attempt to interfere with the subject of the crown of great britain on the following day however the story having got afloat at the falls meek and a young man highly esteemed at the mission by the name of le breton set out to pay their respects to madame cooper upon entering the cabin the two callers cast their eyes about until they rested on the whisky barrel have you come to levy on my whisky inquired the now suspicious madam yes said meek i have come to levy on it but as i am not quite so high an authority as dr white i don't intend to levy on the whole of it at once i think about a quart of it will do me 
comprehending by the twinkle in meek's eye that she had now a customer more to her mind madame cooper made haste to set before her visitors a bottle and tin cup upon which invitation they proceeded to levy frequently upon the contents of the bottle and we fear that the length of time spent there and the amount of whisky drank must have strongly reminded meek of past rendezvous times in the mountains nor can we doubt that he entertained la breton and madame cooper with many reminiscences of those times however that may be this was not the last visit of meek to madame cooper's nor his last levy on her whisky shortly after his election as sheriff he had been called upon to serve a writ upon a desperate character for an attempt to kill many persons however fearing the result of trying to enforce the law upon desperadoes in the then defenceless condition of the colony advised him to wait for the immigration to come in before attempting the arrest but meek preferred to do his duty then and went with the writ to arrest him the man resisted making an attack on the sheriff with a carpenter's axe but meek coolly presented a pistol assuring the culprit of the uselessness of such demonstrations and soon brought him to terms of compliance such coolness united with a fine physique and a mountain man's reputation for reckless courage made it very desirable that meek should continue to hold the office of sheriff during that stage of the colony's development End of chapter twenty six chapter twenty seven of eleven years in the rocky mountains and a life on the frontier by francis a victor this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty seven eighteen forty four as has before been mentioned the indians of the willamette valley were by no means so formidable as those of the upper country yet considering their numbers and the condition of the settlers they were quite formidable enough to occasion considerable alarm when any one of them or any number of them betrayed the savage passions by which they were temporarily overcome considerable excitement had prevailed among the more scattered settlers ever since the reports of the disaffection among the upcountry tribes had reached them and dr white had been importuned to throw up a strong fortification in the most central part of the colony and to procure arms for their defence at the expense of the united states this excitement had somewhat subsided when an event occurred which for a time renewed it a house was plundered and some horses stolen from the neighbourhood of the falls an indian from the dalles named cockstock was at the bottom of the mischief and had been committing or instigating others to commit depredations upon the settlers for a year previous because he had been as he fancied badly treated in a matter between himself and a negro in the colony in which the latter had taken an unfair advantage of him in a bargain to crown his injuries dr white had caused a relative of his to be flogged by the dalles chief for entering the house of the methodist missionary at that place and tying him with the purpose of flogging him it was a poor law he thought that would not work both ways in revenge for this insult cockstock came to the doctor's house in the willamette threatening to shoot him at sight but not finding him at home contented himself for that time by smashing all the windows in the dwelling and office of the doctor and nearly frightening to death a young man on the premises when on the doctor's return in the evening the extent of the outrage became known a party set out in pursuit of cockstock and his band but failed to overtake them and the settlers remained in ignorance concerning the identity of the marauders about a month later however a party of klamath and Malala indians from the south of oregon numbering fifteen came riding into the settlement armed and painted in true indian war style they made their way to the lodge of a calipuya chief in the neighborhood the calipuyas being the indians native to the valley dr white fearing these mischievous visitors might infect the mind of the calipuya chief sent a message to him to bring his friends to call upon him in the morning as he had something good to say to them this they did when dr white explained the laws of the nez perces to them and told them how much it would be to their advantage to adopt such laws he gave the calipuya chief a fine fat ox to feast his friends with well knowing that an indian's humour depends much on the state of his stomach 
whether shrunken or distended after the feast there was some more talk about the laws in the midst of which the indian cockstock made his appearance armed and sullen in his demeanour but as dr white did not know him for the perpetrator of the outrage on his premises he took no notice of him more than of the others the molallas and klamaths finally agreed to receive the laws departing in high good humour singing and shouting so little may one know of the savage heart from the savage professions some of these indians were boiling over with secret wrath at the weakness of their brethren in consenting to laws of the agent's dictation and while they were crossing a stream I fell upon and massacred them without mercy cockstock taking an active part in the murder the whites were naturally much excited by the villainous and horrible affray and were for taking and hanging the murderers the agent however was more cautious and learning that there had been feuds among these indians long unsettled decided not to interfere in february eighteen forty four fresh outrages on settlers having been committed so that some were leaving their claims and coming to stop at the falls through fear dr white was petitioned to take the case in hand he accordingly raised a party of ten men who had nearly all suffered some loss or outrage at cockstock's hands and set out in search of him but did not succeed in finding him his next step was to offer a reward of a hundred dollars for his arrest meaning to send him to the upper country to be tried and punished by the cayuses and nez Perces, the doctor prudently desiring to have them bear the odium and suffer the punishment should any follow of executing justice on the indian desperado not so had the fates ordained about a week after the reward was offered cockstock came riding into the settlement at the falls at midday accompanied by five other indians all well armed and frightfully painted going from house to house on their horses they exhibited their pistols and by look and gesture seemed to defy the settlers who however kept quiet through prudential motives not succeeding in provoking the whites to commence the fray cockstock finally retired to an indian village on the other side of the river where he labored to get up an insurrection and procure the burning of the settlement houses meantime the people at the falls were thoroughly alarmed and bent upon the capture of this desperate savage when after an absence of a few hours they saw him recrossing the river with his party a crowd of persons ran down to the landing some with offers of large reward to any person who would attempt to take him while others more courageous were determined upon earning it no definite plan of capture or concert of action was decided on but all was confusion and doubt in this frame of mind a collision was sure to take place both the whites and indians firing at the moment of landing mr le breton the young man mentioned in the previous chapter after firing ineffectually rushed unarmed upon cockstock whose pistol was also empty but who still had his knife in the struggle both fell to the ground when a mulatto man who had wrongs of his own to avenge ran up and struck cockstock a blow on the head with the butt of his gun which dispatched him at once thus the colony was rid of a scourge yet not without loss which counterbalanced the gain young le breton besides having his arm shattered by a ball was wounded by a poisoned arrow which occasioned his death and mr rogers another esteemed citizen died from the same cause while a third was seriously injured by a slight wound from a poisoned arrow as for the five friends of cockstock they escaped to the bluffs overlooking the settlement and commenced firing down upon the people but firearms were mustered sufficient to dislodge them and thus the affair ended except that the agent had some trouble to settle it with the dalles indians who came down in a body to demand payment for the loss of their brother after much talk and explanation a present to the widow of the dead indian was made to smooth over the difficulty 
meek who at the time of the collision was rafting timber for dr mclaughlin's mill at the falls as might have been expected was appealed to in the melee by citizens who knew less about indian fighting a prominent citizen and merchant who probably seldom spoke of him as mr meek came running to him in great affright mr meek mr meek mr meek i want to send my wife down to vancouver can you assist me do you think the indians will take the town it pears like half a dozen injuns might do it retorted meek going on with his work what do you think we had better do mr meek what do you advise i think you'd better run in all difficulties between the indians and settlers meek usually refrained from taking sides especially from taking sides against the indians for indian slayer as he had once been when a ranger of the mountains he had too much compassion for the poor wretches in the willamette valley as well as too much knowledge of the savage nature to like to make unnecessary war upon them had he been sent to take cockstock very probably he would have done it with little uproar for he had sufficient influence among the calipuyas to have enlisted them in the undertaking but this was the agent's business and he let him manage it for meek and the doctor were not in love with one another one was solemnly audacious the other mischievously so of the latter sort of audacity here is an example meek wanted a horse to ride out to the plains where his family were and not knowing how else to obtain it helped himself to one belonging to dr white which presumption greatly incensed the doctor and caused him to threaten various punishments hanging among the rest but the indians overhearing him replied akenika komtax you dare not you no put rope round meek's neck he tai chief no hang him upon which the doctor thought better of it and having vented his solemn audacity received smiling audacity with apparent good humour when he came to restore the borrowed horse as our friend meek was sure to be found wherever there was anything novel or exciting transpiring so he was sure to fall in with visitors of distinguished character and as ready to answer their questions as they were to ask them the conversation chanced one day to run upon the changes that had taken place in the country since the earliest settlement by the americans and meek who felt an honest pride in them was expatiating at some length to the ill-concealed amusement of two young officers who probably saw nothing to admire in the rude improvements of the oregon pioneers mr meek said one of them if you have been so long in the country and have witnessed such wonderful transformations doubtless you may have observed equally great ones in nature in the rivers and mountains for instance meek gave a lightning glance at the speaker who had so mistaken his respondent i reckon i have said he slowly then waving his hand gracefully toward the majestic mount hood towering thousands of feet above the summit of the cascade range and white with everlasting snows when i came to this country mount hood was a hole in the ground it is hardly necessary to say that the conversation terminated abruptly amid the universal cachinations of the bystanders notwithstanding the slighting views of her british majesty's naval officers the young colony was making rapid strides the population had been increased nearly eight hundred by the immigration of eighteen forty four so that now it numbered nearly two thousand grain had been raised in considerable quantities cattle and hogs had multiplied and the farmers were in the best of spirits even our hero who hated farm labor began to entertain faith in the resources of his land claim to make him rich such was the promising condition of the colony in the summer of eighteen forty five much of the real prosperity of the settlers was due to the determination of the majority to exclude ardent spirits and all intoxicating drinks from the country so well had they succeeded that a gentleman writing of the colony at that time says 
I attended the last term of the circuit courts in most of the counties, and I found great respect shown to judicial authority everywhere, nor did I see a single drunken juryman, nor witness, nor spectator, so much industry, good order, and sobriety I have never seen in any community. While this was the rule, there were exceptions to it. During the spring term of the circuit court, Judge Nesmith being on the bench, a prisoner was arraigned before him for assault with intent to kill. The witness for the prosecution was called and was proceeding to give evidence when, at some statement of his, the prisoner vociferated that he was a dashed liar and, quickly stripping off his coat, demanded a chance to fight it out with the witness. Judge Nesmith called for the interference of Meek, who had been made marshal, but just at that moment he was not to be found. Coming into the room a moment later, Meek saw the judge down from his bench holding the prisoner by the collar. "'You can imagine,' says Meek, "'the bustle in court. But the judge had the best of it. He fined the rascal and made him pay it on the spot, while I just stood back to see his honor handle him. That was fun for me.' The autumn of 1845 was marked less by striking events than by the energy which the people exhibited in improving the colony by laying out roads and town sites. Already quite a number of towns were located, in which the various branches of business were beginning to develop themselves. Oregon City was the most populous and important, but Salem, Shampooey, and Portland were known as towns, and other settlements were growing up on the Tualatin Plains and to the south of them in the fertile valleys of the numerous tributaries to the Willamette. Portland was settled in this year and received its name from the game of Heads You Lose, Tails I Win, by which its joint owners agreed to determine it one of them being a Maine man, was for giving it the name which it now bears, the other partner being in favor of Boston because he was a Massachusetts man. It was therefore agreed between them that a copper cent should be tossed to decide the question of the christening, which being done, Heads and Portland won. The early days of that city were not always safe and pleasant, any more than those of its older rivals and the few inhabitants frequently were much annoyed by the raids they were subject to from the now thoroughly vagabondized Indians. On one occasion, while yet the population was small, they were very much annoyed by the visit of eight or ten lodges of Indians who had somewhere obtained liquor enough to get drunk on, and were enjoying a debauch in that spirit of total abandon which distinguishes the Indian carousal. Their performances at length alarmed the people, yet no one could be found who could put an end to them. In this dilemma, the marshal came riding into town, splendidly mounted on a horse that would turn at the least touch of the rein. The countenances of the anxious Portlanders brightened. One of the town proprietors eagerly besought him to settle those Indians. "'Very well,' answered Meek. "'I reckon it won't take me long.' Mounting his horse, after first securing a rawhide rope, he charged the Indian lodges, rope in hand, laying it on with force, the bare shoulders of the Indians offering good backgrounds for the pictures which he was rapidly executing. Not one made any resistance, for they had a wholesome fear of Tai Meek. In twenty minutes, not an Indian, man or woman, was left in Portland some jumped into the river and swam to the opposite side and some fled to the thick woods and hid themselves the next morning early the women cautiously returned and carried away their property but the men avoided being seen again by the marshal who punished drunkenness so severely readers query was it meek or the marshal who so strongly disapproved of spreeing answer it was the marshal the emigration to oregon this year much exceeded that of any previous year and there was the usual amount of poverty sickness and suffering of every sort among the fresh arrivals indeed the larger the trains the greater the amount of suffering generally since the grass was more likely to be exhausted and more hindrances of every kind were likely to occur 
in any case a march of several months through an unsettled country was sure to leave the traveller in a most forlorn and exhausted condition every way this was the situation of thousands of people who reached the dalles in the autumn of eighteen forty five food was very scarce among them and the difficulties to encounter before reaching the willamette just as great as those of the two previous years as usual the hudson's bay company came to the assistance of the immigrants furnishing a passage down the river in their boats the sick and the women and children being taken first among the crowd of people encamped at the dalles was a mr rector since well known in oregon and california like many others he was destitute of provisions his supplies having given out neither had he any money in this extremity he did that which was very disagreeable to him as one of the prejudiced american citizens who were instructed beforehand to hate and suspect the hudson's bay company he applied to the company's agent at the dalles for some potatoes and flour confessing his present inability to pay with much shame and reluctance do not apologize sir said the agent kindly take what you need there is no occasion to starve while our supplies hold out mr r found his prejudices in danger of melting away under such treatment and not liking to receive bounty a second time he resolved to undertake the crossing of the cascade mountains while the more feeble of the immigrants were being boated down the columbia a few others who were in good health decided to accompany him they succeeded in getting their wagons forty miles beyond the dalles but there they could move no further in this dilemma after consultation mr rector and mr barlow agreed to go ahead and look out a wagon road taking with them two days provisions they started on in the direction of oregon city but they found road hunting in the cascade mountains an experience unlike any they had ever had not only had they to contend with the usual obstacles of precipices ravines mountain torrents and weary stretches of ascent and descent but they found the forest standing so thickly that it would have been impossible to have passed between the trees with their wagons had the ground been clear of fallen timber and undergrowth on the contrary these latter obstacles were the greatest of all so thickly were the trunks of fallen trees crossed and recrossed everywhere and so dense the growth of bushes in amongst them that it was with difficulty they could force their way on foot it soon became apparent to the road hunters that two days rations would not suffice for what work they had before them at the first camp it was agreed to live upon half rations the next day and to divide and subdivide their food each day only eating half of what was left from the day before so that there would always still remain a morsel in case of dire extremity but the toil of getting through the woods and over the mountains proved excessive and that together with insufficient food had in the course of two or three days reduced the strength of mr barlow so that it was with great effort only that he could keep up with his younger and more robust companion stumbling and falling at every few steps and frequently hurting himself considerably so wolfish and cruel is the nature of men under trying conditions that instead of feeling pity for his weaker and less fortunate companion mr rector became impatient blaming him for causing delays and often requiring assistance to render their situation still more trying rain began to fall heavily which with the cold air of the mountains soon benumbed their exhausted frames fearing that they should go to sleep so cold and famished they might never be able to rise again on the fourth or fifth evening they resolved to kindle a fire if by any means they could do so dry and broken wood they had plenty enough but for the rain which was drenching everything neither matches nor flint had they however in any case 
the night was setting in black with darkness the wind swayed the giant firs overhead and then they heard the thunder of a falling monarch of the forest unpleasantly near searching among the bushes and under fallen timber for some dry leaves and sticks mr rector took a bundle of them to the most sheltered spot he could find and set himself to work to coax a spark of fire out of two pieces of dry wood which he had split for that purpose it was a long and weary while before success was attained by vigorous rubbing together of the dry wood but it was attained at last and the stiffening limbs of the road hunters were warmed by a blazing campfire the following day the food being now reduced to a crumb for each the explorers weak and dejected toiled on in silence mr rector always in advance on chancing to look back at his companion he observed him to be brushing away a tear what now old man asked mr r with most unchristian harshness what would you do with me rector should i fall and break a leg or become in any way disabled inquired mr barlow nervously do with you i would eat you growled mr rector stalking on again as no more was said for some time mr r s conscience rather misgave him that he treated his friend unfeelingly then he stole a look back at him and beheld the wan face bathed in tears come come barlow said he more kindly don't take affairs so much to heart you will not break a leg and i should not eat you if you did for you haven't any flesh on you to eat nevertheless rector i want you to promise me that in case i should fall and disable myself so that i cannot get on you will not leave me here to die alone but will kill me with your axe instead nonsense barlow you are weak and nervous but you are not going to be disabled nor eaten nor killed keep up man we shall reach oregon city yet so onward but ever more slowly and painfully toiled again the pioneers the wonder being that mr barlow's fears were not realized for the clambering and descending gave him many a tumble the tumbles becoming more frequent as his strength declined towards evening of this day as they came to the precipitous bank of a mountain stream which was flowing in the direction they wished to go suddenly there came to their ears a sound of more than celestial melody the tinkling of bells lowing of cattle the voice of men hallowing to the herds they had struck the cattle trail which they had first diverged from in the hope of finding a road passable to wagons in the overwhelming revulsion of feeling which seized them neither were able for some moments to command their voices to call for assistance that night they camped with the herdsmen and supped in such plenty as an immigrant camp afforded such were the sufferings of two individuals out of a great crowd of sufferers some afflicted in one way and some in another that people who endured so much to reach their el dorado should be the most locally patriotic people in the world is not singular mr barlow lived to construct a wagon road over the cascades for the use of subsequent immigrations end of chapter twenty seven chapter twenty eight of eleven years in the rocky mountains and a life on the frontier by francis a victor this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty eight early in eighteen forty six meek resigned his office of marshal of the colony owing to the difficulty of collecting taxes for in a thinly inhabited country where wheat was a legal tender at sixty cents per bushel it was rather a burdensome occupation to collect in so ponderous a currency and one in which the collector required a granary more than a pocket-book besides meek had outgrown the marshalship and aspired to become a legislator at the next june election he had always discharged his duty with promptitude and rectitude while sheriff 
and to his known courage might be attributed in many instances the ready compliance with law which was remarkable in so new and peculiar an organization as that of the oregon colony the people had desired not to be taxed at first and for a year or more the government was sustained by a fund raised by subscription when at last it was deemed best to make collections by law the canadians objected to taxation to support an american government while they were still subjects of great britain but ultimately yielded the point by the advice of dr mclaughlin but it was not always the canadians who objected to being taxed as the following anecdote will show dr mclaughlin was one day seated in his office in conversation with some of his american friends when the tall form of the sheriff darkened the doorway i have come to tax you doctor said meek in his blandest manner and with a merry twinkle half suppressed in his black eyes to tax to tax me mr joe i was not aware i i really was not aware i believed i had paid my tax mr joe stammered the doctor somewhat annoyed at the prospect of some fresh demand thar's an old ox out in my neighborhood doctor and he is said to belong to you thar is a tax of twenty-five cents on him i do not understand you mr joe i have no cattle out in your neighborhood i couldn't say how that may be doctor all i do know about it is just this i went to old g dashes to collect the tax on his stock and he's got a powerful lot of cattle and while we are accountin em over he left out that old ox and said it belonged to you oh oh i see mr joe yes yes i see so it was mr g cried the doctor getting very red in the face i do remember now since you bring it to my mind that i lent mr g that steer six years ago here are the twenty-five cents mr joe the sheriff took his money and went away laughing while the doctor's american friends looked quite as much annoyed as the doctor himself over the meanness of some of their countrymen the year of eighteen forty six was one of the most exciting in the political history of oregon president polk had at last given the notice required by the joint occupation treaty that the oregon boundary question must be settled agreeably to the promise which dr mclaughlin had received from the british admiral h b m sloop of war modeste had arrived in the columbia river in the month of october eighteen forty five and had wintered there much as the doctor had wished for protection from possible outbreaks he yet felt that the presence of a british man-of-war in the columbia and another one in the puget sound was offensive to the colonists he set himself to cover up as carefully as possible the disagreeable features of the british lion by endeavouring to establish social intercourse between the officers of the modeste and the ladies and gentlemen of the colony and his endeavours were productive of a partial success during the summer however the united states schooner shark appeared in the columbia thus restoring the balance of power for the relief of national jealousy after remaining for some weeks the shark took her departure but was wrecked on the bar at the mouth of the river according to a prophecy of meeks who had a grudge against her commander lieutenant hoison for spoiling the sport he was having in company with one of her officers while hoison was absent at the cascades it appears that lieutenant shank was hospitably inclined and that on receiving a visit from the hero of many bear fights who proved to be congenial on the subject of good liquors he treated both meek and himself so freely as to render discretion a foreign power to either of them varied and brilliant were the exploits performed by these jolly companions during the continuance of the spree and still more brilliant were those they talked of performing even the taking of the modeste which was lying a little way off in front of vancouver fortunately for the good of all concerned shank contented himself with firing a salute as meek was going over the side of the ship on leaving but for this misdemeanor he was put under arrest by howison on his return from the cascades an indignity which meek resented for the prisoner by assuring lieutenant howison that he would lose his vessel before he got out of the river and lose her he did shank was released after the vessel struck escaping with the other officers and crew by means of small boats very few articles were saved from the wreck 
but among those few was the stand of colors which lieutenant howison subsequently presented to governor abernathy for the colony there sinks the sun like cavalier of old servant of crafty spain he flaunts his banner barred with blood and gold wide o'er the western main a thousand spearheads glint beyond the trees in columns bright and long while kindling fancy hears upon the breeze the swell of shout and song and yet not here spain's gay adventurous host dipped sword or planted cross the treasures guarded by this rock-bound coast counted them gain nor loss the blue columbia sired by the eternal hills and wedded with the sea o'er golden sands tithes from a thousand rills boiled in lone majesty through deep ravine through burning barren plain through wild and rocky strait through forest dark and mountain rent in twain toward the sunset gate while curious eyes keen with the lust of gold caught not the informing gleam these mighty breakers age on age have rolled to meet this mighty stream age after age these noble hills have kept the same majestic lines age after age the horizon's edge been swept by fringe of pointed pines summers and winters circling came and went bringing no change of scene unresting and unhasting and unspent dwelt nature here serene till god's own time to plant of freedom's seed in this selected soil denied forever unto blood and greed but blessed to honest toil there sinks the sun gay cavalier no more his banners trail the sea and all his legions shining on the shore fade into mystery the swelling tide laps on the shingly beach like any starving thing and hungry breakers white with wrath upreach in a vain clamoring the shadows fall just level with mine eye sweet hesper stands and shines and shines beneath an arc of golden sky pinked round with pointed pines o oh, noble scene all breadth deep tone and power suggesting glorious themes shaming the idler who would fill the hour with unsubstantial dreams be mine the dreams prophetic shadowing forth the things that yet shall be when through this gate the treasures of the north flow outward to the sea end of chapter twenty eight chapter twenty nine of eleven years in the rocky mountains and a life on the frontier by francis a victor this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty nine the author of the following poem was not either a dull or an unobservant writer and we insert his verses as a comical bit of natural history belonging peculiarly to oregon adventures of a columbia salmon what is yon object which attracts the eye of the observing traveller who ascends columbia's waters when the summer sky in one soft tint calm nature's clothing blends as glittering in the sunbeams down it floats till some vile vulture on its carcass gloats tis a poor salmon which a short time past with thousands of her finny sisters came by instinct taught to seek and find at last the place that gave her birth there to remain till nature's offices had been discharged and fry from out the ova had emerged her winter spent amongst the sheltered bays of the salt sea where numerous fish of prey with appetite keen the number of her days would soon have put an end to could but they have caught her but as they could not she spring having come resolved to quit the sea and moving with the shoal along the coast at length she reached the outlet of her native river there tarried for a little to recruit her strength so tried of late by cold and stormy weather sporting in playful gambols over the banks and sands chasing the tiny fish frequenting there in bands but ah how little thought this simple fish the toils and perils she had yet to suffer 
the chance she ran of serving as a dish for hungry white men or for indians supper of enemies in which the stream abounded when lo she's by a fisher's net surrounded partly conscious of her approaching end she darts with meteoric swiftness to and fro striking the frail meshes within which she's penned which bid defiance to her stoutest blow to smaller compass by degrees the snare is drawn when with a leap she clears it and is gone once more at large with her companions now become more cautious from her late escape she keeps in deeper water and thinks how foolish she was to get in such a scrape as mounting further up the stream she vies with other fish in catching gnats and flies and as she on her way did thus enjoy life's fleeting moments there arose a panic amongst the stragglers who in haste deploy around their elder leaders quick as magic while she unconscious of the untimely rout was by a hungry otter singled out vigorous was the chase on the marked victim shot through the clear water while in close pursuit followed her amphibious foe who scarce had got near enough to grasp her when with turns acute and leaps and revolutions she so tried the otter he gave up the hunt with merely having bit her scarce had she recovered from her weakness when an ancient eagle of the bald-head kind winged his dreary way towards some lone glen where was her nest with four plump eaglets lined espied the fish which he judged quite a treat and just the morsel for his little ones to eat and sailing in spiral circles o'er the spot where lay his prey then hovering for a time to take his wary aim he stooped and caught his booty which he carried to a lofty pine upon whose topmost branches he first adjusted his awkward load ere with his claws he crushed it ill is the wind that blows no person good so said the adage and as luck would have it a huge gray eagle out in search of food who just had wet his hunger with a rabbit attacked the other and the pair together in deadly combat fell into the river our friend of course made off when she'd done falling some sixty yards and well indeed she might for ne'er perhaps a fish got such a mauling since adam's time or went up such a height into the air and came down helter-skelter as did this poor production of a melter all these with many other dangers she survived too manifold in this short space to mention so we'll suppose her to have now arrived safe at the falls without much more detention than one could look for where so many liked her company and so many indians spiked her and here a mighty barrier stops her way the tranquil water finding in its course itself beset with rising rocks which lay as though they said retire ye to your source bursts with indignant fury from its bondage now rushes in foaming torrents to the chasm below the persevering fish then at the foot arrives laboring with redoubled vigor mid the surging tide and finding by her strength she vainly strives to overcome the flood though o'er and o'er she tried her tail takes in her mouth and bending like a bow that's to full compass drawn aloft herself doth throw and spinning in the air as would a silver wand that's bended end to end and upwards cast headlong she falls amid the showering waters and gasping for breath against the rocks is dashed again again she vaults again she tries and in one last and feeble effort dies there was in oregon city a literary society called the falls association some of whose effusions were occasionally sent to the spectator and this may have been one of them at all events it is plain that with balls theatres literary societies and politics the colony was not afflicted with dullness in the winter of eighteen forty six but the history of the emigration this year afforded perhaps more material for talk than any one other subject the condition in which the emigrants arrived was one of great distress 
a new road into the valley had been that season explored at great labor and expense by a company of gentlemen who had in view the aim to lessen the perils usually encountered in descending the columbia they believed that a better pass might be discovered through the cascade range to the south than that which had been found around the base of mount hood and one which should bring the immigrants in at the upper end of the valley thus saving them considerable travel and loss of time at a season of the year when the weather was apt to be unsettled with this design a party had set out to explore the cascades to the south quite early in the spring but failing in their undertaking had returned another company was then immediately formed headed by a prominent member of society and the legislature this company followed the old Hudson's Bay Company's trail, crossing all those ranges of mountains perpendicular to the coast, which form a triple wall between Oregon and California, until they came out into the valley of the Humboldt, whence they proceeded along a nearly level but chiefly barren country to Fort Hall on the Snake River. The route was found to be practicable, although there was a scarcity of grass and water along a portion of it but as the explorers had with great difficulty found out and marked all the best camping grounds and encountered first for themselves all the dangers of a hitherto unexplored region most of which they believed they had overcome they felt no hesitation in recommending the new road to the immigrants whom they met at fort hall being aware of the hardships which the immigrants of the previous years had undergone on the snake river plains at the crossing of snake river the john day and deschutes rivers and the passage of the columbia the travelers gladly accepted the tidings of a safer route to the willamette a portion of the immigration had already gone on by the road to the dalles the remainder turned off by the southern route of those who took the new route a part were destined for california all however after passing through the sage deserts committed the error of stopping to recruit their cattle and horses in the fresh green valleys among the foothills of the mountains it did not occur to them that they were wasting precious time in this way but to this indulgence was owing an incredible amount of suffering the California-bound travelers encountered the season of snow on the Sierras, and such horrors are recorded of their sufferings as it is seldom the task of ears to hear or pen to record. Snow-bound, without food, those who died of starvation were consumed by the living. Even children were eaten by their once fond parents, with an indifference horrible to think on so does the mind become degraded by great physical suffering the oregon immigrants had not to cross the lofty sierras but they still found mountains before them which in the dry season would have been formidable enough instead however of the dry weather continuing very heavy rains set in the streams became swollen the mountain sides heavy and slippery with the wet earth where the road led through canyons men and women were sometimes forced to stem a torrent breast high and cold enough to chill the life in their veins the cattle gave out the wagons broke down provisions became exhausted and a few persons perished while all were in the direst straits the first who got through into the valley sent relief to those behind but it was weeks before the last of the worn weary and now impoverished travelers escaped from the horrors of the mountains in which they were so hopelessly entangled and where most of their worldly goods were left to rot the oregon legislature met as usual to hold its winter session though the people hoped and expected it would be for the last time under the provisional government there were only two mountain men in the house at this session meek and newell in the suspense under which they for the present remained there was nothing to do but to go on in the path of duty as they had heretofore done keeping up their present form of government until it was supplanted by a better one 
so passed the summer until the return of the glorious fourth which being the first national anniversary occurring since the news of the treaty had reached the colony was celebrated with proper enthusiasm it chanced that an american ship the brutus captain adams from boston was lying in the willamette and that a general invitation had been given to the celebrationists to visit the ship during the day a party of fifty or sixty including meek and some of his mountain associates had made their calculations to go on board at the same time and were in fact already alongside in boats when captain adams singled out a boatload of people belonging to the mission clique and inviting them to come on board ordered all the others off this was an insult too great to be borne by mountain men who resented it not only for themselves but for the people's party of americans to which they naturally belonged their blood was up and without stopping to deliberate meek and newell hurried off to fetch the twelve pounder that had a few hours before served to thunder forth the rejoicings of a free people but with which they now proposed to proclaim their indignation as free men heinously insulted the little twelve-pound cannon was loaded with rock and got into range with the offending ship and there is little doubt that captain adams would have suffered loss at the hands of the incensed multitude but for the timely interference of dr mclaughlin on being informed of the warlike intentions of meek and his associates the good doctor came running to the rescue his white hair flowing back from his noble face with the hurry of his movements oh oh mr joe mr joe you must not do this indeed you must not do this foolish thing come now come away you will injure your country mr joe how can you expect that ships will come here if they are fired on come away come away and meek ever full of waggishness even in his wrath replied doctor it is not that i love the brutus less but my dignity more oh shakespeare mr joe but come with me come with me and so the good doctor half in authority half in kindness persuaded the resentful colonists to pass by the favoritism of the boston captain meek was re-elected to the legislature this summer and swam out to a vessel lying down at the mouth of the willamette to get liquor to treat his constituents from which circumstance it may be inferred that while oregon was remarkable for temperance there were occasions on which conviviality was deemed justifiable by a portion of her people thus passed the summer the autumn brought news of a large immigration en route for the new territory but it brought no news of good import from congress on the contrary the bill providing for a territorial government for oregon had failed because the organic laws of that territory excluded slavery forever from the country the history of its failure is a part and parcel of the record of the long hard struggle of the south to extend slavery into the united states territories justly dissatisfied but not inconsolable the colony now that hope was extinguished for another season returned to its own affairs the immigration which had arrived early this year amounted to between four and five thousand an unfortunate affray between the immigrants and the indians at the dalles had frightened away from that station the reverend father waller and dr whitman of the wailatpu mission had purchased the station for the presbyterian mission and placed a nephew of his in charge although true to their original bad character the dalles indians had frequently committed theft upon the passing immigration this was the first difficulty resulting in loss of life which had taken place this quarrel arose out of some thefts committed by the indians and the unwise advice of mr waller in telling the immigrants to retaliate by taking some of the indian horses an indian can see the justice of taking toll from every traveller passing through his country but he cannot see the justice of being robbed in return and mr waller had been long enough among them to have known this finding that it must continue yet a little longer to look after its own government and welfare the colony had settled back into its wonted pursuits 
the legislature had convened for its winter session and had hardly elected its officers and read the usual message of the governor before there came another which fell upon their ears like a thunderbolt governor abernathy had sent in the following letter written at vancouver the day before fort vancouver december seventh eighteen forty seven george abernathy esq sir having received intelligence last night by special express from walla walla of the destruction of the missionary settlement at wailatpu by the cayuse indians of that place we hasten to communicate the particulars of that dreadful event one of the most atrocious which darkens the annals of indian crime our lamented friend dr whitman his amiable and accomplished lady with nine other persons have fallen victims to the fury of these remorseless savages who appear to have been instigated to this appalling crime by a horrible suspicion which had taken possession of their superstitious minds in consequence of the number of deaths from dysentery and measles that dr whitman was silently working the destruction of their tribe by administering poisonous drugs under the semblance of salutary medicines with a goodness of heart and benevolence truly his own dr whitman had been laboring incessantly since the appearance of the measles and dysentery among his indian converts to relieve their sufferings and such has been the reward of his generous labors a copy of mr macbean's letter herewith transmitted will give you all the particulars known to us of this indescribably painful event mr ogden with a strong party will leave this place as soon as possible for walla walla to endeavor to prevent further evil and we beg to suggest to you the propriety of taking instant measures for the protection of the rev mr spaulding who for the sake of his family ought to abandon the clearwater mission without delay and retire to a place of safety as he cannot remain at that isolated station without imminent risk in the present excited and irritable state of the indian population i have the honor to be sir your most obedient servant james douglas End of chapter twenty nine Chapter Thirty of Eleven Years in the Rocky Mountains and a Life on the Frontier by Francis A. Victor. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Thirty, eighteen forty two to seven. Doubtless the reader remembers the disquiet felt and expressed by the Indians in the upper country in the year eighteen forty two. For the time they had been quieted by presents, by the advice of the Hudson's Bay Company and by the agent's promise that in good time the united states would send them blankets guns ammunition food farming implements and teachers to show them how to live like whites in the meantime five years having passed these promises had not been kept five times a large number of whites with their children their cattle and wagons had passed through their country and gone down into the willamette valley to settle now they had learned that the united states claimed the willamette valley yet they had never heard that the indians of that country had received any pay for it they had accepted the religion of the whites believing it would do them good but now they were doubtful had they not accepted laws from the united states agent and had not their people been punished for acts which their ancestors and themselves had always before committed at will none of these innovations seemed to do them any good they were disappointed but the whites or bostons meaning americans were coming more and more every year so that by and by there would be all bostons and no indians once they had trusted in the words of the americans but now they knew how worthless were their promises the americans had done them much harm years before had not one of the missionaries suffered several of their people and the son of one of their chiefs to be slain in his company yet himself escaped had not the son of another chief who had gone to california to buy cattle been killed by a party of americans for no fault of his own 
their chief's son was killed the cattle robbed from his party after having been paid for and his friends obliged to return poor and in grief to be sure dr white had given them some drafts to be used in obtaining cattle from the immigration as a compensation for their losses in california but they could not make them available and those who wanted cattle had to go down to the willamette for them in short could the indians have thought of an american epithet to apply to americans it would have been that expressive word humbug what they felt and what they thought was that they had been cheated they feared greater frauds in the future and they were secretly resolved not to submit to them so far as regarded the missionaries dr whitman and his associates they were divided yet as so many looked on the doctor as an agent in promoting the settlement of the country with whites it was thought best to drive him from the country together with all the missionaries several years before dr whitman had known that the indians were displeased with his settlement among them they had told him of it they had treated him with violence they had attempted to outrage his wife had burned his property and had more recently several times warned him to leave their country or they should kill him not that all were angry at him alike or that any were personally very ill disposed towards him everything that a man could do to instruct and elevate these savage people he had done to the best of his ability together with his wife and assistants but he had not been able or perhaps had not attempted to conceal the fact that he looked upon the country as belonging to his people rather than to the natives and it was this fact which was at the bottom of their bad hearts toward the doctor so often had warnings been given which were disregarded by dr whitman that his friends both at vancouver and in the settlements had long felt great uneasiness and often besought him to remove to the willamette valley but although dr whitman sometimes was half persuaded to give up the mission upon the representations of others he could not quite bring himself to do so so far as the good conduct of the indians was concerned they had never behaved better than for the last two years there had been less violence less open outrage than formerly and their civilization seemed to be progressing while some few were apparently hopeful converts yet there was ever a whisper in the air dr whitman must die the mission at lapoy was peculiarly successful mrs spalding more than any other of the missionaries had been able to adapt herself to the indian character and to gain their confidence besides the nez perces were a better nation than the cayuses more easily controlled by a good council and it seemed like doing a wrong to abandon the work so long as any good was likely to result from it there were other reasons too why the missions could not be abandoned in haste one of which was the difficulty of disposing of the property this might have been done perhaps to the catholics who were establishing missions throughout the upper country but dr whitman would never have been so false to his own doctrines as to leave the field of his labors to the romish church yet the division of sentiment among the indians with regard to religion since the catholic missionaries had come among them increased the danger of a revolt for in the indian country neither two rival trading companies nor two rival religions can long prosper side by side the savage cannot understand the origin of so many religions he either repudiates all or he takes that which addresses itself to his understanding through the senses in the latter respect the forms of catholicism as adapted to the savage understanding made that religion a dangerous rival to intellectual and idealistic presbyterianism but the more dangerous the rival the greater the firmness with which dr whitman would cling to his duty there were so many causes at work to produce a revolution among the indians that it would be unfair to name any one as the cause the last and immediate provocation was a season of severe sickness among them the disease was measles and was brought in the train of the immigration this fact alone was enough to provoke the worst passions of the savage 
the immigration in itself was a sufficient offence the introduction through them of a pestilence a still weightier one it did not signify that dr whitman had exerted himself night and day to give them relief their peculiar notions about a medicine man made it the doctor's duty to cure the sick or made it the duty of the relatives of the dead and dying to avenge their deaths yet in spite of all and every provocation perhaps the fatal tragedy might have been postponed had it not been for the evil influence of one joe lewis a half-breed who had accompanied the immigration from the vicinity of fort hall this joe lewis with a large party of immigrants had stopped to winter at the mission much against dr whitman's wishes for he feared not having food enough for so many persons finding that he could not prevent them he took some of the men into his employ and among others the stranger half-breed this man was much about the house and affected to relate to the indians conversations which he heard between dr and mrs whitman and mr spaulding who with his little daughter was visiting at wailatpu these conversations related to poisoning the indians in order to get them all out of the way so that the white men could enjoy their country unmolested yet this devil incarnate did not convince his hearers at once of the truth of his statements and it was resolved in the tribe to make a test of dr whitman's medicine three persons were selected to experiment upon two of them already sick and the third quite well whether it was that the medicine was administered in too large quantities or whether an unhappy chance so ordered it all those three persons died surely it is not singular that in the savage mind this circumstance should have been deemed decisive it was then that the decree went forth that not only the doctor and mrs whitman but all the americans at the mission must die on the twenty second of november mr spaulding arrived at wailatpu from his mission one hundred and twenty miles distant with his daughter a child of ten years bringing with him also several horse loads of grain to help feed the immigrants wintering there he found the indians suffering very much dying one two three and sometimes five in a day several of the immigrant families also were sick with measles and the dysentery which followed the disease a child of one of them died the day following mr spaulding's arrival dr whitman's family consisted of himself and wife a young man named rogers who was employed as a teacher and also studying for the ministry two young people a brother and sister named boulet seven orphaned children of one family whose parents had died on the road to oregon in a previous year named sager helen marr the daughter of joe meek another little half-breed girl daughter of bridger the fur trader a half-breed spanish boy whom the doctor had brought up from infancy and two sons of a mr manson of the hudson's bay company besides these there were half a dozen other families at the mission and at the sawmill twenty miles distant five families more in all forty-six persons at wailatpu and fifteen at the mill who were among those who suffered by the attack but there were also about the mission three others joe lewis nicholas finley and joseph stanfield who probably knew what was about to take place and may therefore be reckoned as among the conspirators while mr spaulding was at wailatpu a message came from two walla walla chiefs living on the umatilla river to dr whitman desiring him to visit the sick in their villages and the two friends set out together to attend to the call on the evening of the twenty seventh of november says mr spaulding referring to that time the night was dark and the wind and rain beat furiously upon us but our interview was sweet we little thought it was to be our last with feelings of the deepest emotion we called to mind the fact that eleven years before we crossed this trail before arriving at walla walla the end of our seven months journey from new york we called to mind the high hopes and thrilling interests which had been awakened during the year that followed 
of our successful labors and the constant devotedness of the indians to improvement true we remembered the months of deep solicitude we had occasioned by the increasing menacing demands of the indians for pay for their wood their water their air their lands but much of this had passed away and the cayuses were in a far more encouraging condition than ever before mr spaulding further relates that himself and dr whitman also conversed on the danger which threatened them from the catholic influence we felt he says that the present sickness afforded them a favorable opportunity to excite the indians to drive us from the country and all the movements about us seemed to indicate that this would soon be attempted if not executed such was the suspicion in the minds of the protestants let us hope that it was not so well founded as they believed the two friends arrived late at the lodge of stickus a chief and laid down before a blazing fire to dry their drenched clothing in the morning a good breakfast was prepared for them consisting of beef vegetables and bread all of which showed the improvement of the indians in the art of living the day being sunday was observed with as much decorum as in a white man's house after breakfast dr whitman crossed the river to visit the chiefs who had sent for him namely tanitan five crows and yamhawalis returning about four o'clock in the afternoon saying he had taken tea with the catholic bishop and two priests at their house which belonged to tanitan and that they had promised to visit him in a short time he then departed for the mission feeling uneasy about the sick ones at home mr spaulding remained with the intention of visiting the sick and offering consolation to the dying but he soon discovered that there was a weighty and uncomfortable secret on the mind of his entertainer stickus after much questioning stickus admitted that the thought which troubled him was that the americans had been decreed against by his people more he could not be induced to reveal anxious yet not seriously alarmed for these warnings had been given before many times he retired to his couch of skins on the evening of the twenty ninth being monday not to sleep however for on either side of him an indian woman sat down to chant the death song that frightful lament which announces danger and death on being questioned they would reveal nothing on the following morning mr spaulding could no longer remain in uncertainty but set out for wailatpu as he mounted his horse to depart an indian woman placed her hand on the neck of his horse to arrest him and pretending to be arranging his headgear said in a low voice to the rider beware of the cayuses at the mission now more than ever disturbed by this intimation that it was the mission which was threatened he hurried forward fearing for his daughter and his friends he proceeded without meeting any one until within sight of the lovely walla walla valley almost in sight of the mission itself when suddenly at a wooded spot where the trail passes through a little hollow he beheld two horsemen advancing whom he watched with a fluttering heart longing for and yet dreading the news which the very air seemed whispering the two horsemen proved to be the catholic vicar-general bruyer who with a party of priests and nuns had arrived in the country only a few months previous and his half-breed interpreter both of whom were known to mr spaulding they each drew rein as they approached mr spaulding immediately inquiring what news there are very many sick at the whitman station answered bruyer with evident embarrassment how are dr and mrs whitman asked spaulding anxiously the doctor is ill is dead added the priest reluctantly and mrs whitman gasped spaulding is dead also the indians have killed them my daughter murmured the agonized questioner is safe with the other prisoners answered bruyer and then 
says spalding in speaking of that moment of infinite horror when in his imagination a picture of the massacre of the anguish of his child the suffering of the prisoners of the probable destruction of his own family and mission and his surely impending fate all rose up before him i felt the world all blotted out at once and sat on my horse as rigid as a stone not knowing or feeling anything while this conversation had been going on the half-breed interpreter had kept a sinister watch over the communication and his actions had so suspicious a look that the priest ordered him to ride on ahead when he had obeyed bruyere gave some rapid instructions to spalding not to go near the mission where he could do no good but would be certainly murdered but to fly to hide himself until the excitement was over the men at the mission were probably all killed the women and children would be spared nothing could be done at present but to try to save his own life which the indians were resolved to take the conversation was hurried for there was no time to lose spalding gave his pack-horse to bruyere to avoid being encumbered by it and taking some provisions which the priest offered struck off into the woods there to hide until dark nearly a week from this night he arrived at the lapway mission starved torn with bleeding feet as well as broken heart obliged to secrete himself by day his horse had escaped from him leaving him to perform his night journeys on foot over the sharp rocks and prickly cactus plants until not only his shoes had been worn out but his feet had become cruelly lacerated the constant fear which had preyed upon his heart of finding his family murdered had produced fearful havoc in the life forces and although mr spalding had the happiness of finding that the nez perces had been true to mrs spalding defending her from destruction yet so great had been the first shock and so long continued the strain that his nervous system remained a wreck ever afterward End of chapter thirty chapter thirty one of eleven years in the rocky mountains and a life on the frontier by francis a victor this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty one eighteen forty seven when dr whitman reached home on that sunday night after parting with mr spalding at the umatilla it was already about midnight yet he visited the sick before retiring to rest and early in the morning resumed his duties among them an indian died that morning at his burial which the doctor attended he observed that but few of the friends and relatives of the deceased were present but attributed it to the fear which the indians have of disease everything about the mission was going on as usual quite a number of indians were gathered about the place but as an ox was being butchered the crowd was easily accounted for three men were dressing the beef in the yard the afternoon session of the mission school had just commenced the mechanics belonging to the station were about their various avocations. Young Bule was sick in the doctor's house. Three of the orphan children who were recovering from the measles were with the doctor and Mrs. Whitman in the sitting room, and also a Mrs. Osborne, one of the immigrants who had just got up from a sick bed and who had a sick child in her arms. The doctor had just come in, wearied and dejected as it was possible for his resolute spirit to be and had seated himself bible in hand when several indians came to a side door asking permission to come in and get some medicine the doctor rose got his medicines gave them out and sat down again at that moment mrs whitman was in an adjoining room and did not see what followed tamahas a chief called the murderer came behind the doctor's chair and raising his tomahawk struck the doctor in the back of the head stunning but not killing him instantly there was a violent commotion john sager one of the adopted children sprang up with his pistol in his hand but before he could fire it he too was struck down and cut and hacked shockingly in the meantime dr whitman had received a second blow upon the head and now laid lifeless on the floor cries and confusion filled the house 
at the first sound mrs whitman in whose ears that whisper in the air had so long sounded began in agony to stamp upon the floor and wring her hands crying out oh the indians the indians at that moment one of the women from an adjoining building came running in gasping with terror for the butchery was going on outside as well and tamahas and his associates were now assisting at it going to the room where the doctor lay insensible mrs whitman and her terrified neighbor dragged him to the sofa and laid him upon it doing all they could to revive him to all their inquiries he answered by a whispered no probably not conscious what was said while this was being done the people from every quarter began to crowd into the doctor's house many of them wounded outside were heard the shrieks of women the yells of the indians the roar of musketry the noise of furious riding of meeting war clubs groans and every frightful combination of sound such as only could be heard at such a carnival of blood still mrs whitman sat by her husband's side intent on trying to rouse him to say one coherent word nearer and nearer came the struggle and she heard some one exclaim that two of her friends were being murdered beneath the window starting up she approached the casement to get a view as if by looking she could save but that moment she encountered the fiendish gaze of joe lewis the half-breed and comprehended his guilt is it you joe who are doing this she cried before the expression of horror had left her lips a young indian who had been a special favorite about the mission drew up his gun and fired the ball entering her right breast when she fell without a groan when the people had at first rushed in mrs whitman had ordered the doors fastened and the sick children removed to a room upstairs thither now she was herself conveyed having first recovered sufficiently to stagger to the sofa where lay her dying husband those who witnessed this strange scene say that she knelt and prayed prayed for the orphan children she was leaving and for her aged parents the only expression of personal regret she was heard to utter was sorrow that her father and mother should live to know she had perished in such a manner in the chamber were now gathered mrs whitman mrs hayes miss boulet catherine sager thirteen years of age and three of the sick children besides mr rogers and mr kimball scarcely had they gained this retreat when the crashing of windows and doors was heard below and with whoops and yells the savages dashed into the sitting-room where dr whitman still lay dying while some busied themselves removing from the house the goods and furniture a chief named tilau kaikt a favorite at the mission and on probation for admission into the church deliberately chopped and mangled the face of his still breathing teacher and friend with his tomahawk until every feature was rendered unrecognizable the children from the schoolhouse were brought into the kitchen of the doctor's house about this time by joe lewis where he told them they were going to be shot mr spaulding's little girl eliza was among them understanding the native language she was fully aware of the terrible import of what was being said by their tormentors while the indians talked of shooting the children huddled together in the kitchen pointing their guns and yelling eliza covered her face with her apron and leaned over upon the sink that she might not see them shoot her after being tortured in this manner for some time the children were finally ordered out of doors while this was going on a chief called tamtsaki was trying to induce mrs whitman to come down into the sitting-room she replied that she was wounded and could not do so upon which he professed much sorrow and still desired her to be brought down if you are my friend tamtsaki come up and see me was her reply to his professions but he objected saying there were americans concealed in the chamber whom he feared might kill him mr rogers then went to the head of the stairs and endeavored to have the chief come up hoping there might be some friendly ones who would aid them in escaping from the murderers tamtsaki however would not come up the stairs 
although he persisted in saying that mrs whitman should not be harmed and that if fall would come down and go over to the other house where the families were collected they might do so in safety the indians below now began to call out that they were going to burn the doctor's house then no alternative remained but to descend and trust to the mercy of the savages as mrs whitman entered the sitting-room leaning on one arm of mr rogers who also was wounded in the head and had a broken arm she caught a view of the shockingly mutilated face of her husband and fell fainting upon the sofa just as dr whitman gave a dying gasp mr rogers and mrs hayes now attempted to get the sofa or settee out of the house and had succeeded in moving it through the kitchen to the door no sooner did they appear in the open doorway than a volley of balls assailed them mr rogers fell at once but did not die immediately for one of the most horrid features in this horrid butchery was that the victims were murdered by torturing degrees mrs whitman also received several gunshot wounds lying on the settee francis sager the oldest of her adopted boys was dragged into the group of dying ones and shot down the children who had been turned out of the kitchen were still huddled together about the kitchen door so near to this awful scene that every incident was known to them so near that the flashes from the guns of the indians burnt their hair and the odor of the blood and the burning powder almost suffocated them at two o'clock in the afternoon the massacre had commenced it was now growing dusk and the demons were eager to finish their work seeing that life still lingered in the mangled bodies of their victims they finished their atrocities by hurling them in the mud and gore which filled the yard and beating them upon their faces with whips and clubs while the air was filled with the noise of their shouting singing and dancing the indian women and children assisting at these orgies as if the bible had never been preached to them and thus after eleven years of patient endeavor to save some heathen souls alive perished dr and mrs whitman in all that number of indians who had received daily kindnesses at the hands of the missionaries only two showed any compassion these two ups and madpool walla wallas who were employed by the doctor took the children away from the sickening sights that surrounded them into the kitchen pantry and there in secret tried to comfort them when night set in the children and families were all removed to the building called the mansion house where they spent a night of horror all except those who were left in mrs whitman's chamber from which they dared not descend and the family of mr osborne who escaped on the first assault mr and mrs osborne ran into their bedroom which adjoined the sitting-room taking with them their three small children raising a plank in the floor mr o quickly thrust his wife and children into the space beneath and then following let the plank down to its place here they remained until darkness set in able to hear all that was passing about them and fearing to stir when all was quiet at the doctor's house they stole out under cover of darkness and succeeded in reaching fort walla walla after a painful journey of several days or rather nights for they dared not travel by day another person who escaped was a mr hall carpenter who in a hand-to-hand -hand contest with an indian received a wound in the face but finally reached the cover of some bushes where he remained until dark and then fled in the direction of fort walla walla mr hall was the first to arrive at the fort where contrary to his expectations and to all humanity he was but coldly received by the gentleman in charge mr mcbean whether it was from cowardice or cruelty or as some alleged that mr mcbean rejoiced in the slaughter of the protestant missionaries himself being a catholic can never be known had that been true one might have supposed that their death would have been enough and that he might have sheltered a wounded man fleeing for his life without grudging him this atom of comfort 
unfortunately for mr mcbean's reputation he declined to grant such shelter willingly mr hall remained however twelve hours until he heard a report that the women and children were murdered when knowing how unwelcome he was and being in a half distracted state he consented to be set across the columbia to make his way as best he could to the willamette from this hour he was never seen or heard from the manner of his death remaining a mystery to his wife and their family of five children who were among the prisoners at wailatpu when mr osborne left the mission in the darkness he was able only to proceed about two miles before mrs osborne's strength gave way she lately having been confined by an untimely birth and he was compelled to stop secreting himself and family in some bushes here they remained suffering with cold and insufficient food having only a little bread and cold mush which they had found in the pantry of the doctor's house before leaving it on tuesday night mrs o was able to move about three miles more and again they were compelled to stop in this way to proceed they must all perish of starvation therefore on wednesday night mr o took the second child and started with it for the fort where he arrived before noon on thursday although mr mcbean received him with friendliness of manner he refused him horses to go for mrs osborne and his other children and even refused to furnish food to relieve their hunger telling him to go to the umatilla and forbidding his return to the fort a little food was given to himself and child who had been fasting since monday night whether mr mcbean would have allowed this man to perish is uncertain but certain it is that some base or cowardly motive made him exceedingly cruel to both hall and osborne while mr osborne was partaking of his tea and crackers there arrived at the fort mr stanley the artist whom the reader will remember having met in the mountains several years before when the case became known to him he offered his horses immediately to go for mrs osborne shamed into an appearance of humanity mr mcbean then furnished an indian guide to accompany mr o to the umatilla where he still insisted the fugitives should go though this was in the murderer's country a little meat and a few crackers were furnished for the supper of the travellers and with a handkerchief for his hatless head and a pair of socks for his child's naked feet all furnished by mr stanley mr osborne set out to return to his suffering wife and children he and his guide travelled rapidly arriving in good time near the spot where he believed his family to be concealed but the darkness had confused his recollection and after beating the bushes until daylight the unhappy husband and father was about to give up the search in despair when his guide at length discovered their retreat the poor mother and children were barely alive having suffered much from famine and exposure to say nothing of their fears mrs osborne was compelled to be tied to the indian in order to sit her horse in this condition the miserable fugitives turned toward the umatilla in obedience to the command of mcbean and were only saved from being murdered by a cayuse by the scornful words of the guide who shamed the murderer from his purpose of slaughtering a sick and defenceless family at a canadian farmhouse where they stopped to change horses they were but roughly received and learning here that tom saki's lodge was near by mrs osborne refused to proceed any farther toward the umatilla she said i doubt if i can live to reach the umatilla and if i must die i may as well die at the gates of the fort let us then turn back to the fort to this the guide assented saying it was not safe going among the cayuses the little party quite exhausted reached walla walla about ten o'clock at night and were at once admitted contrary to his former course mr mcbean now ordered a fire made to warm the benumbed travellers who after being made tolerably comfortable were placed in a secret room of the fort again mr osborne was importuned to go away down to the willamette mr mcbean promising to take care of his family and furnish him an outfit if he would do so upon being asked to furnish a boat and indians to man it in order that the family might accompany him 
he replied that his indians refused to go from all this reluctance not only on the part of mcbean but of the indians also to do any act which appeared like befriending the americans it would appear that there was a very general fear of the cayuse indians and a belief that they were about to inaugurate a general war upon the americans and their friends and allies mr osborne however refused to leave his family behind and mr mcbean was forced to let him remain until relief came when it did come at last in the shape of mr ogden's party stickus the chief who had warned mr spaulding showed his kind feeling for the sufferers by removing his own cap and placing it on mr osborne's head and by tying a handkerchief over the ears of mr osborne's little son as he said to keep him warm going down the river sadly indeed did the little ones who suffered by the massacre at wailatpu stand in need of any christian kindness end of chapter thirty one chapter thirty two of eleven years in the rocky mountains and a life on the frontier by francis a victor this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty two eighteen forty seven a full account of the horrors of the wailatpu massacre together with the individual sufferings of the captives whose lives were spared would fill a volume and be harrowing to the reader therefore only so much of it will be given here as from its bearing upon oregon history is important to our narrative the day following the massacre being tuesday was the day on which mr spaulding was met and warned not to go to the mission by the vicar-general bruyer happening at the mission on that day and finding the bodies of the victims still unburied bruyer had them hastily interred before leaving if interment it could be called which left them still a prey to wolves the reader of this chapter of oregon history will always be very much puzzled to understand by what means the catholic priests procured their perfect exemption from harm during this time of terror to the americans was it that they were french and that they came into the country only as missionaries of a religion adapted to the savage mind and not as settlers was it at all owing to the fact that they were celibates with no families to excite jealous feelings of comparison in the minds of their converts through a long and bitter war of words which followed the massacre at wailatpu terrible sins were charged upon the priests no less than inciting the indians to the murder of the protestants and winking at the atrocities of every kind committed by the savages whether they feared to enter into the quarrel and were restrained from showing sympathy solely by this fear is a question only themselves can determine certain it is that they preserved a neutral position when to be neutral was to seem if not to be devoid of human sympathies that the event would have happened without any other provocation than such as the americans furnished by their own reckless disregard of indian prejudices seems evident the question and the only question which is suggested by a knowledge of all the circumstances is whether the event was helped on by an intelligent outside influence it was quite natural that the protestants should wonder at the immunity from danger which the priests enjoyed and that not clearly seeing the reason they should suspect them of collusion with the indians it was natural too for the sufferers from the massacre to look for some expression of sympathy from any and all denominations of christians and that not receiving it they should have doubts of the motives which prompted such reserve the story of that time is but an unpleasant record and had best be lightly touched upon the work of death and destruction did not close with the first day at wailatpu mr kimball who had remained in the chamber of the doctor's house all night had suffered much from the pain of his broken arm on tuesday driven desperate by his own sufferings and those of the three sick children with him one of whom was the little Helen Mar Meek. He resolved to procure some water from the stream which ran near the house. 
but he had not proceeded more than a few rods before he was shot down and killed instantly the same day a mr young from the sawmill was also killed in the course of the week mr boulet who was sick over at the mansion was brutally murdered meanwhile the female captives and children were enduring such agony as seldom falls to the lot of humanity to suffer compelled to work for the indians their feelings were continually harrowed up by the terrible sights which everywhere met their eyes in going back and forth between the houses in carrying water from the stream or moving in any direction whatever for the dead were not removed until the setting in of decay made it necessary to the indians themselves the goods belonging to the mission were taken from the storeroom and the older women ordered to make them up into clothing for the indians the buildings were plundered of everything which the indians coveted all the rest of their contents that could not be made useful to themselves were destroyed those of the captives who were sick were not allowed proper attention and in a day or two helen marmeek died of neglect thus passed four or five days on saturday a new horror was added to the others the savages began to carry off the young women for wives three were thus dragged away to indian lodges to suffer tortures worse than death one young girl a daughter of mr kimball was taken possession of by the murderer of her father who took daily delight in reminding her of that fact and when her sorrow could no longer be restrained only threatened to exchange her for another young girl who was also a wife by compulsion miss boulet the eldest of the young women at the mission and who was a teacher in the mission school was taken to the umatilla to the lodge of five crows as has before been related there was a house on the umatilla belonging to tanny tan in which were residing at this time two catholic priests the vicar-general bruyer and blanchet bishop of walla walla to this house miss boulet applied for protection and was refused whether from fear or from the motives subsequently attributed to them by some protestant writers in oregon is not known to any but themselves the only thing certain about it is that miss boulet was allowed to be violently dragged from their presence every night to return to them weeping in the morning and to have her entreaties for their assistance answered by assurances from them that the wisest course for her was to submit and this continued for more than two weeks until the news of mr ogden's arrival at walla walla became known when miss boulet was told that if five crows would not allow her to remain at their house altogether she must remain at the lodge of five crows well knowing what five crows would do but wishing to have miss boulet's actions seem voluntary from shame perhaps at their own cowardice yet the reason they gave ought to go for all it is worth that they being priests could not have a woman about their house in this unhappy situation did the female captives spend three most miserable weeks in the meantime the mission at lapway had been broken up but not destroyed nor had any one suffered death as was at first feared the intelligence of the massacre at wailatpu was first conveyed to mrs spaulding by a mr camfield who at the breaking out of the massacre fled with his wife and children to a small room in the attic of the mansion from the window of which he was able to behold the scenes which followed when night came mr camfield contrived to elude observation and descend into the yard where he encountered a french canadian long in the employ of dr whitman and since suspected to have been privy to the plan of the murders to him mr camfield confided his intention to escape and obtained a promise that a horse should be brought to a certain place at a certain time for his use but the canadian failing to appear with his horse mr c set out on foot and under cover of night in the direction of the lapway mission he arrived in the nez perce country on thursday 
on the following day he came upon a camp of these people and procured from them a guide to lapwai without however speaking of what had occurred at wailatpu the caution of mr camfield relates to a trait of indian character which the reader of indian history must bear in mind that is the close relationship and identity of feeling of allied tribes why he did not inform the nez Perces of the deed done by their relatives the cayuses was because in that case he would have expected them to have sympathized with their allies even to the point of making him a prisoner or of taking his life it is this fact concerning the indian character which alone furnishes an excuse for the conduct of mr mcbean and the catholic priests upon it mr camfield acted making no sign of fear nor betraying any knowledge of the terrible matter on his mind to the nez Perces. on saturday afternoon mr c arrived at mrs spalding's house and dismissed his guide with the present of a buffalo robe when he was alone with mrs spalding he told his unhappy secret it was then that the strength and firmness of mrs spalding's character displayed itself in her decisive action well enough she knew the close bond between the nez Perces and the cayuses and also the treachery of the indian character but she saw that if affairs were left to shape themselves as mr camfield entreated they might be left to do putting off the evil day that when the news came from the cayuses there would be an outbreak the only chance of averting this danger was to inform the chiefs most attached to her at once and throw herself and her family upon their mercy her resolution was taken not an hour too soon two of the chiefs most relied upon happened to be at the place that very afternoon one of whom was called jacob and the other eagle to these two mrs spalding confided the news without delay and took counsel of them according to her hopes they assumed the responsibility of protecting her one of them went to inform his camp and gave them orders to stand by mrs s while the other carried a note to mr craig one of our rocky mountain acquaintances who lived ten miles from the mission jacob and eagle with two other friendly chiefs decided that mrs s must go to their camp near mr craig's because in case the cayuses came to the mission as was to be expected she would be safer with them mrs s however would not consent to make the move on the sabbath but begged to be allowed to remain quiet until monday late saturday evening mr craig came down and mrs spalding endeavored with his assistance to induce the indians to carry an express to simacane in the country of the spokans where messrs walker and eels had a station not an indian could be persuaded to go an effort also was made by the heroic and suffering wife and mother to send an express to wailatpu to learn the fate of her daughter and if possible of her husband but the indians were none of them inclined to go they said without doubt all the women and children were slain that mr spalding was alive no one believed the reply of mrs s to their objections was that she could not believe that they were her friends if they would not undertake this journey for the relief of her feelings under such circumstances at length eagle consented to go but so much opposed were the others to having anything done which their relations the cayuses might be displeased with that it was nearly twenty-four hours before eagle got leave to go on monday morning a nez Perce arrived from wailatpu with the news of what the cayuses had done with him were a number of indians from the camp where mr camfield had stopped for a guide all eager for plunder and for murder too had they not found mrs spalding protected by several chiefs her removal to their camp probably saved her from the fate of mrs whitman among those foremost in plundering the mission buildings at lapway were some of the hitherto most exemplary indians among the nez Perces. even the chief first in authority after ellis who was absent was prominent in these robberies 
for eight years had this chief joseph been a member of the church at lapway and sustained a good reputation during that time how bitter must have been the feelings of mrs spalding who had a truly devoted missionary heart when she beheld the fruit of her life's labor turned to ashes in her sight as it was by the conduct of joseph and his family shortly after the removal of mrs spalding and the pillaging of the buildings mr spalding arrived at lapway from his long and painful journey during which he had wandered much out of his way and suffered many things his appearance was the signal for earnest consultations among the nez Perses, who were not certain that they might safely give protection to him without the consent of the cayuses to his petition that they should carry a letter express to fort colville or fort walla walla they would not consent their reason for refusing seemed to be a fear that such a letter might be answered by an armed body of americans who would come to avenge the deaths of their countrymen to deprive them of this suspicion mr spalding told them that as he had been robbed of everything he had no means of paying them for their services to his family and that it was necessary to write to walla walla for blankets and to the umatilla for his horses he assured them that he would write to his countrymen to keep quiet and that they had nothing to fear from the americans the truth was however that he had forwarded through brulie a letter to governor abernathy asking for help which could only come into that hostile country armed and equipped for war late in the month of december there arrived in oregon city to be delivered to the governor sixty-two captives bought from the cayuses and nez Perces by hudson's bay blankets and goods and obtained at that price by hudson's bay influence no other power on earth says joe meek the american could have rescued those prisoners from the hands of the indians and no man better than mr meek understood the indian character or the hudson's bay company's power over them the number of victims to the Wailatpu massacre was fourteen none escaped who had not to mourn a father brother son or friend if the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church there ought to arise on the site of Wailatpu a generation of extraordinary piety as for the people for whom a noble man and woman and numbers of innocent persons were sacrificed they have returned to their traditions with the exception of the nez Perses, who under the leadership of their old teacher mr spalding have once more resumed the pursuits of civilized and christianized nations the description of why Lapu at the present time given on the following page is from all over oregon and washington by the author of this book Wailatpu is just that a creek bottom the creeks on either side of it fringed with trees higher land shutting out the view in front isolation and solitude the most striking features of the place yet here came a man and a woman to live and to labor among the savages when all the old oregon territory was an indian country here stood the station erected by them adobe houses a mill a schoolhouse for the indians shops and all the necessary appurtenances of an isolated settlement nothing remains to-day but mounds of earth into which the adobes were dissolved by weather after burning a few rods away on the side of the hill is a different mound the common grave of fourteen victims of savage superstition jealousy and wrath it is roughly enclosed by a board fence and has not a shrub or a flower to disguise its terrible significance the most affecting reminders of wasted effort which remain on the old mission grounds are the two or three apple trees which escaped the general destruction and the scarlet poppies which are scattered broadcast through the creek bottom near the houses sadly significant it is that the flower whose evanescent bloom is the symbol of unenduring joys should be the only tangible witness left of the womanly tastes and labors of the devoted missionary who gave her life 
a sacrifice to ungrateful Indian savagery. The place is occupied at present by one of Dr. Whitman's early friends and co-laborers who claimed the mission ground under the Donation Act, and who was first and most active in founding the seminary to the memory of a Christian gentleman and martyr. On the identical spot where stood the doctor's residence now stands the more modern one of his friend, and he seems to take a melancholy pleasure in keeping in remembrance the events of that unhappy time which threw a gloom over the whole territory west of the Rocky Mountains. End of chapter 32「Of Eleven Years in the Rocky Mountains and A Life on the Frontier」by Francis A. Victor. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 33, 1847-8 When the contents of Mr. Douglas' letter to the governor became known to the citizens of the Willamette Settlement, the greatest excitement prevailed. On the reading of that letter, and those accompanying it, before the house, a resolution was immediately introduced authorizing the governor to raise a company of riflemen, not to exceed fifty in number, to occupy and hold the mission station at the Dalles, until a larger force could be raised, and such measures adopted as the government might think advisable. This resolution being sent to the governor without delay, received his approval when the house adjourned. A large meeting of the citizens was held that evening, which was addressed by several gentlemen, among whom was Meek, whose taste for Indian fighting was whetted to keenness by the aggravating circumstances of the Wailatpu massacre, and the fact that his little Helen Marr was among the captives. Impatient as was Meek to avenge the murders, he was too good a mountain man to give any rash advice. All that could be done under the existing circumstances was to trust to the Hudson's Bay Company for the rescue of the prisoners, and to take such means for defending the settlements as the people in their unarmed condition could devise. The legislature undertook the settlement of the question of ways and means, to raise money for the carrying out of the most important measures immediately was a task which after some consideration was entrusted to three commissioners and by these commissioners letters were addressed to the hudson's bay company the superintendent of the methodist mission and to the merchants and citizens of oregon the latter communication is valuable as fully explaining the position of affairs at that time in oregon it is dated December 17th and was as follows. Gentlemen, you are aware that the undersigned have been charged by the legislature of our provisional government with the difficult duty of obtaining the necessary means to arm, equip, and support in the field a force sufficient to obtain full satisfaction of the Cayuse Indians for the late massacre at Wailatpu, and to protect the white population of our common country from further aggression in furtherance of this object they have deemed it their duty to make immediate application to the merchants and citizens of the country for the requisite assistance though clothed with the power to pledge to the fullest extent the faith and means of the present government of oregon they do not consider this pledge the only security to those who in this distressing emergency may extend to the people of this country the means of protection and redress without claiming any special authority from the government of the united states to contract a debt to be liquidated by that power yet from all precedents of like character in the history of our country the undersigned feel confident that the united states government will regard the murder of the late dr whitman and his lady as a national wrong and will fully justify the people of oregon in taking active measures to obtain redress for that outrage and for their protection from further aggression the right of self-defense is tacitly acknowledged to every body politic in the confederacy to which we claim to belong 
and in every case similar to our own within our knowledge the general government has promptly assumed the payment of all liabilities growing out of the measures taken by the constituted authorities to protect the lives and property of those who reside within the limits of their districts if the citizens of the states and territories east of the rocky mountains are justified in promptly acting in such emergencies who are under the immediate protection of the general government there appears no room for doubt that the lawful acts of the oregon government will receive a like approval though the indians of the columbia have committed a great outrage upon our fellow-citizens passing through their country and residing among them and their punishment for these murders may and ought to be a prime object with every citizen of oregon yet as that duty more particularly devolves upon the government of the united states and admits of delay we do not make this the strongest ground upon which to found our earnest appeal to you for pecuniary assistance it is a fact well known to every person acquainted with the indian character that by passing silently over their repeated thefts robberies and murders of our fellow-citizens they have been emboldened to the commission of the appalling massacre at wailatpu they call us women destitute of the hearts and courage of men and if we allow this wholesale murder to pass by as former aggressions who can tell how long either life or property will be secure in any part of this country or what moment the willamette will be the scene of blood and carnage the officers of our provisional government have nobly performed their duty none can doubt the readiness of the patriotic sons of the west to offer their personal services in defence of a cause so righteous so it now rests with you gentlemen to say whether our rights and our firesides shall be defended or not hoping that none will be found to falter in so high and so sacred a duty we beg leave gentlemen to subscribe ourselves your servants and fellow-citizens jesse applegate a l lovejoy george l curry commissioners a similar letter had been addressed to the hudson's bay company and to the methodist mission from each of these sources such assistance was obtained as enabled the colony to arm and equip the first regiment of oregon riflemen which in the month of january proceeded to the cayuse country the amount raised however was very small being less than five thousand dollars and it became imperatively necessary that the government of the united states should be called upon to extend its aid and protection to the loyal but distressed young territory in view of this necessity it was resolved in the legislature to send a messenger to carry the intelligence of the massacre to governor mason of california and through him to the commander of the united states squadron in the pacific that a vessel of war might be sent into the columbia river and arms and ammunition borrowed for the present emergency from the nearest arsenal for this duty was chosen jesse applegate esq a gentleman who combined in his character and person the ability of the statesman with the sagacity and strength of the pioneer mr applegate with a small party of brave men set out in midwinter to cross the mountains into california but such was the depth of snow they encountered that travelling became impossible even after abandoning their horses and they were compelled to return the messenger elected to proceed to the united states was joseph l meek whose rocky mountain experiences eminently fitted him to encounter the dangers of such a winter journey and whose manliness firmness and ready wit stood him instead of statesmanship on the seventeenth december meek resigned his seat in the house in order to prepare for the discharge of his duty as messenger to the united states on the fourth of january armed with his credentials from the oregon legislature and bearing dispatches from that body and the governor to the president he at length set out on the long and perilous expedition having for travelling companions mr john owens and mr george eberts the latter having formerly been a rocky mountain man like himself 
at the dalles they found the first regiment of oregon riflemen under major lee of the newly created army of oregon from the reports which the dalles indians brought in of the hostility of the indians beyond the deschutes river it was thought best not to proceed before the arrival of the remainder of the army when all the forces would proceed at once to wailatpu owing to various delays the army consisting of about five hundred men under colonel gilliam did not reach the dalles until late in january when the troops proceeded at once to the seat of war the reports concerning the warlike disposition of the indians proved to be correct already the waskapums or dalles indians had begun robbing the mission at that place when colonel lee's arrival among them with troops had compelled them to return the stolen property as the army advanced they found that all the tribes above the dalles were holding themselves prepared for hostilities at well springs beyond the deschutes river they were met by a body of about six hundred indians to whom they gave battle soon dispersing them the superior arms and equipments of the whites tending to render timid those tribes yet unaccustomed to so superior an enemy from thence to wailatpu the course of the army was unobstructed in the meantime the captives had been given up to the hudson's bay company and full particulars of the massacre were obtained by the army with all the subsequent abuses and atrocities suffered by the prisoners the horrible details were not calculated to soften the first bitterness of hatred which had animated the volunteers on going into the field nor was the appearance of an armed force in their midst likely to allay the hostile feelings with which other causes had inspired the indians had not the captives already been removed out of the country no influence not even that of the hudson's bay company could have prevailed to get them out of the power of their captors then indeed in order to treat with the cayuses in the first place mr ogden had been obliged to promise peace to the indians and now they found instead of peace every preparation for war however as the army took no immediate action but only remained in their country to await the appearance of the commissioners appointed by the legislature of oregon to hold a council with the chiefs of the various tribes the cayuses were forced to observe the outward semblance of amity while these councils were pending arrived at wailatpu the friends and acquaintances of dr whitman were shocked to find that the remains of the victims were still unburied although a little earth had been thrown over them meek to whom ever since his meeting with her in the train of the fur trader mrs whitman had seemed all that was noble and captivating had the melancholy satisfaction of bestowing with others the last sad rite of burial upon such portions of her once fair person as murder and the wolves had not destroyed some tresses of golden hair were severed from the brow so terribly disfigured to be given to her friends in the willamette as a last and only memorial among the state documents at salem oregon may still be seen one of these relics of the wailatpu tragedy not only had meek to discover and inter the remains of dr and mrs whitman but also of his little girl who was being educated at the mission with a daughter of his former leader bridger this sad duty performed he immediately set out escorted by a company of one hundred men under adjutant wilcox who accompanied him as far as the foot of the blue mountains here the companies separated and meek went on his way to washington end of chapter thirty three chapter thirty four of eleven years in the rocky mountains and a life on the frontier by francis a victor this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty four eighteen forty eight 
meek's party now consisted of himself eberts owens and four men who being desirous of returning to the states took this opportunity however as the snow proved to be very deep on the blue mountains and the cold severe two of these four volunteers became discouraged and concluded to remain at fort boise where was a small trading post of the hudson's bay company in order to avoid trouble with the indians he might meet on the western side of the rocky mountains meek had adopted the red belt and canadian cap of the employees of the hudson's bay company and to this precaution was owing the fact of his safe passage through the country now all infected with hostility caught from the cayuses about three days travel beyond fort boise the party met a village of bannock indians who at once made warlike demonstrations but on seeing meek's costume and receiving an invitation to hold a talk desisted and received the travellers in a friendly manner meek informed the chief with all the gravity which had won for him the name of shyam shushpuzia among the crows in former years that he was going on the business of the hudson's bay company to fort hall and that thomas mackay was a day's march behind with a large trading party and plenty of goods on the receipt of this good news the chief ordered his braves to fall back and permit the party to pass yet fearing the deception might be discovered they thought it prudent to travel day and night until they reached fort hall at this post of the hudson's bay company in charge of mr grant they were kindly received and stopped for a few hours of rest mr grant being absent his wife provided liberally for the refreshment of the party who were glad to find themselves even for a short interval under a roof beside a fire and partaking of freshly cooked food but they permitted themselves no unnecessary delay before night they were once more on their way though snow had now commenced to fall afresh rendering the travelling very difficult for two days they struggled on their horses floundering in the soft drifts until further progress in that manner became impossible the only alternative left was to abandon their horses and proceed on snowshoes which were readily constructed out of willow sticks taking only a blanket and their rifles and leaving the animals to find their way back to fort hall the little party pushed on meek was now on familiar ground and the old mountain spirit which had once enabled him to endure hunger cold and fatigue without murmuring possessed him now it was not without a certain sense of enjoyment that he found himself reduced to the necessity of shooting a couple of polecats to furnish a supper for himself and party how long the enjoyment of feeling want would have lasted is uncertain but probably only long enough to whet the appetite for plenty to such a point had the appetites of all the party been whetted when after several days of scarcity and toil followed by nights of emptiness and cold meek had the agreeable surprise of falling in with an old mountain comrade on the identical ground of many a former adventure the headwaters of bear river this man whom meek was delighted to meet was peg leg smith one of the most famous of many well-known mountain men he was engaged in herding cattle in the valley of thomas fork where the tall grass was not quite buried under snow and had with him a party of ten men meek was as cordially received by his former comrade as the unbounded hospitality of mountain manners rendered it certain he would be a fat cow was immediately sacrificed which though not buffalo meat as in former times it would have been was very good beef and furnished a luxurious repast to the polecat eaters of the last several days smith's camp did not lack the domestic element of women and children any more than had the trappers camps in the flush times of the fur trade therefore seeing that the meeting was most joyful and full of reminiscences of former winter camps smith thought to celebrate the occasion by a grand entertainment accordingly after a great deal of roast beef had been disposed of a dance was called for in which white men and indian women joined with far more mirth and jollity than grace or ceremony thus passed some hours of the night 
the bearer of dispatches seizing in true mountain style the passing moment's pleasure so long as it did not interfere with the punctilious discharge of his duty and to the honour of our hero be it said nothing was ever allowed to interfere with that refreshed and provided with rations for a couple of days the party started on again next morning still on snowshoes and travelled up bear river to the headwaters of green river crossing from the muddy fork over to fort bridger where they arrived very much fatigued but quite well in little more than three days travel here again it was meek's good fortune to meet with his former leader bridger to whom he related what had befallen him since turning pioneer the meeting was joyful on both sides clouded only by the remembrance of what had brought it about and the reflection that both had a personal wrong to avenge in bringing about the punishment of the cayuse murderers once more meek's party were generously fed and furnished with such provisions as they could carry about their persons in addition to this bridger presented them with four good mules by which means the travellers were mounted four at a time while the fifth took exercise on foot so that by riding or walking turn about they were enabled to get on very well as far as the south pass here again for some distance the snow was very deep and two of their mules were lost in it their course lay down the sweetwater river past many familiar hunting and camping grounds to the platte river owing to the deep snows game was very scarce and a long day of toil was frequently closed by a supperless sleep under shelter of some rock or bank with only a blanket for cover at red buttes they were so fortunate as to find and kill a single buffalo which separated from the distant herd was left by providence in the path of the famished travellers on reaching the platte river they found the travelling improved as well as the supply of game and proceeded with less difficulty as far as fort laramie a trading post in charge of a french trader named papillon here again fresh mules were obtained and the little party treated in the most hospitable manner in parting from his entertainer meek was favoured with this brief counsel there is a village of sioux about six hundred lodges a hundred miles from here your course will bring you to it look out for yourself and don't make a gray muss of it which latter clause referred to the affair of eighteen thirty seven when the sioux had killed the indian escort of mr gray when the party arrived at ash hollow which they meant to have passed in the night on account of the sioux village the snow was again falling so thickly that the party had not perceived their nearness to the village until they were fairly in the midst of it it was now no safer to retreat than to proceed and after a moment's consultation the word was given to keep on in truth meek thought it doubtful whether the sioux would trouble themselves to come out in such a tempest and if they did so that the blinding snowfall was rather in his favour thus reasoning he was forcing his mule through the drifts as rapidly as the poor worried animal could make its way when a head was protruded from a lodge door and hello major greeted his ear in an accent not altogether english on being thus accosted the party came to a halt and meek was invited to enter the lodge with his friends his host on this occasion was a french trader named labine who after offering the hospitalities of the lodge and learning who were his guests offered to accompany the party a few miles on its way this he did saying by way of explanation of this act of courtesy the sioux are a bad people i thought it best to see you safe out of the village receiving the thanks of the travellers he turned back at nightfall and they continued on all night without stopping to camp going some distance to the south of their course before turning east again in order to avoid any possible pursuers without further adventures and by dint of almost constant travel the party arrived at st joseph missouri in safety in a little over two months from portland oregon soon afterwards when the circumstances of this journey became known a steamboat built for the missouri river trade was christened the joseph l meek and bore for a motto on her pilot house the quickest trip yet in reference both to meek's overland journey and her own steaming qualities 
as meek approached the settlements and knew that he must soon be thrown into society of the highest official grade and be subjected to such ordeals as he dreaded far more than indian fighting or even travelling express across a continent of snow the subject of how he was to behave in these new and trying positions very frequently occurred to him he an uneducated man trained to mountain life and manners without money or even clothes with nothing to depend on but the importance of his mission and his own mother wit he felt far more keenly than his careless appearance would suggest the difficulties and awkwardness of his position i thought a great deal about it confesses the colonel joseph l meek of to-day and i finally concluded that as i had never tried to act like anybody but myself i would not make myself a fool by beginning to ape other folks now so i said joe meek you always have been and joe meek you shall remain go ahead joe meek in fact it would have been rather difficult putting on fine gentleman airs in that old worn-out hunting suit of his and with not a dollar to bless himself on the contrary it needed just the devil-may-care temper which naturally belonged to our hero to carry him through the remainder of his journey to washington to be hungry ill-clad dirty and penniless is sufficient in itself for the subduing of most spirits how it affected the temper of the messenger from oregon we shall now learn when the weary little party arrived in st joseph they repaired to a hotel and meek requested that a meal should be served for all but frankly confessing that they had no money to pay the landlord however declined furnishing guests of his style upon such terms and our travellers were forced to go into camp below the town meek now bethought himself of his letters of introduction it chanced that he had one from two young men among the oregon volunteers to their father in st joseph stopping a negro who was passing his camp he inquired whether such a gentleman was known to him and on learning that he was succeeded in inducing the negro to deliver the letter from his sons this movement proved successful in a short space of time the gentleman presented himself and learning the situation of the party provided generously for their present wants and promised any assistance which might be required in future meek however chose to accept only that which was imperatively needed namely something to eat and transportation to some point on the river where he could take a steamer for st louis a portion of his party chose to remain in st joseph and a portion accompanied him as far as independence whither this same st joseph gentleman conveyed them in his carriage while meek was stopping at independence he was recognized by a sister whom he had not seen for nineteen years who marrying and emigrating from virginia had settled on the frontier of missouri but he gave himself no time for family reunion and gossip a steamboat that had been frozen up in the ice all winter was just about starting for st louis and on board of this he went with an introduction to the captain which secured for him every privilege the boat afforded together with the kindest attention of its officers when the steamer arrived in st louis by one of those fortuitous circumstances so common in our hero's career he was met at the landing by campbell a rocky mountain trader who had formerly belonged to the st louis company this meeting relieved him of any care about his night's entertainment in st louis and it also had another effect that of relieving him of any further care about the remainder of his journey for after hearing meek's story of the position of affairs in oregon and his errand to the united states campbell had given the same to the newspaper reporters and meek like byron waked up next morning to find himself famous having telegraphed to washington and received the president's order to come on the previous evening our hero wended his way to the levee the morning after his arrival in st louis there were two steamers lying side by side both up for pittsburgh with runners for each striving to outdo each other in securing passengers a bright thought occurred to the moneyless envoy he would earn his passage 
walking on board one of the boats which bore the name of the declaration himself a figure which attracted all eyes by his size and outlandish dress he mounted to the hurricane deck and began to harangue the crowd upon the levee in the voice of a stentor this way gentlemen if you please come right on board the declaration i am the man from oregon with dispatches to the president of these united states that you all read about in this morning's paper come on board ladies and gentlemen if you want to hear the news from oregon i've just come across the plains two months from the columbia river where the engines are killing your missionaries those passengers who come aboard the declaration shall hear all about it before they get to pittsburgh don't stop thar looking at my old wolfskin cap but just come aboard and hear what i've got to tell the novelty of this sort of solicitation operated capitally many persons crowded on board the declaration only to get a closer look at this picturesque personage who invited them and many more because they were really interested to know the news from the far-off young territory which had fallen into trouble so it chanced that the declaration was inconveniently crowded on this particular morning after the boat had got under way the captain approached his roughest-looking cabin passenger and inquired in a low tone of voice if he were really and truly the messenger from oregon thar's where i've got to show for it answered meek producing his papers well all i have to say is mr meek that you're the best runner this boat ever had and you are welcome to your passage ticket and anything you desire besides finding that his bright thought had succeeded so well meek's spirit rose with the occasion and the passengers had no reason to complain that he had not kept his word before he reached wheeling his popularity was immense notwithstanding the condition of his wardrobe at cincinnati he had time to present a letter to the celebrated dr blank who gave him another which proved to be an open sesame wherever he went thereafter on the morning of his arrival in wheeling it happened that the stage which then carried passengers to cumberland where they took the train for washington had already departed elated by his previous good fortune our ragged hero resolved not to be delayed by so trivial a circumstance but walking pompously into the stage office inquired with an air which must have smacked strongly of the mock heroic if he could have a stage for cumberland the nicely dressed dignified elderly gentleman who managed the business of the office regarded the man who proffered this modest request for a moment in motionless silence then slowly raising the spectacles over his eyes to a position on his forehead finished his survey with unassisted vision somewhat impressed by the manner in which meek bore this scrutiny he ended by demanding who are you tickled by the absurdity of the tableau they were enacting meek straightened himself up to his six feet two and replied with an air of superb self-assurance i am envoy extraordinary and minister plenipotentiary from the republic of oregon to the court of the united states after a pause in which the old gentleman seemed to be recovering from some great surprise he requested to see the credentials of this extraordinary envoy still more surprised he seemed on discovering for himself that the personage before him was really a messenger from oregon to the government of the united states but the effect was magical in a moment the bell rope was pulled and in an incredibly short space of time a coach stood at the door ready to convey the waiting messenger on his way to washington in the meantime in a conversation with the stage agent meek had explained more fully the circumstances of his mission and the agent had become much interested on parting meek received a ticket to the relay house with many expressions of regret from the agent that he could ticket him no farther but it is all the same said he you are sure to go through or run a train off the track rejoined meek as he was bowed out of the office 
it happened that there were some other passengers waiting to take the first stage and they crowded into this one glad of the unexpected opportunity but wondering at the queer-looking passenger to whom the agent was so polite this scarcely concealed curiosity was all that was needed to stimulate the madcap spirits of our so far conquering hero putting his head out of the window just at the moment of starting he electrified everybody horses included by the utterance of a war whoop and yell that would have done credit to a wild comanche satisfied with the speed to which this demoniac noise had excited the driver's prancing steeds he quietly ensconced himself in his corner of the coach and waited for his fellow passengers to recover from their stunned sensations when their complete recovery had been effected there followed the usual questioning and explanations which ended in the inevitable lionizing that was so much to the taste of this sensational individual on the cars at cumberland and at the eating-houses the messenger from oregon kept up his sensational character indulging in alternate fits of mountain manners and again assuming a disproportionate amount of grandeur but in either view proving himself very amusing by the time the train reached the relay house many of the passengers had become acquainted with meek and were prepared to understand and enjoy each new phase of his many-sided comicality the ticket with which the stage agent presented him dead-headed him only to this point here again he must make his poverty a jest and joke himself through to washington accordingly when the conductor came through the car in which he with several of his new acquaintances were sitting demanding tickets he was obliged to tap his blanketed passenger on the shoulder to attract his attention to the ticket sir hakoyani meka hench said meek starting up and addressing him in the snake tongue ticket sir repeated the conductor staring ka -hump hunch returned meek assuming a look which indicated that english was as puzzling to him as snake to other people finding that his time would be wasted on this singular passenger the conductor went on through the train returning after a time with a fresh demand for his ticket but meek sustained his character admirably and it was only through the excessive amusement of the passengers that the conductor suspected that he was being made the subject of a practical joke at this stage of affairs it was privately explained to him who and what his waggish customer was and tickets were no more mentioned during the journey on the arrival of the train at washington the heart of our hero became for a brief moment of time very little he felt that the importance of his mission demanded some dignity of appearance some conformity to established rules and precedents but of the latter he knew absolutely nothing and concerning the former he realized the absurdity of a dignitary clothed in blankets and a wolfskin cap joe mika must remain said he to himself as he stepped out of the train and glanced along the platform at the crowd of porters with the names of their hotels on their hatbands learning from inquiry that coleman's was the most fashionable place he decided that to coleman's he would go judging correctly that it was best to show no littleness of heart even in the matter of hotels End of chapter 34chapter thirty five of eleven years in the rocky mountains and a life on the frontier by francis a victor this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty five eighteen forty eight when meek arrived at coleman's it was the dinner hour and following the crowd to the dining saloon he took the first seat he came to not without being very much stared at he had taken his cue and the staring was not unexpected consequently not so embarrassing as it might otherwise have been a bill of fare was laid beside his plate turning to the colored waiter who placed it there he startled him first by inquiring in a low growling voice what's that boy bill of fare sir 
replied the boy who recognized the southerner in the use of that one word read growled meek again the people in my country can't read though taken by surprise the waiter politely obedient proceeded to enumerate the courses on the bill of fare when he came to game stop thar boy commanded meek what kind of game small game sir fetch me a piece of antelope leaning back in his chair with a look of satisfaction on his face got none of that sir don't know what that are sir don't know with a look of pretended surprise in my country antelope and deer are small game bear and buffalo are large game i reckon if you haven't got one you haven't got the other either in that case you may fetch me some beef the waiter disappeared grinning and soon returned with the customary thin and small cut which meek eyed at first contemptuously and then accepting it in the light of a sample swallowed it at two mouthfuls returning his plate to the waiter with an approving smile and saying loud enough to be overheard by a score of people boy that will do fetch me about four pounds of the same kind by this time the blanketed beef-eater was the recipient of general attention and the boy who served him comprehending with that quickness which distinguishes servants that he had no ordinary backwoodsman to deal with was all the time on the alert to make himself useful people stared then smiled then asked each other who is it loud enough for the stranger to hear meek looked neither to the right nor to the left pretending not to hear the whispering when he had finished his beef he again addressed himself to the attentive boy that's better meat than the old mule i eat in the mountains upon this remark the whispering became more general and louder and smiles more frequent what have you got to drink boy continued meek still unconscious isn't there a sort of wine called some kind of pain champagne sir that's the stuff i reckon bring me some while meek drank his champagne with an occasional aside to his faithful attendant people laughed and wondered who the devil it was at length having finished his wine and overhearing many open inquiries as to his identity the hero of many bear fights slowly arose and addressing the company through the before-mentioned boy said you want to know who i am if you please sir yes if you please sir for the sake of these gentlemen present replied the boy answering for the company well then proclaimed meek with a grandiloquent air quite at variance with his blanket coat and unkempt hair yet which displayed his fine person to advantage i am envoy extraordinary and minister plenipotentiary from the republic of oregon to the court of the united states with that he turned and strode from the room he had not proceeded far however before he was overtaken by a party of gentlemen in pursuit senator underwood of kentucky immediately introduced himself calling the envoy by name for the dispatch from st louis had prepared the president and the senate for meek's appearance in washington though it had not advised them of his style of dress and address other gentlemen were introduced and questions followed questions in rapid succession when curiosity was somewhat abated meek expressed a wish to see the president without delay to underwood's question as to whether he did not wish to make his toilet before visiting the white house his reply was business first and toilet afterwards but said underwood even your business can wait long enough for that no that's your mistake senator and i'll tell you why i can't dress for two reasons both good ones i've not got a cent of money nor a second suit of clothes the generous kentuckian offered to remove the first of the objections on the spot but meek declined i'll see the president first and hear what he has to say about my mission 
been calling a coach from the stand he sprang into it answering the driver's question of where he would be taken with another inquiry why should a man of my style want to go to the white house of course and so was driven away amid the general laughter of the gentleman in the portico at coleman's who had rather doubted his intention to pay his respects to the president in his dirty blankets he was admitted to the presidential mansion by a mulatto of about his own age with whom he remembered playing when a lad for it must be remembered that the meeks and polks were related and this servant had grown up in the family on inquiring if he could see the president he was directed to the office of the private secretary knox walker also a relative of meeks on the mother's side on entering he found the room filled with gentlemen waiting to see the president each when his turn to be admitted should arrive the secretary sat reading a paper over the top of which he glanced but once at the newcomer to ask him to be seated but meek was not in the humor for sitting he had not travelled express for more than two months in storm and cold on foot and on horseback by day and by night with or without food as it chanced to sit down quietly now and wait so he took a few turns up and down the room and seeing that the secretary glanced at him a little curiously stopped and said i should like to see the president immediately just tell him if you please that there is a gentleman from oregon waiting to see him on very important business at the word oregon the secretary sprang up dashed his paper to the ground and crying out uncle joe came forward with both hands extended to greet his long-lost relative take care knox don't come too close said meek stepping back i'm ragged dirty and lousy but walker seized his cousin's hand without seeming fear of the consequences and for a few moments there was an animated exchange of questions and answers which meek at last interrupted to repeat his request to be admitted to the president without delay several times the secretary turned to leave the room but as often came back with some fresh inquiry until meek fairly refused to say another word until he had delivered his dispatches when once the secretary got away he soon returned with a request from the president for the appearance of the oregon messenger all other visitors being dismissed for that day polk's reception proved as cordial as walker's had been he seized the hand of his newly found relative and welcomed him in his own name as well as that of messenger from the distant much loved and long neglected oregon the interview lasted for a couple of hours oregon affairs and family affairs were talked over together the president promising to do all for oregon that he could do at the same time he bade meek make himself at home in the presidential mansion with true southern hospitality but meek although he had carried off his poverty and all his deficiencies in so brave a style hitherto felt his assurance leaving him when his errand performed he stood in the presence of rank and elegance a mere mountain man in ragged blankets whose only wealth consisted of an order for five hundred dollars on the methodist mission in new york unavailable for present emergencies and so he declined the hospitalities of the white house saying he could make himself at home in an indian wigwam in oregon or among the rocky mountains but in the residence of the chief magistrate of a great nation he felt out of place and ill at ease polk however would listen to no refusal and still further abashed his oregon cousin by sending for mrs polk and mrs walker to make his acquaintance says meek when i heard the silks rustling in the passage i felt more frightened than if a hundred blackfeet had whooped in my ear a mist came over my eyes and when mrs polk spoke to me i, I couldn't think of anything to say in return but the ladies were so kind and courteous that he soon began to see a little though not quite plainly while their visit lasted before the interview with the president and his family was ended the poverty of the oregon envoy became known which led to the immediate supplying of all his wants major polk was called in and introduced and to him was deputed the business of seeing meek got up in a style creditable to himself and his relations 
meek avers that when he had gone through the hands of the barber and tailor and surveyed himself in a full-length mirror he was at first rather embarrassed being under the impression that he was being introduced to a fashionable and decidedly good-looking gentleman before whose overpowering style he was disposed to shrink with the old familiar feeling of being in blankets but meek was not the sort of man to be long in getting used to a situation however novel or difficult in a very short time he was au fait in the customs of the capital his perfect frankness led people to laugh at his errors as eccentricities his good looks and natural bonhomie procured him plenty of admirers while his position at the white house caused him to be envied and lionized at once on the day following his arrival the president sent in a message to congress accompanied by the memorial from the oregon legislature and other documents appertaining to the oregon cause meek was introduced to benton oregon's indefatigable friend and received from him the kindest treatment also to dallas president of the senate douglas fremont general houston and all the men who had identified themselves with the interests of the west it should be stated that only a short time previous to the wailat pu massacre a delegate had left oregon for washington by ship around cape horn who had been accredited by the governor of the colony only and that the legislature had subsequently passed resolutions expressive of their disapproval of secret factions by which was meant the mission party whose delegate mr thornton was it so happened that by reason of the commander of the portsmouth having assumed it to be a duty to convey mr thornton from la paz where through the infidelity of the captain of the witten he was stranded he was enabled to reach the states early in the spring arriving in fact a week or two before meek reached washington thus oregon had two representatives although not entitled to any nor had either a right to a seat in either house yet to one this courtesy was granted while the two together controlled more powerful influences than were ever before or since brought to bear on the fate of any single territory of the united states while mr thornton sat among senators as a sort of consulting member or referee but without a vote meek had the private ear of the president and mingled freely among members of both houses in a social character thereby exercising a more immediate influence than his more learned coadjutor in the meantime our hero was making the most of his advantages he went to dinners and champagne suppers besides giving an occasional one of the latter at the presidential levees he made himself agreeable to witty and distinguished ladies answering innumerable questions about oregon and indians generally with a veil of reserve between himself and the questioner whenever the inquiries became as they sometimes would disagreeably searching again the spirit of perversity and mischief led him to make his answers so very direct as to startle or bewilder the questioner on one occasion a lady with whom he was promenading a drawing-room at some senator's reception admiring his handsome physique perhaps and wondering if any woman owned it finally ventured the question was he married yes indeed answered meek with emphasis i have a wife and several children oh dear exclaimed the lady i should think your wife would be so afraid of the indians afraid of the indians exclaimed meek in his turn why madam she is an indian herself no further remarks on the subject were ventured that evening and it is doubtful if the lady did not take his answer as a rebuke to her curiosity rather than the plain truth that it was meek found his old comrade kit carson in washington staying with fremont at the house of senator benton kit who had left the mountains as poor as any other of the mountain men had no resource at that time except the pay furnished by fremont for his services as guide and explorer in the california and oregon expeditions 
where in fact it was carson and not fremont who deserved fame as a pathfinder however that may be carson had as little money as men of his class usually have and needed it as much so long as meek's purse was supplied as it generally was by some member of the family at the white house carson could borrow from him but one being quite as careless of money as the other they were sometimes both out of pocket at the same time in that case the conversation was apt to take a turn like this carson meek let me have some money can't you meek i haven't got any money kit carson go and get some meek blank it where am i to get money from carson try the contingent fund can't you truth to tell the contingent fund was made to pay for a good many things not properly chargeable to the necessary expenditures of envoy extraordinary like our friend from oregon the favoritism with which our hero was everywhere received was something remarkable even when all the circumstances of his relationship to the chief magistrate and the popularity of the oregon question were considered doubtless the novelty of having a bear fighting an indian fighting rocky mountain man to lionize was one great secret of the furore which greeted him wherever he went but even that fails to account fully for the enthusiasm he awakened since mountain men had begun to be pretty well known and understood from the journal of fremont and other explorers it could only have been the social genius of the man which enabled him to overcome the impediments of lack of education and the associations of half a lifetime but whatever was the fortunate cause of his success he enjoyed it to the full he took excursions about the country in all directions petted and spoiled like any curled darling instead of the six foot two rocky mountain trapper that he was in june he received an invitation to baltimore tendered by the city council and was received by that body with the mayor at its head in whose carriage he was conveyed to monument square to be welcomed by a thousand ladies smiling and showering roses upon him as he passed and kissing the roses because he could not kiss the ladies he bowed and smiled himself past the festive groups waiting to receive the messenger from oregon music dining and the parade usual to such occasions distinguished this day which meek declares to have been the proudest of his life not denying that the beauty of the baltimore ladies contributed chiefly to produce that impression on the fourth of july polk laid the cornerstone of the national monument the occasion was celebrated with great eclat the address being delivered by winthrop the military display and the fireworks in the evening being unusually fine in the procession general scott and staff rode on one side of the president's carriage colonel may and meek on the other meek making a great display of horsemanship in which as a mountain man he excelled a little later in the summer meek joined a party of congressmen who were making campaign speeches in the principal cities of the north at lowell mass he visited the cotton factories and was equally surprised at the extent of the works and the number of young women employed in them seeing this the forewoman requested him to stop until noon and see the girls come out as they passed in review before him she asked if he had made his choice no replied the gallant oregonian it would be impossible to choose out of such a lot as that i should have to take them all if our hero under all his gaiety smothered a sigh of regret that he was not at liberty to take one a woman like those with whom for the first time in his life he was privileged to associate who shall blame him the kind of life he was living now was something totally different to anything in the past it opened to his comprehension delightful possibilities of what might have been done and enjoyed under other circumstances yet which now never could be done or enjoyed 
until sometimes he was ready to fly from all these allurements and hide himself again in the rocky mountains then again by a desperate effort such thoughts were banished and he rushed more eagerly than before into every pleasure afforded by the present moment as if to make the present atone for the past and the future the kindness of the ladies at the white house while it was something to be grateful for as well as to make him envied often had the effect to disturb his tranquillity by the suggestions it gave rise to yet he was always demanding it always accepting it so constantly was he the attendant of his lady cousins in public and in private riding and driving or sauntering in the gardens of the presidential mansion that the less favored among their acquaintances felt called upon to believe themselves aggrieved often as the tall form of our hero was seen with a lady on either arm promenading the gardens at evening the question would pass among the curious but uninitiated who is that and the reply of some jealous grumbler would be it is that blank rocky mountain man so loud sometimes as to be overheard by the careless trio who smothered a laugh behind a hat or a fan and so passed that brief summer of our hero's life a great deal of experience of sight-seeing and enjoyment had been crowded into a short few months of time he had been introduced to and taken by the hand by the most celebrated men of the day nor had he failed to meet with men whom he had known in the mountains and in oregon his old employer wilkes who was ill in washington sent for him to come and tell some of those oregon lies for his amusement and meek to humor him stretched some of his good stories to the most wonderful dimensions but from the very nature of the enjoyment it could not last long it was too vivid and sensational for constant wear feeling this he began to weary of washington and more particularly since he had for the last few weeks been stopping away from the white house in one of his restless moods he paid a visit to polk who detecting the state of his mind asked laughingly well meek what do you want now i want to be franked how long will five hundred dollars last you about as many days as there are hundreds i reckon you are shockingly extravagant meek where do you think all this money is to come from it is not my business to know mr president replied meek laughing but it is the business of these united states to pay the expenses of the messenger from oregon isn't it i think i will send you to the secretary of war to be franked meek his frank is better than mine but no stay i will speak to knox about it this time and you must not spend your money so recklessly meek it will not do it will not do meek thanked the president both for the money and the advice but gave a champagne supper the next night and in a week's time was as empty-handed as ever the close of the session was at hand and nothing had been done except to talk congress was to adjourn at noon on monday august fourteenth and it was now saturday the twelfth the friends of oregon were anxious the two waiting oregonians nearly desperate on this morning of the twelfth the friends of the bill under benton's lead determined upon obtaining a vote on the final passage of the bill resolving that they would not yield to the usual motions for delay and adjournments but that they would if necessary sit until twelve o'clock monday saturday night wore away the sabbath morning's sun arose and at last two hours after sunrise a consultation was held between butler mason calhoun davis and foot which resulted in the announcement that no further opposition would be offered to taking the vote upon the final passage of the oregon bill the vote was taken the bill passed and the weary senate adjourned to meet again on monday for a final adjournment End of chapter thirty five Chapter 36 of Eleven Years in the Rocky Mountains and A Life on the Frontier by Francis A. Victor. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 36 
1848-9. to The long suspense ended. Meek prepared to return to Oregon, if not without some regrets, the same time not unwillingly. His restless temper and lifelong habits of unrestrained freedom began to revolt against the conventionality of his position in Washington. Besides, in appointing officers for the new territory, Polk had made him United States Marshal, than which no office could have suited him better, and he was as prompt to assume the discharge of its duties as all his life he had been to undertake any duty to which his fortunes assigned him. On the 20th of August, only six days after the passage of the Territorial Bill, he received his papers from Buchanan and set off for Bedford Springs, whither the family from the White House were flown to escape from the suffocating air of Washington in August. He had brought his papers to be signed by Polk, and being expected by the President, found everything arranged for his speedy departure, Polk even ordering a seat for him in the upcoming coach by telegraph. On learning this from the President at dinner, when the band was playing, Meek turned to the leader and ordered him to play Sweet Home, much to the amusement of his lady cousins, who had their own views of the sweets of a home in Oregon. A hurried farewell, spoken to each of his friends separately, and Oregon's new marshal was ready to proceed on his long journey toward the Pacific. The occasion of Polk's haste in the matter of getting Meek started was his anxiety to have the Oregon government become a fact before the expiration of his term of office. The appointment of governor of the new territory had been offered to Shields and declined. Another commission had been made out appointing General Joseph Lane of Indiana, governor of Oregon and the commission was that day signed by the president and given to meek to be delivered to lane in the shortest possible time his last words to the marshal on parting were god bless you meek tell lane to have a territorial government organized during my administration of the ten thousand dollars appropriated by congress to be expended under the direction of the president in payment for services and expenses of such persons as had been engaged by the provisional government of oregon in conveying communications to and from the united states and for purchase of presents for such indian tribes as the peace and quiet of the country required thornton received two thousand six hundred dollars meek seven thousand four hundred and the indian tribes none whether the president believed that the peace and quiet of the country did not require presents to be made to the indians or whether family credit required that meek should get the lion's share is not known however that may be our hero felt himself to be quite rich and proceeded to get rid of his superfluity, as will hereafter be seen, with his customary prodigality and enjoyment of the present without regard to the future. Before midnight on the day of his arrival at the Springs, Meek was on his way to Indiana to see General Lane. Arriving at the Newburgh Landing one morning at daybreak, he took horse immediately for the general's residence at Newburgh, and presented him with his commission soon after breakfast lane sat writing when meek introducing himself laid his papers before him do you accept asked meek yes answered lane how soon can you be ready to start in fifteen minutes answered lane with military promptness three days however were actually required to make the necessary preparations for leaving his farm and proceeding to the most remote corner of the united states territory at st louis they were detained one day waiting for a boat to leavenworth where they expected to meet their escort this one day was too precious to be lost in waiting by so business-like a person as our hero who when nothing more important was to be done generally was found trying to get rid of his money so on this occasion after having disburdened himself of a small amount in treating the new governor and all his acquaintances 
he entered into negotiations with a peddler who was importuning the passengers to buy everything from a jackknife to a silk dress finding that nat lane the general's son wanted a knife but was disposed to beat down the price meek made an offer for the lot of a dozen or two and thereby prevented lane getting one at any price not satisfied with this investment he next made a purchase of three whole pieces of silk at one dollar and fifty cents per yard at this stage of the transaction general lane interfered sufficiently to inquire what he expected to do with that stuff can't tell answered meek but i reckon it is worth the money better save your money said the more prudent lane but the incorrigible spendthrift only laughed and threatened to buy out the jew's entire stock if lane persisted in preaching economy at st louis besides his son nat lane was met by lieutenant hawkins who was appointed to the command of the escort of twenty-five riflemen and dr hayden surgeon of the company this party proceeded to leavenworth the point of starting where the wagons and men of hawkins command awaited them at this place meek was met by a brother and two sisters who had come to look on him for the first time in many years the two days delay which was necessary to get the train ready for a start afforded an opportunity for this family reunion the last that might ever occur between its widely separated branches new shoots from which extend at this day from virginia to alabama and from tennessee to california and oregon by the tenth of september the new government was on its way to oregon in the persons of lane and meek the whole company of officers men and teamsters numbered about fifty-five the wagons ten and riding horses an extra supply for each rider the route taken with the object to avoid the snows of a northern winter was from leavenworth to santa fe and thence down the rio grande to near el paso thence northwesterly by tucson in arizona thence to the pimas village on the gila river following the gila to its junction with the colorado thence northwesterly again to the bay of san pedro in california from this place the company were to proceed by ship to san francisco and thence again by ship to the columbia river on the santa fe trail they met the army returning from mexico under price and learned from them that they could not proceed with wagons beyond santa fe the lateness of the season although it was not attended with snow as on the northern route it would have been subjected the travellers nevertheless to the strong cold winds which blow over the vast extent of open country between the missouri river and the high mountain range which forms the watershed of the continent it also made it more difficult to subsist the animals especially after meeting price's army which had already swept the country bare on coming near santa fe meek was riding ahead of his party when he had a most unexpected encounter seeing a covered travelling carriage drawn up under the shade of some trees growing beside a small stream not far off from the trail he resolved with his usual love of adventure to discover for himself the character of the proprietor but as he drew nearer he discovered no one although a camp table stood under the trees spread with refreshments not only of a solid but a fluid nature the sight of a bottle of cognac induced him to dismount and he was helping himself to a liberal glass when a head was protruded from a covering of blankets inside the carriage and a heavy bass voice was heard in a polite protest seems to me stranger you are making free with my property here's to you sir rejoined the purloiner it isn't often i find as good brandy as that holding out the glass admiringly but when i do i'll make it a point of honor not to pass it may i inquire your name sir asked the owner of the brandy forced to smile at the good-humoured audacity of his guest i couldn't refuse to give my name after that replacing the glass on the table 
and I now introduced myself as Joseph L. Meek, Esquire, Marshal of Oregon, on my way from Washington to assist General Lane in establishing a territorial government west of the Rocky Mountains. Meek? What? Not the Joe Meek I have heard my brothers tell so much about. Joe Meek is my name, but where did your brothers know me? inquired our hero, mystified in his turn. I think you must have known Captain William Sublet and his brother Milton ten or twelve years ago in the Rocky Mountains, said the gentleman, getting out of the carriage and approaching Meek with extended hand. A delighted recognition now took place. From Solomon Sublet, the owner of the carriage and the cognac, Meek learned many particulars of the life and death of his former leaders in the mountains. Neither of them were then living, but this younger brother, Solomon, had inherited Captain Sublet's wife and wealth at the same time. After these explanations, Mr. Sublet raised the curtains of the carriage again and assisted to descend from it a lady whom he introduced as his wife, and who exhibited much gratification in becoming acquainted with the hero of many a tale recited to her by her former husband, Captain Sublet. In the midst of this pleasant exchange of reminiscences, the remainder of Meek's party rode up, were introduced, and invited to regale themselves on the fine liquors with which Mr. Sublet's carriage proved to be well furnished. This little adventure gave our hero much pleasure, as furnishing a link between the past and present, and bringing freshly to mind many incidents already beginning to fade in his memory. At Santa Fe, the train stopped to be overhauled and reconstructed. The wagons having to be abandoned, their contents had to be packed on mules, after the manner of mountain or of Mexican travel and transportation. This change accomplished, with as little delay as possible, the train proceeded without any other than the usual difficulties as far as Tucson, when two of the twenty-five riflemen deserted, having become suddenly enamored of liberty in the dry and dusty region of southern Arizona. Lieutenant Hawkins, immediately on discovering the desertion, dispatched two men well armed to compel their return. One of the men detailed for this duty belonged to the riflemen, but the other was an American who, with a company of Mexican packers, had joined the train at Santa Fe and was acting in the capacity of pilot. In order to fit out this volunteer for the service, always dangerous, of retaking deserting soldiers, Meek had lent him his Colt's revolvers. It was a vain precaution, however, both the men being killed in attempting to capture the deserters, and Meek's pistols were never more heard of, having fallen into the murderous hands of the runaways." drought now began to be the serious evil with which the travelers had to contend from the pima's village westward it continually grew worse the animals being greatly reduced from the want both of food and water at the crossing of the colorado the animals had to be crossed over by swimming the officers and men by rafts made of bulrushes Lane and Meek, being the first to be ferried over, were landed unexpectedly in the midst of a Yuma village. The Indians, however, gave them no trouble, and except the little artifice of drowning some of the mules at the crossing in order to get their flesh to eat, committed neither murders nor thefts nor any outrage whatever. It was quite as well for the unlucky mules to be drowned and eaten as it was for their fellows to travel on over the arid desert before them until they starved and perished, which they nearly all did. From the Colorado on, the company of Lieutenant Hawkins became thoroughly demoralized. Not only would the animals persist in dying several in a day, but the soldiers also persisted in deserting until by the time he reached the coast, his forlorn hope was reduced to three men. But it was not the drought in their case which caused the desertions. It was rumors which they heard everywhere along the route of mines of gold and silver, 
where they flattered themselves they could draw better pay than from Uncle Sam's coffers. The same difficulty from desertion harassed Lieutenant Colonel Loring in the following summer when he attempted to establish a line of posts along the route to Oregon by the ways of Fort Kearney, Laramie, and through the South Pass to Fort Hall. His mounted rifle regiment dwindled down to almost nothing. At one time, over one hundred men deserted in a body, and although he pursued and captured seventy of them, he could not keep them from deserting again at the first favorable moment. The bones of many of those gold-seeking soldiers were left on the plains, where wolves had stripped the flesh from them, and many more finally had rude burial at the hands of fellow gold-seekers, but few indeed ever won or enjoyed that for which they risked everything. On arriving at Cook's Wells, some distance beyond the Colorado, our travelers found that the water at this place was tainted by the body of a mule which had lost its life some days before in endeavoring to get at the water. This was a painful discovery for the thirsty party to make. However, there being no water for some distance ahead, General Lane boiled some of it and made coffee of it, remarking that, maggots were more easily swallowed cooked than raw and here the writer and no doubt the reader too is compelled to make a reflection was the office of governor of a territory at fifteen hundred dollars a year and indian agent at fifteen hundred more worth a journey of over three thousand miles chiefly by land even allowing that there had been no maggots in the water Kian Sabe. Not far from this locality, our party came upon one hundred wagons abandoned by Major Graham, who had not been able to cross the desert with them. Proceeding onward, the riders eventually found themselves on foot, there being only a few animals left alive to transport the baggage that could not be abandoned so great was their extremity that to quench their thirst the stomach of a mule was opened to get at the moisture it contained in the horror and pain of the thirst fever meek renewed again the sufferings he had undergone years before in the deserts inhabited by diggers and on the parched plains of the snake river about the middle of january the oregon government which had started out so gaily from fort leavenworth arrived weary dusty footsore famished and suffering at williams ranch on the santa Ana river which empties into the bay of san pedro here they were very kindly received and their wants ministered to at this place meek developed in addition to his various accomplishments a talent for a speculation while overhauling his baggage the knives and the silk which had been purchased of the peddler in st louis were brought to light no sooner did the senoritas catch a glimpse of the shining fabrics than they went into raptures over them after the fashion of their sex seeing the state of mind to which these raptures if unheeded were likely to reduce the ladies of this house mr williams approached meek delicately on the subject of purchase but meek in the first flush of speculative shrewdness declared that as he had bought the goods for his own wife he could not find it in his heart to sell them however as the senoritas were likely to prove inconsolable mr williams again mentioned the desire of his family to be clad in silk and the great difficulty nay impossibility of obtaining the much coveted fabric in that part of the world and accompanied his remarks with an offer of ten dollars a yard for the lot at this magnificent offer our hero affected to be overcome by regard for the feelings of the senoritas and consented to sell his dollar and a half silks for ten dollars per yard in the same manner finding that knives were a desirable article in that country very much wanted by miners and others he sold out his dozen or two for an ounce each of gold dust netting altogether the convenient little profit of about five hundred dollars 
when general lane was informed of the transaction and reminded of his objections to the original purchase he laughed heartily well meek said he you were drunk when you bought them and by dash i think you must have been drunk when you sold them but drunk or sober i will own you can beat me at a bargain such bargains however became common enough about this time in california for this was the year memorable in california history of the breaking out of the gold fever and the great rush to the mines which made even the commonest things worth their weight in gold dust proceeding to los angeles our party once more comfortably mounted found travelling comparatively easy at this place they found quartered the command of major graham whose abandoned wagons had been passed at the hornea on the colorado river the town too was crowded with miners men of every class but chiefly american adventurers drawn together from every quarter of california and mexico by the rumor of the gold discovery at sutter's fort on arriving at san pedro a vessel the southampton was found ready to sail she had on board a crowd of fugitives from mexico bound to san francisco where they hoped to find repose from the troubles which harassed that revolutionary republic at san francisco meek was surprised to meet about two hundred oregonians who on the first news of the gold discovery the previous autumn had fled as it is said men shall flee on the day of judgment leaving the wheat ungathered in the fields the grain unground in the mills the cattle unherded on the plains their tools and farming implements rusting on the ground everything abandoned as if it would never more be needed to go and seek the shining dust which is vainly denominated filthy lucre the two hundred were on their way home having all either made something or lost their health by exposure so that they were obliged to return but they left many more in the mines such were the tales told in san francisco of the wonderful fortunes of some of the miners that young lane became infected with the universal fever and declared his intention to try mining with the rest meek too determined to risk something in gold seeking and as some of the teamsters who had left fort leavenworth with the company and had come as far as san francisco were very desirous of going to the mines meek fitted out two or three with pack horses tools and provisions to accompany young lane for the money expended in the outfit he was to receive half of their first year's profits the result of this venture was three pickle jars of gold dust which were sent to him by the hands of nat lane the following year and which just about reimbursed him for the outlay at san francisco general lane found the u s sloop of war the st mary's and meek insisted that the oregon government which was represented in their persons had a right to require her services in transporting itself to its proper seat but lane whose notions of economy extended singularly enough to the affairs of the general government would not consent to the needless expenditure meek was rebellious and quoted thornton by whom he was determined not to be outdone in respect of expense for transportation lane insisted that his dignity did not require a government vessel to convey him to oregon in short the new government was very much divided against itself and only escaped a fall on meek's finding some one or some others else on whom to play his pranks the first one was a jew peddler who had gentlemen's clothes to sell to him the marshal represented himself as a united states custom officer and after frightening him with a threat of confiscating his entire stock finally compromised with the terrified israelite by accepting a suit of clothes for himself after enjoying the mortification of spirit which the loss inflicted on the jew for twenty-four hours he finally paid him for the clothes and at the same time administering a lecture upon the sin and danger of smuggling 
the party which had left leavenworth for oregon nearly six months before numbering fifty-five now numbered only seven of the original number two had been killed and all the rest had deserted to go to the mines there remained only general lane meek lieutenant hawkins and hayden surgeon besides three soldiers with this small company general lane went on board the jeannette a small vessel crowded with miners and destined for the columbia river as the jeannette dropped down the bay a salute was fired from the st mary's in honor of general lane and appropriated to himself by marshal meek who seems to have delighted in appropriating to himself all the honors in whatever circumstances he might be placed the more especially too if such assumption annoyed the general after a tedious voyage of eighteen days the jeannette arrived in the columbia river from astoria the party took small boats for oregon city a voyage of one hundred and twenty miles so that it was already the second of march when they arrived at that place and only one day was left for the organization of the territorial government before the expiration of polk's term of office on the second of march general lane arrived at oregon city and was introduced to governor abernathy by marshal meek on the third there appeared the following proclamation in pursuit of an act of congress approved the fourteenth of august in the year of our lord eighteen forty eight establishing a territorial government in the territory of oregon i joseph lane was on the eighteenth day of august in the year eighteen forty eight appointed governor in and for the territory of oregon i have therefore thought it proper to issue this my proclamation making known that i have this day entered upon the discharge of the duties of my office and by virtue thereof do declare the laws of the united states extended over and declared to be in force in said territory so far as the same or any portion thereof may be applicable given under my hand at oregon city in the territory of oregon this third day of march anno domini eighteen forty nine joseph lane thus oregon had one day under polk who take it all in all had been a faithful guardian of her interests in the month of august eighteen forty eight the honolulu a vessel of one hundred and fifty tons owned in boston carrying a consignment of goods to a mercantile house in portland arrived at her anchorage in the willamette via san francisco california captain newell almost before he had discharged freight commenced buying up a cargo of flour and other provisions but what excited the wonder of the oregonians was the fact that he also bought up all manner of tools such as could be used in digging or cutting from a spade and pickaxe to a pocket-knife this singular proceeding naturally aroused the suspicions of a people accustomed to having something to suspect a demand was made for the honolulu's papers and these not being forthcoming it was proposed by some of the prudent ones to tie her up when this movement was attempted the secret came out captain newell holding up a bag of gold dust before the astonished eyes of his persecutors cried out do you see that gold you i will depopulate your country i know where there is plenty of this stuff and i am taking these tools where it is to be found this was in august the month of harvest so great was the excitement which seized the people that all classes of men were governed by it few persons stopped to consider that this was the time for producers to reap golden harvests of precious ore for the other yellow harvest of grain which was already ripe and waiting to be gathered men left their grain standing and took their teams from the reapers to pack their provisions and tools to the mines some men would have gladly paid double to get back the spades shovels or picks which the shrewd yankee captain had purchased from them a week previous all implements of this nature soon commanded fabulous prices and he was a lucky man who had a supply End of chapter thirty six
Testing, testing. Testing, testing, testing. Testing, testing. Testing, testing, testing. 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 Whether the president believed that the peace and quiet of the country did not require presents to be made to the Indians, or whether family credit required that Meek should get the lion's share, is not known. However that may be, our hero felt himself to be quite rich, and proceeded to get rid of his superfluity, as will hereafter be seen, with his customary prodigality and enjoyment of the present without regard to the future. Chapter 37 of Eleven Years in the Rocky Mountains and a Life on the Frontier by Francis A. Victor. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 37, 1850-4 The Territorial Law of Oregon combined the offices of governor and Indian agent. One of the most important acts which marked Lane's administration was that of securing and punishing the murderers of Dr. and Mrs. Whitman. The Indians of the Cayuse tribe, to whom the murderers belonged, were assured that the only way in which they could avoid a war with the whites was to deliver up the chiefs who had been engaged in the massacre, to be tried and punished, according to the laws of the whites of the two hundred indians implicated in the massacre five were given up to be dealt with according to the law these were the five chiefs tilau ikite tamahas clockamas kayampa sumkin and isaia chalakis these men might have made their escape there was no imperative necessity upon them to suffer death had they chosen to flee to the mountains but with that strange magnanimity which the savage often shows to the astonishment of christians they resolved to die for their people rather than by their flight to involve them in war early in the summer of eighteen fifty the prisoners were delivered up to governor lane and brought down to oregon city where they were given into the keeping of the marshal during their passage down the river and while they were incarcerated at oregon city their bearing was most proud and haughty some food more choice than their prisoners fare being offered to one of the chiefs at a camp of the guard in their transit down the columbia the proud savage rejected it with scorn what sort of heart have you he asked that you offer food to me whose hands are red with your brother's blood and this after eleven years of missionary labor was all the comprehension the savage nature knew of the main principle of christianity forgiveness or charity toward our enemies at oregon city meek had many conversations with them in all of these they gave but one explanation of their crime they feared that dr whitman intended with the other whites to take their land from them and they were told by joe lewis the half-breed that the doctor's medicine was intended to kill them off quickly in order the sooner to get possession of their country none of them expressed any sorrow for what had been done but one of them kayampa sumkin declared his innocence to the last in conversations with others curious to gain some knowledge of the savage moral nature tilaui kite often puzzled these students of indian ethics when questioned as to his motive for allowing himself to be taken tilaui kite answered did not your missionaries tell us that christ died to save his people so die we to save our people notwithstanding the prisoners were pre-doomed to death a regular form of trial was gone through the prosecuting attorney for the territory a holbrook conducted the prosecution secretary pritchett major runnels and captain claiborne the defense the fee offered by the chiefs was fifty head of horses whether it was compassion or a love of horses which animated the defense quite an effort was made to show that the murderers were not guilty the presiding judge was o c pratt bryant having resigned 
perhaps we cannot do better than to give the marshal's own description of the trial and execution which is as follows there were a great many indictments and a great many people in attendance at this court the grand jury found true bills against the five indians and they were arraigned for trial captain claiborne led off for the defense he foamed and ranted like he were acting a play in some theatre he knew about as much law as one of the indians he war defending and his gestures were so powerful that he smashed two tumblers that the judge had ordered to be filled with cold water for him after time he gave out mentally and physically then came major runnels who made a very good defence but the marshal thought they must do better for they would never ride fifty head of horses with them speeches mr pritchett closed for the defence with a very able argument for he war a man of brains but then followed mr holbrook for the prosecution and he laid down the case so plain that the jury were convinced before they left the jury box when the judge passed sentence of death on them two of the chiefs showed no terror but the other three were filled with horror and consternation that they could not conceal after court had adjourned and governor lane were gone south on some business with the rogue river indians secretary pritchett came to me and told me that as he were now acting governor he meant to reprieve the indians said he to me now meek i want you to liberate them indians when you receive the order pritchett said i so far as meek is concerned he would do anything for you this talk pleased him he said he were glad to hear it and would go right off and write the reprieve but said i pritchett let us talk now like men i have got in my pocket the death warrant of them indians signed by governor lane the marshal will execute them men as certain as the day arrives pritchett looked surprised and remarked that were not what you just said that you would do anything for me said i you were talking then to meek not to the marshal who always does his duty at that he got mad and left when the third of june the day of execution arrived oregon city was thronged with people to witness it i brought forth the five prisoners and placed them on a drop here the chief who always declared his innocence kiami sumpkin begged me to kill him with my knife for an indian fears to be hanged but i soon put an end to his entreaties by cutting the rope which held the drop with my tomahawk as i said the lord have mercy on your souls the trap fell and the five cayuses hung in the air three of them died instantly the other two struggled for several minutes the little chief tamahas the longest it was he who was cruel to my little girl at the time of the massacre so i just put my foot on the knot to tighten it and he got quiet after thirty-five minutes they were taken down and buried thus terminated a tragic chapter in the history of oregon among the services which thurston performed for the territory was getting an appropriation of one hundred thousand dollars to pay the expenses of the cayuse war from the spring of eighteen forty eight when all the whites except the catholic missionaries were withdrawn from the upper country for a period of several years or until the government had made treaties with the tribes east of the cascades no settlers were permitted to take up land in eastern oregon during those years the indians dissatisfied with the encroachments which they foresaw the whites would finally make upon their country and incited by certain individuals who had suffered wrongs or been punished for their own offences at the hands of the whites finally combined as it was supposed from the extent of the insurrection and oregon was involved in a three years indian war the history of which would fill a volume of considerable size when meek returned to oregon as marshal with his fine clothes and his newly acquired social accomplishments he was greeted with a cordial acknowledgment of his services as well as admiration for his improved appearance he was generally acknowledged to be the model of a handsome marshal when clad in his half-military dress and placed astride of a fine horse 
in the execution of the more festive duties of marshal of a procession on some patriotic occasion but no amount of official responsibility could ever change him from a wag into a grave and reverend seigneur no place nor occasion was sacred to him when the wild humor was on him at this same term of court after the conviction of the cayuse chiefs there was a case before judge pratt in which a man was charged with selling liquor to the indians in these cases indian evidence was allowed but the jury-room being upstairs caused a good deal of annoyance in court because when an indian witness was wanted upstairs a dozen or more who were not wanted would follow the judge's bench was so placed that it commanded a full view of the staircase and every one passing up or down it a call for some witness to go before the jury was followed on this occasion as on all others by a general rush of the indians who were curious to witness the proceedings one fat old squaw had got part way up the stairs when the marshal full of wrath seized her by a leg and dragged her down flat at the same time holding the fat member so that it was pointed directly toward the judge a general explosion followed this pointed action and the judge grew very red in the face mr marshal come within the bar thundered the judge meek complied with a very dubious expression of countenance i must fine you fifty dollars continued the judge the dignity of the court must be maintained when court had adjourned that evening the judge and the marshal were walking toward their respective lodgings said meek to his honor why did you fine me so heavily to-day i must do it returned the judge i must keep up the dignity of the court i must do it if i pay the fines myself and you must pay all the fines you lay on the marshal of course answered meek very well said the judge i shall do so all right judge as i am the proper dispersing officer you can pay that fifty dollars to me and i'll take it now at this view of the case his honor was staggered for one moment and could only swing his cane and laugh faintly after a little reflection he said <laughs> marshal when court is called to-morrow i shall remit your fine but don't you let me have occasion to fine you again after the removal of the capital to salem in eighteen fifty two court was held in a new building on which the carpenters were still at work judge nelson then presiding was much put out by the noise of hammers and sent the marshal more than once to request the men to suspend their work during those hours when court was in session but all to no purpose finally when his forbearance was quite exhausted he appealed to the marshal for advice what shall i do meek said he to stop that infernal noise put the workmen on the grand jury replied meek summon them instantly returned the judge they were summoned and quite secured for that term at this same term of court a great many of the foreign-born settlers appeared to file their intention of becoming american citizens in order to secure the benefits of the donation law meek was retained as a witness to swear to their qualifications one of which was that they were possessed of good moral characters the first day there were about two hundred who made declarations meek witnessing for most of them on the day following he declined serving any longer what now inquired the judge you made no objections yesterday very true replied meek and two hundred lies are enough for me i swore that all those mountain men were of good moral character and i never knew a mountain man of that description in my life let newell take the job for to-day the job was turned over to newell but whether the second lot was better than the first has never transpired during lane's administration there was a murder committed by a party of indians at the sound on the person of a mr wallace owing to the sparse settlement of the country governor lane adopted the original measure of exporting not only the officers of the court but the jury also to the sound district meek was ordered to find transportation for the court in toto jury and all 
boats were hired and provisioned to take the party to the cowlitz landing and from thence to fort stillicum horses were hired for the land transportation the indians accused were five in number two chiefs and three slaves the grand jury found a true bill against the two chiefs and let the slaves go so few were the inhabitants of those parts that the marshal was obliged to take a part of the grand jury to serve on the petty jury the form of a trial was gone through with the judge delivered his charge and the jury retired it was just after nightfall when these worthies betook themselves to the jury room one of them curled himself up in a corner of the room with the injunction to the others to wake him up when they got ready to hang them blank rascals the rest of the party spent four or five hours betting against monty when being sleepy also they waked up their associate spent about ten minutes in arguing their convictions and returned a verdict of guilty of murder in the first degree the indians were sentenced to be hung at noon on the following day and the marshal was at work early in the morning preparing a gallows a rope was procured from a ship lying in the sound at half past eleven o'clock guarded by a company of artillery from the fort the miserable savages were marched forth to die a large number of indians were collected to witness the execution and to prevent any attempt at rescue captain hill's artillery formed a ring around the marshal and his prisoners the execution was interrupted or delayed for some moments on account of the frantic behavior of an indian woman wife of one of the chiefs whose entreaties for the life of her husband were very affecting having exhausted all her eloquence in an appeal to the nobler feelings of the man she finally promised to leave her husband and become his wife if he the marshal would spare her lord and chief she was carried forcibly out of the ring and the hanging took place when the bodies were taken down meek spoke to the woman telling her that now she could have her husband but she only sullenly replied you have killed him and you may bury him end of chapter thirty seven chapter thirty eight of eleven years in the rocky mountains and a life on the frontier by francis a victor this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty eight while meek was in washington he had been dubbed with the title of colonel which title he still bears though during the indian war of eighteen fifty five to fifty six it was alternated with that of major during his marshalship he was fond of showing off his titles and authority to the discomfiture of that class of people who had put on airs with him in former days when he was in his transition stage from a trapper to a united states marshal while pratt was judge of the district court a kidnapping case came before him the writ of habeas corpus having been disregarded by the captain of the melvin who was implicated in the business meek was sent to arrest him and also the first mate five of the melvin's sailors were ordered to be summoned as witnesses at the same time meek went on board with his summons marched forward and called out the names of the men every man came up as he was summoned when they were together meek ordered a boat lowered for their conveyance to oregon city the men started to obey when the captain interfered saying that the boat should not be taken for such a purpose as it belonged to him that is of no consequence at all answered the smiling marshal it is a very good boat and will suit our purpose very well lower away men the men quickly dropped the boat as it fell they were ordered to man it when they were at the oars the mate was then invited to take a seat in it which he did after a moment's hesitation and glancing at his superior officer meek then turned to the captain and extended the same invitation to him but he was reluctant to accept the courtesy blustering considerably and declaring his intention to remain where he was meek slowly drew his revolver all the time cool and smiling i don't like having to urge a gentleman too hard he said in a meaning tone but there is an argument that few men ever resist take a seat captain the captain took a seat 
the idlers on shore cheered for joe meek which was after all his most familiar title the captain and mate went to oregon city and were fined respectively five hundred dollars and three hundred dollars the men took advantage of being on shore to desert and altogether the master of the melvin felt himself badly used about the same time news was received that a british vessel was unloading goods for the hudson's bay company somewhere on puget sound under the new order of affairs in oregon this was smuggling delighted with an opportunity of doing the united states a service and the british traders an ill turn marshal meek immediately summoned a posse of men and started for the sound on his way he learned the name of the vessel and captain and recognized them as having been in the columbia river some years before on that occasion the captain had ordered meek ashore when led by his curiosity and general love of novelty he had paid a visit to this vessel this information was nuts to the marshal who believed that a turn about was fair play with great dispatch and secrecy he arrived entirely unexpected at the point where the vessel was lying and proceeded to board her without loss of time the captain and officers were taken by surprise and were all aghast at this unlooked-for appearance but after the first moment of agitation was over the captain recognized meek he being a man not likely to be forgotten and thinking to turn this circumstance to advantage approached him with the blandest of smiles and the most cordial manner saying with forced frankness i am sure i have had the pleasure of meeting you before you must have been at vancouver when my vessel was in the river seven or eight years ago i am very happy to have met with you again there is some truth in that remark of yours captain replied meek eyeing him with lofty scorn you did meet me at vancouver several years ago but i was nothing but joe meek at that time and you ordered me ashore circumstances are changed since then i am now colonel joseph l meek united states marshal for oregon territory and you sir are only a blank smuggler go ashore sir the captain saw the point of that concluding go ashore sir and obeyed with quite as bad a grace as joe meek had done in the first instance the vessel was confiscated and sold netting to the government about forty thousand dollars above expenses this money which fell into bad hands failed to be accounted for nobody suspected the integrity of the marshal but most persons suspected that he placed too much confidence in the district attorney who had charge of his accounts on someone asking him a short time after what had become of the money from the sale of the smuggler he seemed struck with a sudden surprise why said he looking astonished at the question there was barley enough for the officers of the court this answer given as it was with such apparent simplicity became a popular joke and barley enough was quoted on all occasions the truth was that there was a serious deficiency in meek's account with the government resulting entirely from his want of confidence in his own literary accomplishments which led him to trust all his correspondence and his accounts to the hands of a man whose talents were more eminent than his sense of honor the result of this misplaced confidence was a loss to the government and to himself whom the government held accountable contrary to the general rule of dispersing officers the office made him poor instead of rich and when on the incoming of the pierce administration he suffered decapitation along with the other territorial officers he was forced to retire upon his farm on the tualatin plains and became a rather indifferent tiller of the earth the breaking out of the indian war of eighteen fifty five to six was preceded by a long period of uneasiness among the indians generally the large emigration which crossed the plains every year for california and oregon was one cause of the disturbance not only by exciting their fears for the possession of their lands but by the temptation which was offered them to take toll of the travellers difficulties occurred at first between the immigrants and indians concerning stolen property these quarrels were followed probably the subsequent year 
by outrages and murder on the part of the indians and retaliation on the part of volunteer soldiers from oregon when once this system of outrage and retaliation on either side was begun there was an end of security and war followed as an inevitable consequence very horrible indeed were the acts perpetrated by the indians upon the emigrants to oregon during the years from eighteen fifty two to eighteen fifty eight but when at last the call to arms was made in oregon it was an opportunity sought and not an alternative forced upon them by the politicians of that territory the occasion was simply this a party of lawless wretches from the sound country passing over the cascade mountains into the yakima valley on their way to the upper columbia mines found some yakima women digging roots in a lonely place and abused them the women fled to their village and told the chiefs of the outrage and a party followed the guilty whites and killed several of them in a fight mr bolin the indian sub-agent for washington went to the yakima village and instead of judging of the case impartially made use of threats in the name of the united states government saying that an army should be sent to punish them for killing his people on his return home mr bolin was followed and murdered the murder of an indian agent was an act which could not be overlooked very properly the case should have been taken notice of in a manner to convince the indians that murder must be punished but tempted by an opportunity for gain and encouraged by the somewhat reasonable fears of the white population of washington and oregon governor g l curry of the latter at once proclaimed war and issued a call for volunteers without waiting for the sanction or assistance of the general government the moment this was done it was too late to retract it was as if a torch had been applied to a field of dry grass so simultaneously did the indians from puget sound to the rocky mountains and from the rocky mountains to the southern boundary of oregon send forth the war whoop that there was much justification for the belief which agitated the people that a combination among the indians had been secretly agreed to and that the whites were all to be exterminated volunteer companies were already raised and sent into the indian country when brevet major g o haller arrived at vancouver now a part of the united states he had been as far east as fort boise to protect the incoming immigration and finding on his return that there was an indian war on hand proceeded at once to the yakima country with his small force of one hundred men only fifty of whom were mounted much solicitude was felt for the result of the first engagement every one knowing that if the indians were at first successful the war would be long and bloody major haller was defeated with considerable loss and notwithstanding slight reinforcements from fort vancouver only succeeded in getting safely out of the country major rains the commanding officer at vancouver seeing the direction of events made a requisition upon governor curry for four of his volunteer companies to go into the field then followed applications to major rains for horses and arms to equip the volunteers but the horses at the fort being unfit for service and the major unauthorized to equip volunteer troops there resulted only misunderstandings and delays when general wool at the head of the department in san francisco was consulted he also was without authority to employ or receive the volunteers and when the volunteers who at length armed and equipped themselves came to go into the field with the regulars they could not agree as to the mode of fighting indians so that with one thing and another the war became an exciting topic for more reasons than because the whites were afraid of the indians as for general wool he was in great disfavor both in oregon and washington because he did not believe there ever had existed the necessity for a war and that therefore he bestowed what assistance was at his command very grudgingly general wool it was said was jealous of the volunteers and the volunteers certainly cared little for the opinion of general wool 
however all that may be colonel meek gives it as his opinion that the old general was right it makes me think said he of a bear fight i once saw in the rocky mountains where a huge old grizzly was surrounded by a pack of ten or twelve dogs all snapping at and worrying him it made him powerfully mad and every now and then he would make a claw at one of them that silenced him at once the indian war in oregon gave practice to a number of officers since become famous most prominent among whom is sheridan who served in oregon as a lieutenant grant himself was at one time a captain on that frontier colonel wright afterwards general wright succeeded major rains at vancouver and conducted the war through its most active period during a period of three years there were troops constantly occupied in trying to subdue the indians in one quarter or another as for the volunteers they fared badly on the first call to arms the people responded liberally the proposition which the governor made for their equipment was accepted and they turned in their property at a certain valuation when the war was over and the property sold the men who had turned it in could not purchase it without paying more for it in gold and silver than it was valued at when it was placed in the hands of the quartermaster it was sold however and the money enjoyed by the shrewd political speculators who thought an indian war a very good investment meek was one of the first to volunteer and went as a private in company a on arriving at the dalles he was detailed for special services by colonel j w nesmith and sent out as pilot or messenger whenever any such duty was required he was finally placed on nesmith's staff and given the title of major in this capacity as in every other he was still the same alert and willing individual that we have always seen him and not a whit less inclined to be merry when an opportunity offered while the army was in the yakima country it being an enemy's country and provisions scarce the troops sometimes were in want of rations but meek had not forgotten his mountain craft and always had something to eat if anybody did one evening he had killed a fat cow which he had discovered astray and was proceeding to roast a twenty-pound piece before his campfire when a number of the officers called on him the sight and savory smell of the beef was very grateful to them major meek said they in a breath we will sup with you to-night i am very sorry gentlemen to decline the honour returned meek with a repetition of the innocent surprise for which he had so often been laughed at but i am very hungry and thar's barley enough beef for one man on hearing this sober assertion those who had heard the story laughed but the rest looked rather aggrieved however the major continued his cooking and when the beef was done to a turn he invited his visitors to the feast and the evening passed merrily with jests and camp stories after the army went into winter quarters nesmith having resigned t r cornelius was elected colonel one of his orders prohibited firing in camp an order which as a good mountaineer the major should have remembered but having been instructed to proceed to salem without delay as bearer of dispatches the major committed the error of firing his gun to see if it was in good condition for a trip through the enemy's country shortly after he received a message from his colonel requesting him to repair to his tent the colonel received him politely and invited him to breakfast with him the aroma of coffee made this invitation peculiarly acceptable for luxuries were scarce in camp and the breakfast proceeded for some time very agreeably when meek had breakfasted colonel cornelius took occasion to inquire if the major had not heard his order against firing in camp yes said meek then said the colonel i shall be obliged to make an example of you while meek stood aghast at the idea of punishment a guard appeared at the door of the tent and he heard what his punishment was to be mark time for twenty minutes in the presence of the whole regiment when the command forward was given says meek you might have seen somebody step off lively 
the officer counting it off left left but some of the regiment grumbled more about it than i did i just got my horse and my dispatches and left for the lower country and when i returned i asked for my discharge and got it and here ends the career of our hero as a public man the history of the young state of which he is so old a pioneer furnishes ample material for an interesting volume and will some time be written by an abler than our sketchy pen end of chapter thirty eight end of eleven years in the rocky mountains and a life on the frontier by francis a victor read by carol pelster